have visible quorum. We see people are online, but we just need people to turn their videos on. Great, thank you very much. So good morning and welcome to the Standing Committee uh, on City Finance and Services meeting of April 27th, 2022. This meeting, uh, this committee meeting is being convened by electronic means as authorized under part 14 of the procedure bylaw. As such, committee members may participate in person or by electronic means. Committee members participating by electronic means are reminded that in accordance with section 14.13 of the procedure by law video must be enabled in order to confirm quorum members are also asked to please advise the clerk if they need to leave the meeting if a committee member loses connection during the voting process staff will get you back online quickly while we suspend the voting the staff contact information has been circulated to you. Video of committee members speaking, presentations and vote results will be projected on the live stream when available. Members of the public who wish to participate are encouraged to submit comments online or participate by telephone. Members of the public are strongly encouraged to attend remotely. We acknowledge that we are on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. We thank them for having cared for this land and look forward to working with them in partnership as we continue to build this great city together. I also want to take a moment to recognize the immense contribution of the City of Vancouver staff who work hard every day to help make our city an incredible place to live, work, and play. Clerk, may we have the roll call, please? Councillor Bly in the chair. Mayor Stewart. Present. Councillor Carr. Here. Councillor DiGenova. Present. Councillor Fry is on a leave of absence on civic business. Councillor Swanson. Here. Councillor Hardwick is on a leave of absence for personal reasons. Councillor Weeb. Present. Councillor Boyle. Present. Councillor Domenato. Present. Councillor Kirby Young. Not here. You have uh, you have quorum chair Bly. Thank you very much. At this time, I'd like to go over for, uh, the plan for the day. We have eight items of business on today's agenda. Two member motions referred from the Standing Committee on Policy and St Strategic Pri Priorities on April 13th, 2022, and three staff reports. Three member motions also referred from yesterday's council meeting. We will recess at noon for lunch and then reconvene at 1 p.m. Should the business not be completed prior to 5 p.m. today, we will recess for dinner at 5 and reconvene at 6 p.m. If an additional day is required, the meeting will re reconvene on Tuesday, May 10th at 3 p.m. Finally, I would like to remind council members that if amendments are brought forward, they must be submitted to the city clerk in final written form before the council member introduces them. And please ensure the clerk has received your amendment by using the council meeting amendments DL. So as chair for this meeting, I am suggesting for reports that have no speakers and no presentations that we adopt the recommendations collectively in a single motion. Reports four and five have no speakers. Does any member wish to hold reports noted above for debate or questions to staff? Move adoption. Thank you, Councillor Carr. I, I'm sorry, point of privilege. Yes, Councillor DJ. My, my, uh, my panel is not working and I'm wondering, I'm looking for the most up-to-date speakers list. So if you could tell me uh, what can be moved on consent, that will help me make my decision. Sure, uh, as mentioned, reports four and five do not have any speakers. Okay. So that, would you like me to read the titles, Council Di Genova? Yes, I would appreciate that. Vancouver Heritage Foundation Board Annual Report for 2021 Environmental Consulting Services. That's fine. I'm, I'm, I don't need to build anything. I'm happy to. Oh, we've we've it's already, already got a mover. Thank you very much. Does any member wish to declare a conflict of interest? Seeing none. Um, uh, all those in favor say yay. 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 Any Yay. opposed? Great, thank you very much. The motion carries. So uh, those that have been approved on consent are item four, Vancouver Heritage Foundation Board Annual Report for 2021. And then item five, Environmental Consulting Services. 
So before we begin, I'd like to remind speakers that they have five minutes to make their comments, should state whether they are in support or in opposition of the recommendations and may only speak once. Council members have up to three minutes to ask questions to speakers. However, speakers are under no obligation to respond. I will also ask if speakers are residents of Vancouver if it is not already noted on the speakers list. Following the last speaker on the speakers list for each item, we will go back through the list for those who were not present when their name was initially called. I also want to note uh, the City of Vancouver's long-standing commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, including utmost respect for all genders. I remind Council that when addressing speakers and staff, we will avoid using gendered honorifics and will instead refer to the person by la first and last name, role, or title. So the first item is referred from the Standing Committee on April 13th, 2022, and the title of that um, item is Supporting the Innovation Economy, uh, originally Members Motion B7, which was moved and introduced by Councillor Weave and seconded by Councillor Carr. So we're now going to hear speakers on this motion, and the first speaker on uh, the list we have here is Keith Ippel. And Claire's just noting that it does say that the speaker is in person. Uh, speaker one is not in the chamber. Okay, um, so we'll move to the next speaker and speaker one may be coming up from downstairs. Uh, so speakers. Okay, uh, so we do have a speaker that um, perhaps had withdrawn but is now since called in. So we do want to give them an opportunity. Um, so give, we're just going to take a two minute recess, give the clerks a chance to connect with the speaker, get their information, and we'll come right back. Hello, this is the city moderator. I'm speaking to the person with the phone number, the last four digits, 
where uh, Speaker 2 was signed up within the correct timing and then has since withdrawn because of who knows what reason, um, the delay, of course, of two weeks from this meeting from when this was originally on the agenda. That said, they are on the line, and it would be council, the will of council whether or not we allow the speaker to share their comments. So I'm just going to simply ask, does anyone object to Councillor to uh, or sorry, <laughs> Speaker Two being heard at this moment? And I don't hear any objections, so I think we can go ahead. So uh, Speaker Two, Carrie Lamott, is it Lamott? Yes, it is. Great, thank you. And are you a resident of Vancouver? Yes, I am. Okay, wonderful. You have five minutes to speak to council. Please go ahead. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Carrie Lamont, and I'm the Managing Director of Entrepreneurship at UBC, and I will be speaking for Motion B7 today. Entrepreneurship at UBC is UBC's venture builder that lives at the intersection of academia and industry, supporting researchers, students, and alumni, and building new companies that solve global problems. We bridge the gap between innovation out of research and student ideation, and they're funded companies who go on to form the new anchor companies of our BC economy, like Accelera, Aspect Biosystems, D-Wave, and Terramera. <coughs> Pardon me. I'm here today to share some of the stories of ventures who are solving climate problems at entrepreneurship at UBC, and to give you an idea of the kinds of solutions our province and city grow out of the research from our universities at the very beginning of the innovation pipeline. These are solutions built not only for our own city, but to solve the problems of the world at large. One such example is a company called Carbonet, whose product is a nanotechnology that creates tunable nests that can capture specific particulate matter in water. In practical terms, this means they can recapture oil, debris, and other minerals they choose from mining tailings, agriculture, and other wastewater, leaving clear, clean water behind. To put this impact in perspective, in 2000, or 2021 alone, they cleaned 100 billion liters of Texas wastewater. Many of you will have noticed another company to come through at UBC when you shop at Glenn Drugs, Hudson Bay, and Nordstrom's. Chop Value is a circular economy company who upcycles used chopsticks into beautiful, high-performance engineered wood products. To date, they have saved 57 million chopsticks from landfills and have microfactories in over 10 countries around the world. And I know we all care quite a bit about the amount of single-use plastics we consume globally. One of my personal favorites is a company called Bioform with cost-effective sustainable plant-based plastics that can be purposed for everything from landscape fabric to styrofoam food packaging. They're on a fast track to global success with a solution that financially undercuts the current model of petroleum-based plastic manufacturing. And as exciting as these stories are, and believe me, we have lots more, the icing on the cake is that companies who have incubated at entrepreneurship... I'm just going to have to pause you, Speaker, because we have just lost quorum. Sorry, we're very... Oh, we're sure. ...minimal attendance at this moment. Okay, I think you're good to go. If everyone can just stay put for the balance of this, and if anyone is on, able to turn their video on, that would be great. Okay, sorry about the interruption. Please go ahead. Sure. Uh, as I was saying, we have lots of stories, but um, in particular, at entrepreneurship at UBC, these are major new drivers in our economy. And over the past nine years, they have raised $1.5 billion in funding, generated over $120 million in revenue, and created over 1,000 new jobs. And most of these companies are only just getting started. But many of the ventures formed at research institutions like UBC are what are commonly called deep tech companies, companies with serious intellectual property to be protected, tricky government regulations to navigate or even change, and global markets to enter. These companies, even though they're solving the most significant problems of the world, don't grab the spotlight the way fast-growing, make-it-or-break-it software startups do. As a result, their unique needs can easily go untended, with the end result being that they often move to greener pastures and other innovation ecosystems to build their headquarters. One of the most significant needs is that of pilots and procurement in the various levels of government. For clean tech, these pilots are critical to the survival of early companies, but the timelines and processes are long and arduous, often requiring that a company show evidence of success with a prior customer. Other ecosystems in Europe and some parts of the U.S. have created pilot to procurement programs to ease this important interchange and encourage companies to keep their headquarters local as companies will often move to the location of their first pilot or customer. It is also important for Vancouver and BC to provide for successful pilots with a fast track to procurement, which can then be used as reference customers for future sales outside of BC. As these pilots often address climate change, there's also a great opportunity to marry Vancouver's goal of greenest city with UBC's groundbreaking climate innovations to advance Vancouver's position as a global climate leader that other governments can follow. 
Motion B7 is a first step in identifying the special needs of these nascent but globally important companies by the VEC sharing an overview to Council of the nuances of the innovation ecosystem. Even more importantly, it will allow the VEC to operate in the role of convener, bringing key leaders in the innovation ecosystem together to discuss the needs of the sector and to communicate what support is needed to continue Vancouver's notable success in the industry of climate solution. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much. You do have questions uh, from Councillor Carr. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much. I are in that plant-based plastics. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Your um, you, audio. Oh, stopped. sorry. You, you talked about the plant-based plastics, and I'm wondering what yes. the plants are. Yeah, they're actually coming from. Um, wood products as well as or wood byproducts as well as um, algae and other products from the sea okay uh, my only I, I was worried about i like the wood pro byproducts but um, my only concern was the environmental impacts of sourcing large oh, we just lost a mic just a second please Okay, sorry, I seem to have problems with my mic. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased to hear wood byproducts is one of them. Uh, I'm just obviously raising concerns in my mind if we're trying to replace plastics. They're so ubiquitous with the plant-based mm -hmm. based plastics. I was just worried about the environmental impact. So in terms of the algaes and everything, are, do you sense any problem in the quantity of supply um, and environmental impacts regarding that? Yeah, and I would defer to the company to answer those questions more specifically, but but I will say that the products that they're using are very fast growing, and so it actually has a very sustainable source behind it um, with some opportunities going downstream. Pretty exciting. In terms of scaling. And yeah, I, very. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate you highlighting some of the uh, some of the products and some of the um, uh, economic uh, ventures that have, have arisen from entrepreneurship. You see, really appreciate you coming to speak to us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, and you do have questions. Um, please go ahead, Councillor Weeb. Um, yeah, I was at an event yesterday on angel investing where Shannon Bard from Entrepreneurship BC was one of the panelists. One of the conversations was how do we support founders that don't have the same privileges of having family backing for finances or having um, an ability to raise that early capital and that there could be a role for government to play in policy. Um, and in trying to support uh, different founders, we have a more equitable approach and we have a broader group of people trying to solve the climate emergency. Can you talk a little bit about how we could create policy um, and leadership role here in the city of Vancouver to support um, a broader range of founders to help support the climate emergency? Absolutely. Um, there's two main components to this. One is the funding that happens for companies directly. Um, and this would be at the, what Shannon was talking about was a, a gap that happens between research funding, which is, you know, arguably plentiful, but there's always more need there as well. Um, and what we see when we get to a seed stage financing level where industry is willing to, or investors are willing to come in and support those companies and pull them forward. In between those two phases, there's a small gap, which uh, is kind of its own valley of death where companies can fall off. Um, just because they can't get over that line. And so from the perspective of what we can do from a government, uh, at a government level, specifically supporting programs that can help bridge that gap by adding uh, industrial expertise to get them over the line from the perspective of R&D and, and marketing and, and whatnot, but also from the perspective of um, of pilots and procurement. And so going back to the opportunity that BEC can play in this, um, getting that first customer is, is really, really difficult in Canada, and in particular in BC. We don't have good sandboxes for companies to, to go and play. And BC has actually developed a couple of interesting programs that are pilots on this, and Innovate BC has, has also got a pilot program that, that is helpful. But these programs are a, a tiny fraction of what's actually needed. So we need to create more opportunities for um, government, for industry, for even uh, the community to play with these early um, solutions 
so that they can get that first customer under their belt. They can say that we've actually tried this in market, this is how it works, and then leverage that to sell globally because the reality is that we are a globally selling market. All of our solutions generally will be sold to the world at the end of the day. And what's really important is that um, often companies, when they have their first customer set up, if it's outside of Canada, they're very likely to go and move and set up their headquarters in the location that's next to that early either prototype or uh, pilot or or first customer situation. We don't want that. We want them to keep their headquarters here in Vancouver and then and have a base here. Realistically, there will be many locations a company will have uh, all over the world at some point. That's not unusual, but we want that headquarters to stay here in Vancouver. Okay, that is the time. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming to speak. Those are all your questions. Next, we have uh, speaker three, Rosemary Cooper. Yes, hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, you have five minutes oh. to speak to council and you're welcome to start when you're ready. Okay, great, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I wear a number of hats in the innovation economy. I'm uh, a director at a nonprofit called the Share Reuse Repair Initiative and we're focused on scaling uh, the circular economy as it relates to the consumer goods, so the stuff in our lives. And uh, as a really mentioned, I've been on the role of manager of circular innovation at Lighthouse Sustainability Society. So that circular as it relates to um, its built, uh, the built environment. So, um, you know, what I see is a fairly robust innovation economy here in Vancouver, and I know many of the innovators cutting across those two categories. Um, I'll see if I have time to share, share some examples, but, you know, across food, clothing, construction, you know, reusables, um, furniture, um, a, shoes, you name it, all who are in some way using what would otherwise um, go to waste um, as a resource uh, into their business, um, stretching the lifetime of products and materials. Um, so that we prevent waste, but also so that we reduce the need to um, use virgin materials um, and carbon to produce new things. Um, so what I think is important about the innovation economy um, that has a range of you know, business sizes um, is that it's really important to achieving a variety of, of city goals. And, and you know, the circular economy, people often see it as you know, most obviously preventing waste, but it's really, really important also to addressing and reaching those climate emergency goals. Um, and in fact, if you do a consumption-based emissions inventory, you know, for a place like the city of Vancouver that includes all the carbon linked to the stuff um, in our lives, including the materials that are imported in, that actually take those carbon emissions and it doubles or triples it. Um, and we actually know that that you know, circular economy and circular innovation is actually going to be um, important for getting us, you know, 45% of the carbon emissions that we need to make um, by 2050. Um, it also, you know, is a great opportunity to create inclusive circular jobs, you know, for people um, at all skill, uh, you know, and income levels. Um, and um, it, but in particular, those who are, you know, distant from the labor market, and. The other thing that we, we don't often think about is it's also important to um, enabling the citizens, the residents of Vancouver, to live what I call 1.5 degree lifestyles. So to be able to make choices that are lower carbon um, because the products and services are available to them, for them to do that in their daily lives. So as I said, we do have a robust innovation economy here, but we need to really kind of support these circular and other innovators um, so that we can achieve these goals, you know, for the city for and for its residents. Um, I've had a great opportunity to do, have some really positive collaborations with the Vancouver Economic Commission. Um, they actually sit on Share Reuse Repair Initiative Steering Committee. Um, that's that's Brian Buggy. That's been incredibly invaluable. Um, we also collaborated with them to do a Greater Vancouver Circular Economy Network, a series of five webinars last fall that were addressing some of the challenges that we're hearing from innovators in their efforts to scale. It was around how do we measure and share the story of our positive environmental and social impact, um, financing, funding, particularly um, you know at a more of a pre-revenue stage, and also policy. In fact, that session was the most well attended 
How do we make sure that silly city policy um, supports the ability of these innovators to, to get to a commercial and viable state? Um, but there are still these outstanding challenges, and I do think that the most one of the most important things generally and that I like about um, this particular motion is that, you know, innovators need to see and hear that they're working in a city that's innovation friendly, um, that they're valued and that they're seen as being, uh, you know, an important part of the city's journey to, you know, to net zero and to, and to reach other city goals. Um, you know, even just putting in place policy like a single use items ban has been a huge space factor in creating this incredibly robust uh, and actually somewhat competitive innovation ecosystem around reusables and, and other things. Um, there's other things that can be mentioned. You know, some of the existing challenges are certainly around commercial, affordable commercial space. Um, the City of Portland has just done some research recently to explore what are the different options that cities can um, take in order to help address this challenge, and even just jumping in and doing that research and exploring that. Rosemary, I'm going to um, have to just me. pause you there. You have come, yep. you have gone past your five minutes, but you do have questions. Okay, I've gone past my five minutes. Yeah, I no, that's okay. That's, it goes that's quickly. all I really wanted to say. It was that's at the excellent. very end. Uh, you do have questions from Councilor Carr, so um, Councilor Carr, please go ahead. Great. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Good to hear your voice, Rosemary, and, and uh, to hear more about your work. <laughs> Um, just wondering, uh, that city policy workshop that you talked about that was that was well attended, um, do you have any um, r results captured from that workshop that you can share with council? Yeah, I believe we do. In fact, I think we've got, um, we had a summary of those that were um, put together with the Vancouver Economic Commission and we can uh, find those and share those with council. Absolutely. I think every councillor would appreciate um, um, seeing the results of that workshop. So that would be fantastic. Um, and what, you know, out of curiosity, what do you believe is the biggest opportunity not yet realized in the uh, shared or circular economy for Vancouver? Oh, Adrian, that's a good question. Um, there are so many. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's huge, huge opportunity and need around the circular built environment. Um, Vancouver is absolutely a leader in deconstruction. I'd love to see that scale. But I'd also love to, I think there's a lot more opportunity on the upstream end around design for disassembly. And, uh, you know, the more that cities can jump in and, and um, support pilots and prototypes that show the development industry what's possible, um, the better. Um, so that, that's me wearing my lighthouse hat. I'd love to see more of that. Um, we're doing a lot on food waste. I think that's already heading forward, whatever we can do to prevent food waste. Um, I'd love to see more linked to consumer goods. We've got, you know, baby clothing subscription services like Tradal. Um, we've got Arcteryx, you know, no, it's in North Vancouver, but it's nearby. It's in this region. I think it's an underdeveloped area. And we've just seen Sweden, for example, commit to reduce their consumption-based emissions inventory in the entire country. We've already got a CBEI that's done for the city of Vancouver. So more emphasis and focus on that area because I think it's an underserved area of addressing um, climate um, uh, and waste. Wow. So I, I snuck a few in there, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, again, really, really happy that you uh, took the opportunity to share your work. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Those are all your questions. Thank you for coming to speak to Council today. Next, we have uh, Speaker 4, um, Yemi Adgulu. And we just may need to take a moment to unmute the speaker to confirm we have them on the line. I'm, I'm, I'm on the line. Can you hear oh, me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Thank you. You have five minutes to speak to council. Please go ahead whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Yemi Alifolu. I'm, um, I'm also a resident here in Vancouver. Um, in the five minutes that I wanted to speak to council, I wanted to use the short journey of our company to share some examples um, in support of the motion on innovation. 
Um, the, our company is called the Center for Innovation and Clean Energy, uh, CICE for, for short. Uh, we were founded based on a, a public uh, part, a public private partnership between the BC government, um, the government in Canada, and also Shell. But it was set up in a way that it's an independent, uh, not-for-profit organization. And it's a, it's quite a unique model in the sense that we have the ability to focus on on almost like looking at our founding members as investors whose return on investment is effectively greenhouse gas emissions reduction, economic growth, and scaling of innovation uh, from BC to the world. And our, our focus areas uh, include hydrogen, carbon capture utilization and storage, biofuels, renewable natural gas, and battery and energy storage um, as well. Um, we were incorporated in October last year, and, and just to bring some more context as to why this motion, I think it's such a critical motion, is that we were set a target, uh, we set ourselves a target that within the first 90 days of incorporation, we were going to show a bias for action and put out a call for innovation opportunities within these five focus areas that I mentioned to you. We had a plan to spend uh, $2 million uh, to give to the innovators to get them going. And we received an overwhelming set of requests for funding worth $75 million, over $75 million. So the ecosystem and these opportunities were just a range of incredibly rich opportunities, which were all about a sense of urgency around addressing the climate gap that we have or climate issues that we have as well. And this just goes to reinforce that the potential of the innovation locally, uh, but the challenges that they actually face in securing the right level of funding to accelerate the pace of deployment. We're also focusing on creating a green economy for hydrogen in Metro Vancouver. So at the moment, we're keep kicking off a piece of work to actually get into a very data-rich view of what the roadmap is to help decarbonize the hydrogen economy. And we're working alongside our partners on this and various others and collaborating with the Vancouver Economic Commission, which I thought was important to highlight here, Invest Vancouver, and, and many other sort of key players across, um, across uh, Vancouver. We are, we're focused on getting this data, we're getting the insights around it, and then we're focused on how do we drive action fairly quickly. And I'll speak about just one last point as, uh, as context. So um, in, in terms of driving action, and at the risk of oversimplifying things, um, one of the key gaps we see in scaling up hydrogen, as an example, is a lack of clarity around the demand for this. And I'm a believer in public green procurement as a critical part of this demand picture as the government uh, at both the, from a municipal, provincial, and federal level have a significant buying power and the ability to actually play a core leadership role in accelerating uh, innovation in this space by actually creating the demand that's required uh, for more hydrogen, which in turn actually unlocks both GHG reduction, uh, GDP growth, and actually enables us to capture um, a, a significant part of a multi-billion dollar export market as well. So I wanted to keep it at that, keep it really relatively short and just say I'm a big champion. I'm looking forward to any opportunities within the how the center may be able to collaborate and support on the journey on accelerating innovation here. And I wanted to leave it open for any questions that the council may have. Thank you for the opportunity. Great. Thank you very much for speaking to council. There are no questions, but we appreciate hearing your perspective today. Next, we have speaker number five, Louise Schwartz. Uh, yes, I'm on the line. Can you hear me? Great. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, please go ahead whenever you're ready. Excellent. Um, good morning, Council. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Louise Schwartz. I live and work in Vancouver, and I'm the co-owner of Recycling Alternative. Um, I'm here to speak in favor of uh, Councillor Weeb's motion. Um, the circular economy and circular innovation models really are the inevitable future for every city and region because they address three primary and urgent challenges that we're all facing. Climate crisis, supply chain precarity and disruption, and equitable and inclusive economic recovery. And uh, if, if the pandemic, one of the main lessons from the pandemic is our really our vulnerability to the last two of those, our, um, our vulnerability in supply chain and the, the need for an inclusive and equitable economic recovery. Um, so cities and regions are going to have to move towards circular sustainable models. And the sooner Vancouver gets going on this path, the better we can plan and build this paradigm shift together. In Northern Europe, Sitting, this is already happening, but it's generally being led by government and by um, ministries and public investment and funding. Um, so that's why you're seeing such acceleration in circular in Northern Europe. We do not have that luxury here. We're not going to have that luxury here in Vancouver. So we really need to start to build this 
shift and this circular economy together on the backs of the circular innovators who are already on the ground forging um, great advances. And then with local and regional governments coming together to do their part and proactively help prepare the pathway forward uh, so that we can ensure the regulatory and planning landscape allows for these types of innovations that we're going to need to start to implement. And, and that's why many of us in the circular space here, circular innovators are working on a model called The Grid to create the city's first green industrial innovation district. It's a model many of you have heard of. We, um, many of you would have received the Mapping the Grid report we released last year, and it went to city councillors. It also went to many City of Vancouver staff planning, sustainability staff, solid waste staff, and social policy staff. And you also heard about it in the um, planning staff report last year on the Employment, Lands, and Economy view, uh, review. So it was cited as one of the types of models that the City of Vancouver should be supporting in principle because it aligns with so many of the existing City of Vancouver um, strategies and policies around climate action and economic recovery. So, you know, Vancouver already has a very robust circular movement underway. We have plenty of circular innovators on the ground already uh, delivering amazing services and, and, and goods, um, and, and many of them you'll hear from today, I'm sure. But what we really need now is to harness and connect those on-the-ground efforts from the circular innovators with an approach from the city that facilitates and supports this new emerging ecosystem. And so Councillor Weave's motion will help us quantify the inventory of circular innovation models that are already happening here. But in addition, I would ask Council, while you're considering this motion, to also look um, at two key factors that need to be included in this scope or scan. And one of them is identifying, while we're doing the scan, identifying regulatory hurdles that are standing in the way of circular progress, and therefore what impediments need to be removed or changed? What levers are within the City of Vancouver's jurisdiction to proactively remove and make way for this circular innovation? And the second is around land use considerations related in particular to the importance of protecting light industrial land close to the city's core. Because without this light industrial land, Vancouver will not be able to implement the green infrastructure that is going to be critically important to climate mitigation and supply chain and jobs in 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 our in the future so um you know with something like the hospital coming in on the edge of the flats we need to be thinking about how we're going to sustainably supply and service the province's largest medical precinct in terms of food waste infrastructure services etc so just to assure council like circular innovation is alive and well in vancouver you're going to hear a lot about it rosemary cooper's already spoken about the, the role of vec in this and what we need to do now is really quantify uh, its impact and what's on the ground, but more importantly, also identify the municipal mechanisms that are standing in its way and that we can remove so that we can all get on together with this work to really open the pathway forward towards circular. So um, very much in favor and thank you for your time this morning. And thank you very much. Um, that was well-timed. You do have a question from Councillor Carr. Please go ahead. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much um, for not only speaking to us, but all the, the great work you do, Louise. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, I wonder if you could resend to Council the report that you sent a, a year ago or last year um, mm -hmm. regarding the results of the, that, um, that uh, workshop that you talked about. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. that, that would Mapping be great. The grid. It's top of mind for us right now, so I'd, I'd appreciate that. Um, great. And um, you've talked about uh, several times um, needing an approach from the city to support the circular economy and making sure we don't have um, mechanisms or, um, uh, you know, some things that stand in the way. Yep. Oh, yep. Council Carr, we've just lost your mic. Just one second. We're just having issues with your timer this morning. I'm not sure what's going on, so... Bear with me for just a moment. Sorry to cut you off. Okay, you can continue. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so uh, what, if you could identify um, some things, some mechanisms, that, as you call them, that stand in the way currently um, that we mm -hmm. can tackle at council. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, uh, um, yeah, a couple that I can think of. One is, is kind of um, permitting and regulation, um, zoning around land use. Sorry, can you hear me? We can, can you all hear me? Yep. Yep. Great, excellent. Um, so that 
so that we can do the type of activities are going to be that, that need to be um, able to operate in certain areas and zones. And this is where the industrial land use piece comes in so importantly. Uh, Metro has an industrial land strategy and Vancouver needs to look at how they can protect the, the small amount we still have remaining because the types of jobs that are generally circular and green and infrastructural are going to need that type of zoning. I think something that's very interesting, they did an, a, a thing in Torino in Italy. Um, I, I was on panel in, in Dortmund, Germany, and uh, one of the speakers from Torino said that what they did within the administration i.e. within the, the body of the city, the municipality at Torino, in Turin, is that they started to uh, work with staff on seeing staff as part of the problem solvers with those innovators on the ground, rather than this um, tendency to feel that we've got to sort of regulate or impede or, or be gatekeepers to some of these new innovations that we have not visited, haven't really, we've not seen before. So is there a way to look at the way city staff can start to see themselves as co-creating, working together, not a bit of a cultural shift, but indeed seeing where are the avenues for those innovations to land. If you're doing mug sharing and mug washing, where can, how can we facilitate that rather than impede it? So I think things around that type of a, 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 a shift in co-creating these types of working together to make the landscape um, amenable to these types of activities, and, and then the zoning and the permitting, because we are losing more and more spaces. I know a number of circular uh, innovators who are having considerable challenges um, being able to land in the areas. And then I think the other final thing is a bit, and you hear this in other aspects of um, kind of some of the services around um, the process for permits and development permits and things like that. So um, I know of a particular circular um, innovator who, by the time the timeline came, she was looking at a, a site that she thought she could lease and uh, needed to. And by the time all the paperwork came through from city, she'd, she'd lost that option. So, you know, is she going to be functioning in Vancouver or not? So those types of mechanisms, I think, are within the city's purveyance, right. for sure. Thank you. Again, You're thank welcome. you so much for, for um, uh, coming, answering those questions in the work. Thank you. And just to, right. to yeah, flag, uh, thank you very much. You do have uh, more questions, but I'm just going to flag for Council Carr. Sorry that it's only your timer this morning. That seems so I'm manually timing. So I just want you to know that if the timer is inconsistent on your screen, that's why. Thank you. And for other councillors to understand what's going on. Okay, Councillor Kirby Young, questions to the speaker. Yeah, thank you. And good morning, Louise. How are you? Great. Thanks. Hello. Good. Um, I have a, a question because I heard you speaking with a lot of. Um, kind of insight and specificity about some of the things that the city could do to support. And you mentioned like permitting and regulation, uh, flexibility um, around land use, um, protection of industrial land. But I'm looking at the language in the motion and I'm wondering about your opinion because mm -hmm. it, it, the way that it reads to me, it's very high level. Um, and there's sort of two things yes. here. It asks for a high level overview of the existing ecosystem back. I think you guys are pretty clear on what that is. And so mm -hmm. I might really wonder if that is new um, in terms of, uh, you know, you've got a lot of problems with the Vancouver Economic, they're tracking those things. And then the action piece sort of seems to be um, identify opportunities for local innovation sectors and how local innovation can further climate action equity and diversity priorities. That sounds to me like it's like, what can the sector do, not what can the city do? So I'm wondering if you think that the language in the motion is lining up with what you're expressing about what you're, how the mm -hmm. city can support. Yes, thanks for that question, um, Councillor Kirby Young. Absolutely. And indeed, I'm, I'm very much in agreement that I actually believe this is great at a high level, but in fact, we have a pretty good sense. I think it's still worth a scan on ecosystem, what's out there and what our inventory is on that. But actually, indeed, I really would favor, would, would support and, and speak in favor of, of um, a slightly more um, rigorous uh, detail around the fact that we need to look at what the impediments or hurdles are. So we've got key strengths in this, and then we've got issues and opportunities. And I think it's around that area of issues. If we could start to quantify that and where it is that the city can really help facilitate so that the innovators on the ground can accelerate, I think that is very much needed as um, a possible um, addition in language around this. And so it's, um, yeah, I, I think that's a very... Um, an excellent observation. Um, things like local innovation, climate action, equity, diversity, these are generally embedded in circular models. Um, uh, so how can we, uh, I'd love to see something that says to really quantify and identify where those key hurdles are that are within the jurisdiction of the city. 
and um, it's around that and it's around the land use so okay um, that that's really helpful for me because that's really what struck me um, yep. uh, in terms yep. of looking at it because it was sort of a well you, you know we're already passionate about this you guys are doing it mm -hmm. we know it's it's mm -hmm. good and it's innovative so mm -hmm. what what is the what is most meaningful so that's I, I appreciate that that's, uh, feedback thank you that's 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 right and that's what the innovators are needing we've got uh, really. Uh, hundreds of companies already doing this work and the grid is including them. We've got the jobs, we're quantifying those things. It's the, the, the role the city can play and our regions can play in helping facilitate this pathway. Okay, super. Thank you for zeroing yeah. in on that, appreciate it. Great, thank you very thank much. You. Uh, Louise, those are your questions, but we appreciate you coming to speak to council. Next we have uh, speaker six, Jeanette Jackson. Speaker six is not on the line. Thank you. So I uh, will move to speaker seven, Cody Irwin. Uh, Hi there, Cody. Your mic is unmuted. Oh. We can, yeah, you're, you're welcome to start um, uh, your comments to council. You have five minutes. Hi, sorry, we, uh, I was just in the middle of another meeting. Um, this is Cody Irwin from uh, Sharewares in Vancouver. And we are a uh, reusable packaging platform. I was flipping the script on single use uh, waste and uh, yeah, by creating this platform that we can uh, supply, uh, pick up, track, and wash reusable uh, packaging. Um, and then also to, uh, companies can use our uh, tracking technology to help uh, track their reusable products as well. Um, I'm very much for this motion. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't want to repeat everything that's been, been said already in the, uh, uh, by the other speakers, but uh, I think that it can uh, unlock and unhide some opportunities for the city to, uh, to incentivize and plant uh, breadcrumbs to be able to help um, businesses and people make the right choices uh, and it'd be almost in like an opt-in um, scenario. So, you know, if the uh, you know, fees are higher for permits or for uh, business licenses or, or things like that um, for um, uh, you know, bad <laughs> types of behavior, uh, or, or I should say that they're lower for uh, for the good behavior and the ones that get us towards the, the greenest city goals. Because uh, I, I do believe that with the current ecosystem, especially in the circular economy, um, Vancouver could be actually the greenest city in the world uh, and full-heartedly believe that and, and be actually a zero-waste city uh, within years with what we actually have uh, kind of brewing here. Um, and by also these incentives and, and just like the awareness around it by putting these things in, uh, in creating that positive feedback loop. So people make the right choices, people know about the right choices, um, they start kind of socially policing. And so, you know, it, it looks better on them. So it's, uh, you know, a source of pride um, and this yeah, positive feedback loop to keep getting it uh, yeah, better and better and better and moving it faster. Um, uh, and awareness is kind of the key thing, like circular economy has been brought up a lot at this meeting. And um, uh, I think 99% of the population has no idea what that means, or has anybody even heard that term before? Uh, I've, I've even heard, uh, I think Rosemary had to change the name of, event, of an event just because it said circular economy in it. Um, and and people wouldn't know what that is, so they probably wouldn't attend. Uh, so having awareness around that, because circular economy um, is it, yeah, a major driver for, for uh, reversing climate change. Uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, said that it's, you know, addresses 45% of climate change. So all of our EVs and energy efficiency in our houses and everything like that are only doing 55% of the work. And uh, the circular economy really picks up uh, the rest of it. And no one's even heard the term. So uh, we really need to get that, uh, that awareness out there of, of, of the things that we need to do. And I think the government can, um, and the city can easily do that. Uh, with you know small breadcrumbs and incentives here, there, and everywhere to, to really uh, catalyze the change. Um, yeah, that's 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 me. Uh, so uh, yeah, thanks very much for the time. And thank you very much for calling in today. Uh, there are no questions, but we appreciate hearing from you. Okay, next we're going to move on to speaker number uh, eight, Elia Kirby. Hello. Hi there. We can hear Hello. you. Yes, you've got five Great. minutes, and you're welcome to start whenever you're ready. Great. 
Hello, uh, and thank you, Honorable Mayor and Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the motion before you support the innovation economy. Um, Fia, first a little bit like myself and the organizations that I am speaking on behalf of. My name is Elia Kirby. I am a resident of Vancouver for the past 24 years and a proud member of Vancouver's cultural community and industry. And since 2003, I have been running the Great Northern Way Scene Shop, one of Vancouver's premier fabrication companies focusing on the fine and performing arts. Currently, we're working on the set for Bart on the Beach. Uh, after a two-year hiatus, Bart on the Beach is going to be back in live at Vanier Park, and we're very proud to be supporting that as well. Um, also, along in 2012, myself and my business partner, Marietta Kozak, founded and continued to manage the Arts Factory Society at 281 Industrial Avenue in Vancouver. The Arts 281 Industrial is actually a city-owned property, um, and we were the recipients or the, the lucky recipients of an RFP that was published by the city to develop artist studio spaces here. Um, it's given the darth of uh, studio spaces, <clears throat> mostly due to lawsuit development. Uh, the Arts Factory Studio is a 20,000 square foot facility where over 40 artists and arts organizations operate from. Cumulatively, pre-COVID, the artists and the arts organizations generate over $4 million in economic activity and private, provide approximately 80 to 100 full-time and part-time jobs. So why am I supporting, we supporting this motion? The arts are the original innovators. Arts and culture creates a sense of place, of history, and is a reflection of our moment in time. And arts are a significant contribution to local economies. As arts and organizations that support the arts, we want to promote what we do, how we do it, and celebrate what we have done. An economy that is supporting local creators, indigenous creators, diverse creators, and all that Vancouver and its people have to offer is one that is going to be promoting the arts and creativity and promoting those people. Lastly, there is a common misperception that the arts are passive recipients in an economy, that we are merely at the receiving end of a largesse provided by economic benefactors, whereas in fact it is precisely the opposite. The arts are one of the highest grossing sectors of the Canadian economy per capita. Artists are the driving force behind the creation of new job websites, film economy, and the excitement that generates tourism, to name just the obvious. The Arts Factory is supporting this motion because it helps to put Vancouver arts and culture on the map and the means to support itself. We support a vibrant, sustainable future, and this motion will help to create that future. I urge all councillors to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. You do have questions. Councillor Weed, three minutes. Questions to the speaker. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for speaking on behalf of um, bringing that lens of arts and culture. We're seeing a lot of NFT, AR, VR leadership here in the city and seeing the arts really play a really big role in innovative economy. Um, and so is that what you're talking about of how the arts are more than just recipient but are really leading? I mean, NFTs right now in Vancouver are one of the largest grossing artists. Um, and AR and VR, we are leading the world. So is that kind of what you're saying is that as a creative sector in Vancouver, we are a huge <clears throat> part of the economy, yet it isn't really recognized. So this motion will help bring that information to light on how many organizations are in this field and how big of an uh, impact it is to our local economy. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think it's both uh, digital as well as physical uh, artists that need to be supported and would be supported by this motion. I think that um, as the push towards uh, digital, um, you know, it is by and large an uh, you know, organic uh, expression of what people are looking for. But at the same time, there's still, uh, you know, the real demand and I mean, one thing that I've certainly noticed is is that in since the pandemic, actually, there's probably more demand for live events than there has been ever since. Um, and also, just the, the the recognition that arts and what arts artists contri contribute towards a society as well as an economy is um, it has been revitalized in ways that I thought I think that we didn't have before the pandemic. So, yeah, I think it is incredibly important. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Those are your questions. So we will be moving to our next speaker, but thank you for coming to speak to Council. Next we have, um, well, I am going to call uh, speaker number nine, Melina Schofield. 
Speaker number nine is not on the line. Okay, great, thank you. And just noting that the speaker may have had challenges joining because of the schedule change, but did send in a letter um, for all of council. Uh, speaker number 10, Mark Wen uh, Wendler. Uh, thank you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, feel free to start whenever you're ready. Awesome, thanks so much for having me. Uh, my name is Mark Wendler. I'm the CEO of one of these rapidly growing Vancouver circular economy businesses that we're here of. Uh, we're called Sustainable Health Foods, Inc., and I support Motion B7, supporting the innovation economy. Um, going back a step, I moved to Vancouver from Alberta to pursue my MBA at UBC. The reason I did this was its focus on sustainability and innovation. It was doing very, everything very different than other MBA programs, such as the one back in my home province, which was very focused on oil and gas. Now, I moved to Vancouver for the green economy. And during my time with the program, I quickly learned about the circular economy. The circular economy is basically the green economy in action. Sustainable was born out of this MBA program. I met a colleague who came from the Vancouver beer industry. He basically noted a big problem that breweries were having, and this was dealing with the waste management fees that kept rising, and they've only continued to rise, especially since COVID. Now what Sustainable does is we partner with these craft breweries to upcycle their grains and keep it in the food system. Now the best thing about this is I come from a healthcare background. And when I noticed exactly what this byproduct is, all the sugar went into the beer, all the fiber, protein, and minerals are left behind. This not only affects our local economy, but it also affects our health and the environment. Now, while we have received a good amount of support for our business here in Vancouver, many of the speakers, EAUBC, VEC, uh, Keith, who's supposed to be from Spring, support us, the same consistent challenges keep coming up. The most notable ones are affordable real estate for both our business and our employees. And secondly, an inclusive physical space or ecosystem where circular economy innovation can take place and be piloted. The problem is the barrier to entry for circular economy businesses in Vancouver is too high. And that means that it's anything but inclusive. As a result, some of the most talented and passionate people I have met leave Vancouver for better, more affordable opportunities. I firsthand have witnessed many of my MBA colleagues leave for this very reason. And if there isn't an attempt to address these issues soon, myself and Sustainable may not be far behind. In the last few months, Sustainable has been scouted by economic development representatives from other provinces, a few regions in the US, and both European and Australian accelerators as well. We also just recently finished the CHFA trade show here in Vancouver and have made amazing connections across the country. All of these bodies are offering support to our most key challenges. But, but the truth is, I love Vancouver, and I do have a bias for building sustainable in the BC marketplace. I do, however, find myself struggling more and more at saying no to these opportunities in light of affordability, sorry, affordability seemingly spiraling more and more out of control. Before I finish, I'd like to share a lesson I learned from competing in competitive soccer for almost 20 years. It is always difficult to get to the top, but it is even more difficult to stay there. I came to Vancouver to participate in the green economy. If Vancouver wishes to keep itself center stage as a leader in the green economy, they must have invest in the circular economy and the innovation economy. If there's anything I've learned since working in this space, it is that the circular economy is the future of a resilient green economy. Other municipalities are aggressively investing and supporting it. Vancouver needs to do the same as well. I believe this motion is a good first step. Thank you. And thank you. Um, you do have questions, Councillor Carr, three minutes, uh, questions of the speaker. Great, thank you, thanks so much. Um, so you just talked about um, barriers and uh, the need for Vancouver, the city of Vancouver to invest. What would we invest in specifically? Um, is, it, is it the land um, issue, the affordable real estate? Um, that's the biggest problem or, I mean, I, just describe to me what you would have us invest in. Yeah, so I think Louise Schwartz has like the leading plan in terms of the grid. It's a physical workspace. Uh, a lot of people, when they think of innovation, they go immediately to tech and they go to this online software technology. Uh, but the biggest piece is the intersection with the physical space, what technology can do to our real lives. Um, and real estate is that big key piece. So one thing um, I'm learning very fast, I did the MBA, but I don't come from a finance background. And so one thing, triple net leases, for example, uh, that combined with the delays in zoning 
uh, basically it puts all the risk on the entrepreneur who doesn't have the same insight into timelines and whatnot and takes it all off these large real estate companies who just aren't really as supportive as a local. And if one business fails, they just move on to the next one. And so I think that's creating that problem between that divergence. And there's a lot of key little tactics that could be used to solve these problems. And so triple net leases is one that's like an incredible barrier and the time to rezone uh, the lack of food space. So the circular economy, for example, um, it, for food in particular, it needs to be food safe space. People need to trust the food. And, and so it needs to happen. And there's a lot of food waste loss in the urban environment. And so we need that space in Vancouver as well. Okay, th thank you. Super helpful. Really appreciate you taking the time with us. So thank you very much. Those are all your questions. We appreciate you coming to speak to council today. Uh, that does bring us to the end of our uh, speakers list, but I will call on the two speakers who um, were not uh, there at the first chance. So speaker number six, Jeanette Jackson. And speaker number nine, Melina Schofield. Okay, so hearing none, I'm gonna take us back to the main queue. Actually, yes, sorry, thanks for the reminder. We do have a speaker that uh, was not here. Uh, speaker number one, Keith Ippel. Indicating in person, but we do not have anybody in the chamber, so we will leave it there. Uh, so we will move to a main queue here, and the motion, of course, has been moved. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young, you are first up on the uh, queue. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I actually um, would like to propose an amendment, um, and in sort of spirit of what I, um, how I had read them. Can I move you to an amendment sure. queue, and then yeah. feel free to put yourself back on the queue to introduce your amendment. Sorry, there we go. Um, yeah, I appreciate Council we bringing the motion forward, and I think that um, Council really dedicating uh, focused attention to a vibrant economy and an innovative economy is really important. What struck me in reading the motion that it was the language um, itself, I think not the intent, was that it was really focused on sort of describing what the current local innovation economy was as opposed to more how the city could support and enable. Um, and that was borne out, I, I think, in some of the speakers we heard from, such as Louise Schwartz, and trying to zero in on how the city could support that. I also had a lot of feedback from the tech sector who had reached out to me, um, and I think with uh, felt that they um, there was also some good dialogue, which they really appreciated, apparently, with Council Weeb around the motion, and that they were referenced in the whereas clauses um, somewhat, but felt left out. Um, in terms of the motion itself um, and the fact that we have such a diverse, you know, working with folks, whether it's Frontier Collective, the Metaverse, um, Virtual Reality, AR, um, that the, they were not seen in this. And I really was struck by the comment from one of the speakers that said um, one of the things that's really important for the local innovation sector and entrepreneurs is to be seen and acknowledged by the city. Um, and valued from that perspective and they sort of felt that that the language well, the intent was there, the language didn't reflect that. Um, and then also with the couple of weeks delay on the motion, um, and I guess process around notifications, that they didn't have a chance to speak. And there was a pretty robust amount of speakers um, that were going to speak, uh, folks like Handel Kim from Variational, Nat Cartwright uh, from FinAI, Vivian Chan from the VR, AR, Metaverse, Ray Walia from the Launch Academy, Sam G from Dapper Labs, um, uh, Chris Newman in the venture capital area, someone from Unbounce, Invest Vancouver, all of whom would have liked to speak but felt that there's they didn't get notification or weren't aware of it. And so I think we want to acknowledge that we want a diversified, um, robust economy of Vancouver. The innovation economy from the circular perspective and the climate friendly is incredibly important, but so is our tech sector. Um, and so the spirit of this amendment tries to sort of address those two things, one around specificity of how the city of Vancouver can um, support and break down hurdles, and the other one that we recognize we have two very vibrant and important um, and growing sector. So that's the spirit of um, the alternate language that I have provided that I believe is on screen now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Um, seeing no other uh, speakers to the amendment, we can, okay, Councillor Weeb. go ahead. Um, yeah, I actually 
like a lot of the wording here, I think that it was been some really good debate over the last couple of weeks. Um, but I don't fully understand the full strike and replace because I think there's two different things here. One is looking at Vancouver Economic Commission to do a high level overview um, and report to staff on what is happening, um, including how many organizations, the jobs, the strengths, what are the op opportunities um, for the local economy. So I think that part is still something that should be directed for. Um, I do also like that the 404 be it resolved as an addition that the council direct staff to report back on the consultation with the innovation system. I think that's an important component, um, as well as the work and engagement on the Vancouver Economic Commission. So um, I would rather see this as additions and to the motion because I do think it strengthens the motion. I do um, recognize the conversations with the tech sector and the event that happened yesterday, there's an event happening tonight, there's one on Saturday. It's pretty amazing what's happening in our tech economy here in Vancouver and the support that they want to see from the city of Vancouver. So um, I'm hoping that we could see this um, as an addition and not as a strike and replace because I think the work to get a report from VC is really important to really understand what is needed and what is the strengths of this economy and where we're at. And, the current step. So um, I would like to see this as an addition and not as a strike and replace. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young, you do have time left, uh, two and a half minutes. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, maybe in terms of process wise, trying to get to a good outcome here. Um, and uh, I think two things. I'm wondering if I might suggest it and, you know, for Councillor Weave's consideration. Um, that we could vote on this amendment and then he could potentially, so that we don't have to go through many variations of procedure and coming up with different language and other amendments. And then uh, we could vote on this one and if you wanted to add in, back in the piece around getting the local, um, the overview, um, that might be one way to get to the same end more quickly and efficiently. I did hear from one of the speakers that they didn't feel, they felt that it was well quantified and they had that data, but it's helpful to have that, Councilor Weave feels that's helpful to have that back summarized in the report. I, that would make sense to me, but I'm just thinking that just mechanically, maybe the quickest way to get there is to vote on this, support this one, and then Councillor Weave could add back in his language um, on the overview piece. I know we have a long day, so I'm trying to get us to a good place. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Weave, this is not a discussion, so I'll just ask you to go back on the queue, but we do have um, Councillor DiGenova up next, and I just heard the mayor's yeah, point of privilege. I, I can't seem to, to trigger my uh, uh, speaking panel, so if you put me on the list, that would be great. Thank you. Yes, no problem. We can do that. Okay, so Councilor DiGenova. Um, just a point of procedure, but I thought I'd put myself on the queue for this. Once something is struck and voted on, wouldn't it need to be reconsidered? It couldn't just be amended back in. I, I just need to know that before I vote on this, because to Councilor Kirby Young's suggestion, as to what we could do. Um, I, procedurally, I understand that once something's taken out by council, the only way to, to, to put it back in is to reconsider it. And that would undo everything Councillor Kirby Young's doing. So I, I just want to make sure, it, you know, in the spirit of being efficient here, that, you know, that's procedurally you know, can something be struck and then that exact same language be put back in in a in a, another amendment afterwards, Chair? Yes, it's a very good question, Councillor Di Genova, and I believe you are correct. I'm just going to confer with the clerks on one piece of that, and um, I'll get right back to you. Can we sever and vote separately? Let's keep put this down. Just wanted to share that someone's mic's on because I can hear them. So I'm gonna I'm going to um I guess to a three minute recess that'll take us to a quarter to the hour and that will give the clerks just a chance to confirm a couple nuances to this particular piece of the procedure by law. So we'll be reconvening at 1045.
to order and just give our folks uh, virtually a chance to rejoin. Uh, so, Council D. Genova, um, in response to your procedural question, that is correct that if the language is struck, the exact same language cannot be um, sort of added back in after if this amendment were to pass. Um, so you're correct. Procedurally, that would not be uh, able to happen if that was the case. Um, we may have a way forward. So I'm going to pause that. Um, if there's anything further, Council D. Genova, I can start your timer and you can make a comment on the amendment. Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to say that I, I did see an email come through and I think there may be a change to this. So I'll just uh, hold my comments for now and see what what occurs when Councillor Kirby Young comes back on. So I'll put myself back on afterwards, perhaps. Okay, Thanks. that's that's excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Stewart. Mayor, we don't have your audio. Yeah, sorry, that's my fault. Uh, I think I was just going to suggest the motion be withdrawn, but I do uh, and then reintroduced just as an amendment. It looks like that's happening. So I'm um, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay, excellent. So uh, Councillor Kirby Young, over to you. Oh, I'd like to withdraw the motion on the floor, please. Okay, so we uh, have a motion to withdraw. We need unanimous consent to do that. So I'll just call for a vote. Uh, all those in favor say yay. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. So I'm going to take us back to the amendment queue, the main queue, sorry. And Councillor Kirby Young, you still have the floor. So I'd like to propose a an amendment to the motion on the floor. And I've sent that language in. And if the clerk can bring it up. I'm not sure if that, I'm just trying to manage screens here. There was some te text in red. Yes, there it is. Um, so the first paragraph remains, uh, the further that is struck, and then the red text is the addition um, with the rationale that I spoke to earlier. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Councillor Kirby Young. Just giving a moment for anybody to, oh, Councillor Wade, please go ahead. Yeah, um, I'll speak in favor of this. It's been a robust couple of weeks of uh, really speaking to the um, the innovation economy, mostly the frontier tech and some of the other groups. And I think that the way this motion got pushed, I think this is a great addition to it. I think it's going to be very supportive of recognizing um, the vibrancy happening. So I really appreciate this amendment and I will be supportive. Thank you very much. Uh, so seeing no other councillors on the queue, we can go over to a vote on the amended, on the amendment. And that motion passes with unanimous support. Thank you, Council. So we will go back to the main queue. And Councilor Kirby Young, you do uh, have the floor. Um, no, I think I've uh, I've made my comments. So I know we've got a full day. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councilor Kirby Young. Uh, so this is the opportunity to provide any closing comments to the amended motion. Councilor Weeb. Yeah, I'll speak to it. Um, it has been an absolute delight to meet all the organizations in the last couple months that are working in frontier tech, innovation economy, and all these different worlds of biotech, clean tech, agri-tech, marine tech. We have so much innovation happening in the world. Um, and some of these organizations yesterday talked about the amount of GHG and consumption-based GHGs are reducing, the amount of equity that they're making sure that people from different backgrounds um, reconciliation tech like it's amazing to see what we're doing to change the world in here in Vancouver and I really appreciate the amendment because it's really going to help us recognize what is the sectors here in Vancouver how we can support as a city and how we can become a leader in this world because what we're doing here in Vancouver is being replicated and supporting um, the global betterment of society and I think that that's in creating better connections with people, better connections with the environment, and better connections with each other. So really appreciate everyone's support on this and looking forward to seeing the growth of these organizations in the next few years. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Weave and uh, Councillor Carr, over to you. 
Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. I just really want to appreciate Councillor Weed for forwarding this motion. Um, that I, I was happy to second it. It's I, I think a really important um, motion at this time in Vancouver's history. I think the economies around the world are changing, and uh, um, the innovation economy, the circular economy. Uh, th these are, um, in fact, the, I, I think the uh, path forward that both addresses. Um, the environmental and sustainability and climate concerns as well as um, provides for the secure jobs that uh, that you know really use less in, and recycle the the resources that we do have um, and uh, um, I think that they are attracting youth as we uh, saw in a number of the uh, speakers so thank you I think the amendment by um, by Sarah by sorry councillor Kirby young um, is a really good addition around what the city can do. We heard that loud and clear. There are issues around permitting, about land use and zoning and regulations. So um, altogether, I think it's a great motion. Great, and thank you. Uh, with that, we can move to um, a vote on the amended motion. And that motion passes with unanimous support. Okay, so thank you very much. This does conclude item one on the agenda uh, for today. So the second item is referred from the Standing Committee on April 13th, entitled Enabling a Recovery Community Center in the City of Vancouver, which was moved and introduced by myself, uh, Council Bly, and uh, seconded by Councillor Kirby Young. So we will now hear from speakers on this motion. And the first speaker, registered speaker, is speaker number one, uh, Grace T. Just a point of procedure, Chair. Yes, Council DiGenova. Did you have a vice chair that was going to take over during your motion? I don't think that's required until we get to debate. Okay, just, just wanted to check. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, okay, back to the speaker. Apologize uh, for the interruption. Grace T, are you on the line? Okay, not hearing Grace T in this moment. I'll just get a note from the clerk one moment. Okay. Speaker one is not on the line. Speaker number two is Derek Mel Donado. Uh, chair, speaker two is not on the line. Okay, hey, speaker number three is Guy Felatella. Hello? Hi there. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, you have five minutes to speak to council. Please go ahead. Um, yeah, so my name is Guy Felatella. I work as a peer clinical advisor for Vancouver Coastal Health uh, Regional Addiction Program, and I'm in support of the motion for the Recovery Community Center. We Oftentimes, when somebody is seeking to do something um, to change, to move forward, they're tired, um, we just give them a phone, call Access Central, get into detox. There's no further communication going after that, and we just expect other people to keep uh, intervening to support them moving forward. Well, that, that doesn't happen, and it's very defeating and humanizing. So this recovery community center would be a landing spot for people who have the desire to stop using. That doesn't mean that somebody stopped using. It just means that they're searching for something different because they're tired or they want to change their lives. And so this facility would also have um, meetings uh, it would include, like, all aspects of recovery and treatment options, such as um, uh, NA, AA, harm reduction works meetings, um, parent meetings, support group meetings, trauma groups. Um, we hope to include trauma therapy, give people awareness of, of themselves and build a relationship. But not only that... Uh, system navigation from peer support workers as well who understand how challenging um, it is to access services to move forward uh, with people's lives. And then also, too, I've been talking with some people who are very interested to, you know, employ people 
as well. So it could be part of a job placement program for people as well. So it gives people purpose and hope. And, and oftentimes in, in recovery, um, people need that full spectrum of support. And then if somebody was to even go to treatment, this could also be a landing spot for them to attend meetings, build relationships, uh, have friendships. And so basically it's, if you look at the recovery club that's uh, in place today, this is just basically recovery 2.0, but really meeting people where they're at and supporting them. And I, I think the, the most important thing is that people often give up uh, hope when you have to try to navigate your system by yourself. It's very fearful. Um, so you give up and you are less inclined to try it again because you know how rigid and rigorous it is. So having this support facility with people um, to access, um, to move forward um, is a powerful concept. And I speak with, with many people uh, throughout the Vancouver area who don't have a spot to go when they want to get help. It's just basically you have to pick up that phone. So what we're trying to build is the full spectrum of care at this facility uh, to actually support people um, and make them feel supported as well. It'd be a welcoming place. Um, and it would have, you know, indigenous culture groups for what they deem is treatment for uh, their people. Uh, just a vast majority of understanding that uh, recovery is many different things to many different people. Um, and so we want to support all those models, including if somebody wants to completely be abstinent from substances, uh, we want to support them too. And so that is, that's really the kind of nutshell of the, of the model, really a place where, you know, we'd like it where everybody knows your name, kind of like the cheers theme, you know, very welcoming, inviting, and, um, you know, hopefully to uh, transform and, and change people's lives. So take any of your questions. Thank you very much. You do have a number of questions. So uh, first up is Councillor Kirby Young. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Guy. How are you? I'm well, Kirby. How are you? Yeah. You can call me Kirby. I get called a lot worse. Um, <laughs> I um, was wondering, um, following up on a question that was asked when the motion was introduced and sort of um, suggested that this is a Vancouver Coastal Health Initiative, why you feel it's important that the City of Vancouver take the step to, in I think there's sort of a couple components of the motion, one to endorse um, this um, facility and, and this model, and two, to, uh, the other crux of the motion is to really try to expedite bringing it forward within our um, processes, regulations, permitting, and so forth. So why do you think it's important the City of Vancouver weigh in on this at this point? Well, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, Vancouver City has to look at supporting all people. It's not just, you know, you have to really understand that um, there's many people struggling. Um, you know, we don't have a spot like this, like this type of facility. Um, it's much needed in Vancouver, like well overdue. Um, and I just, you know, I, we're in a public health crisis, you know, and there's lots of people that, that, that want to get out and they feel defeated and so they give up. And so that's why the city should support it and, um, and definitely be on board with, you know, supporting people. It's not about, you know, uh, supporting harm reduction over recovery or recovery over harm reduction. It's about supporting people and giving them all the options that are available. And this the city needs to give that option as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks for speaking today. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Weebs, three minutes. Questions to the speaker. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, first question, in the actual resolution, it doesn't talk about the actual model, it just talks about a centre. So would you be okay with the city endorsing a centre, recognising that the model might change depending on the different partnerships and organisations like you talked about, um, some of the Indigenous groups on how they would like to see a recovery centre and the other different groups in downtown Eastside. So can you talk a little bit about how the motion talks, would you support the motion without supporting um, the recovery coach model as the desired outcome? Well, I think recovery coaching piece is part of it, 
if somebody wants a recovering coach, then they should be able to have access to it. So, you know, that has to be included just in case somebody does want that. And, and recovery coaching isn't, you know, um, about abstinence. It's about teaching people about the different uh, formulations of recovery. So I don't know why you would want to take one component out. Well, um, I'm just, I'm just, what I'm saying is in the motion, it just talks about establishing a recovery community center, right? And so I know you talked about we are trying to build a certain thing, but in the motion, we're talking about just creating a recovery community center, a space for giving people an opportunity when they're ready to move through the recovery model and however they feel ready. Um, and so for me, when I'm looking at the motion, I think it's great that we could look at what a recovery community center with. I want to, the element that I was struggling with isn't actually in the therefore be it resolved. And that's just looking at one model, um, recognizing that there's a lot of models that the community have voiced to us that they would like to see. And it was talked about NA and AAs and some of those work for some people and not. So I like the idea of creating a center where we could have multiple models being utilized and um, the recovery coach model could be one of the programming in the space, but it wouldn't be the overall model of the community center. Yeah, Would you be yeah. okay with that? hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. Like I, I'm more, I'm more, what I listen, what, what's very important for this center and is, is about supporting people. Yeah. Like that's, that's the, that's the, that's what, that's what recovery is. It's about supporting people and giving them and laying out all the options for people and letting them pick the option that they want. And then that's the focus. It's not about what my expectation is or your expectation or anybody else's expectation. It's about the individual's expectation that they want in their lives. Our jobs are really just to be the support network and the taxi driver to drop them off wherever they need to go on that journey. That's what true support is. It's not picking one side over the other. It's about people. And there's many people that need many different forms of options. And so that's what this center is. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Swanson, questions to the speaker. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for coming in, Guy. I've been a admirer of yours on social media and thanks for all your work um but i want to support this um motion but i'm having problems with it um like the first one is it's about people who want abstinence treatment but it doesn't say that is that correct it, it's not about um it's a, it, listen what it's about is 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 there's many listen in my life I've always had the desire to stop using substances. I just couldn't stop. Yeah. So I, um, and so, um, until I did, and it was a combination of things. So uh, there's many people uh, who are using substances that have the desire to stop. They just haven't figured it out yet. So th the model isn't, um, it is supportive of people if that's what they want. If somebody wants to go to treatment and stop using substances, then we should support them. And if somebody okay. um, is not sure or they want to be on um, medications or whatever it is, then we will support them. That's, that's the thing. It's giving all the options that are available for people. And, you know, for me, it was the same thing at the end. It was, you know, I... I was just done, done, and I needed okay. to figure something out. So it, it's not an abstinence. So, so when, it's not an abstinence pushing model. No. Okay. So if somebody went to this center, would they be able to get a safe supply if that's what they wanted? No, we would refer them to um, like a harm reduction facility or a medical uh, practitioner that would prescribe safe supply. So it's okay. Like you, um, don't go to, you, you don't go to the recovery. You don't go to the recovery club to get safe supply either. So, okay. So you said you work with VCH, but are you representing VCH? And do you know why the VCH speaker withdrew? Uh, I I don't know. Okay. Okay. Um, do you call it the issue here? Do you call it an overdose crisis or a toxic drug crisis, or does it make any difference to you? 
I, I mean, you know, you, you, I mean, it's a, obviously it's a toxic drug crisis, toxic policy crisis, um, and also, <laughs> to, and also, and also to, um, you know, they're, you know, sadly, uh, I've I've known many people who have have overdosed in in the decades that uh, I've been around, and I've known people who have, you know, bought poison dope and and died with one hit that they didn't know what they were getting. So I, I you know, it's it's simply tragic of of what's going on. So yeah, I mean, it's a it's more of a. The, the policies have created the supply the way it is. So. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you. That's Thanks uh, so all much, Councillor Swanson's time. But you do have questions, uh, Councillor Fry. Thanks. Hey, thanks, uh, Guy. Hi, Guy. Uh, thanks for joining us and sharing that really important lived experience perspective, um, especially on uh, issues about like the road to recovery. I've, I've followed the, this kind of model quite a bit in the recovery cafe down in Seattle, and I, and it. I'm hoping you can articulate where this isn't just like about health, but my understanding is recovery is also about like life skills and you know learning budgeting and social supports, and it's not just a, a, a health perspective. Is that kind of correct? Yeah, it's 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 a combination of things. I mean, you know, um, you definitely have to uh, you, you know find other aspects. Obviously, there's a big component with housing. Um, you know, people having a place to live, uh, you know, people being able to be employed, you know, you know, there's the, the, the truth is, is, is what happens is even when people are in recovery, they're still stigmatized for their past and we don't, our society doesn't allow them to move forward. So we'll, we'll look at their criminal record and we won't hire them or rent them a place to live. Um, you know, we use our biases and our judgments of, of how we looked upon people. So, yes, this facility would definitely um, try to bridge those gaps to people. Um, I would hope that um, that not only the, the community of Vancouver would start look at, at, at you know, offering people uh, employment and, uh, the, you know, the, the providers that uh, – that are in our society to, to employ people, to give people purpose, to, to, to help people, you know, um, have some, have that, you know, one of the biggest things I've often said in my own life was just getting a, was getting a paycheck with my name on a paycheck meant a lot to me because I just never had that uh, for a long time. And, you know, so all those aspects is, is something that, um, you know, we want the facility to have. It's obviously contingent on, sadly, uh, money. So we hope to, you know, do some um, organizing and hopefully, you know, find some sponsors and now, people you, who want to. Do you yeah. see this as an avenue for, like, uh, employment and, 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 like, how important is peer-based experience to get in this facility? Well, it's massive. Like, you know, when, you've, when, you, when you're talking to people that have gone through it before, and they're supporting you. It's huge. It's it's it inspired my journey. Like you know, seeing somebody leave the downtown east side and they hadn't used substances in four years, and they came back to you know hand out sandwiches. I was just blown away. Like I just didn't think that was a reality. And so oftentimes, you know, people need to see that, feel that, and understand that people have gone before them and 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 done that journey. If, if this is all contingent on what a person wants to, um, I was always I always wanted that. So. And there's lots of people that want it right now that aren't able to to, to find it. So many know, people ask me all the time. I know you've inspired a lot of people with your journey, guys. So appreciate you speaking today. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, Councilor Di Genova. Thanks so much. Hi, Guy. And and first of all, I just want to say thanks for for sharing your story and your experience. You know, today with us, but also. Um, as you do in the community and for being such an inspiration. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering when you look at this motion, would you see this? I mean, who do you see being the operator? If we enable this to happen, who would the operator be? Would it be privately operated or would it be operated publicly? Uh, I, th that, uh, th those details are um, still being looked upon. Uh, and, and sorry, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I mean, uh, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to preempt it by, by trying to explain what I'm getting at here. I've actually had a family member that I have 
um, had to look for for rehab for and an extended family member and you know in doing so there are a lot of private businesses out there i'm sure you know of this and it, it seemed to me that they wanted him to get better uh, after tens of thousands of dollars uh, but just enough but not completely better because it seemed like they're they they were focused on re repeat business and this was a reputable one of the more reputable places in bc so i'm just wondering is that a concern you have with private operators you know it, it, the access the 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 ability for some people to access treatment considering the high cost if you have to go private which you can do in the province of bc oh i'm very concerned with with that i i mean uh you know, um, obviously, uh, I don't think anybody should have to pay for 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 treatment uh, for a substance use disorder, and unfortunately, um, they do. You know, there's a wait list for you know a longer wait list for people who struggle with you know poverty or don't have the money to pay privately. And then there's uh, you know, like I said, if you have thirty thousand dollars, I could get you into a place tomorrow. However, with that being said, as well as that, uh, there are many. Uh, services out there that um, are public and do take public funds. The challenge that we have, obviously, with the what Gene was talking about is the toxic drug supply that has contaminated with benzos, which makes it extremely challenging for somebody that they need a medical detox. So it's just a longer chain of events that happens. And then after that, to get into a certain facility, whether people are on medications or not. Uh, so you knock off a bunch of facilities because some facilities don't accept people on certain OAT medications. So yeah, there's many. There's 15 many seconds things. left. So I'm just going to interrupt you and say, do you see this as one model, but you'd like to see a, a, a a number of models of recovery centers offer. Just a couple seconds to respond, Guy. Yeah, it will be. Uh, it, it is. It's a model that meets the needs of people, but it's also an out more. It can also be in line with being an outpatient program. There are no outpatient. There's not many outpatient programs as there used to be uh, with ADP counselors like we used to have back in the 90s. So that's all gone away. Um, however, <laughs> this is more getting people to that next phase. Okay, I'll just have Thanks to leave so it much. there. That's Thank you. Uh, and You're welcome. I do see no other Counselors for questions. I do have questions, uh, a couple follow up questions. Guy, can you just uh, say again what your role is um, at Vancouver Coastal Health? Uh, I, I have many roles, but I'm the peer clinical advisor, so I'm part of the leadership team at the regional addiction program. So, um, but, uh, you know, I work with uh, on, on many, uh, you know, drug policy, uh, harm reduction, uh, recovery initiatives. Okay, great. Uh, can you yeah. can you share uh, based on that um, how this model is sort of referenced uh, in terms of the continuum of care at Vancouver Coastal Health? Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's part of the continuum of care that needs to exist. Like it's you know, gone are the days where it's and or or it's both. And uh, you know, it's not just harm reduction. It's it has to be everything. And you know, we realize that that. Uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, sadly, um, so many people dying every day, um, and uh, you know, are dying and trying access services as well. So, uh, you, this is have... just that. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I thought you were done there. You please finish. No, this is just the the full the full continuum of care that needs to exist to support people. So, do you hear from people um, in your role? I know you you're often uh, in the downtown east side specifically. Um, can you just share an example of of what that interaction is like with people who are right now living with substance use disorder? Um, perhaps one of the experiences that you've had where you see that this could actually serve a great uh, need in the downtown east side and and elsewhere in the city. Well, I mean, anytime I go, I go down there, there's at least, you know, one or two people that, uh, you know, either need support getting into detox, want to get into detox, want to get into treatment. Uh, I've gotten, you know, I, I have helped many people, um, you know, uh, my, my friend just took four years uh, a couple months ago and I walked by him on the street and I saw him and he wasn't doing well and I, you know, a voice in my head just said, you better go back. You might never see him again. And I did. And, and he just told me, I want to get the hell out of here. 
and that day the stars aligned for him. I, I managed to get him out. Now he works for, you know, Rain City. I mean, there's multiple stories like this, but there's just, you know, people want uh, want to get out. It's just very hard to do it on your own. And so what we are trying to create with this facility is that we don't want you to go alone. We want you to keep trying. And that's the thing. Celebrate people trying. Uh, you don't have to celebrate the success. You just celebrate that people are continuing to try. Yeah, okay, that's that's great. That is the end of my time. I appreciate uh, your responses to all of those questions. That um, is all the questions that you have today. Thank you for coming to speak to Council. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. So next we have uh, Speaker 4, Brian McGrath. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And Brian, are you a resident of Vancouver? Actually, I'm not. Nope. Okay, that's no problem. Just uh, wanted to indicate that on the speakers list here. Great. Brian, you have five minutes yep. to speak to Council. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Council members, thanks for the opportunity for uh, talking today. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I am a person in long-term recovery myself. I've been uh, in recovery for over 20 years. And I also have worked in the field for a number of years. I've been an uh, outreach worker to a uh, counselor, to program manager, supervisor, and recovery coach. And that is what I do now is I, I'm an educator of recovery coaching. And one of the reasons I am speaking is because of long-term recovery, and I've worked in the downtown east side for a number of years. And so this here community center, I am really in favor of and think it's a big plus. A couple things, I'm, I'm glad Guy went before me because he explained a little bit more than what I know was happening. And uh, I think one thing also with this community center, having so many different resources in there, it could be not just for the downtown east side. There's a lot of people dying in their apartments by themselves using blue collar, white collar, stuff like that because they use by themselves. And they do, they're not connected to anybody. So this center downtown maybe a place that they could go seek uh, some help from also, which is exciting. So I, I just want that to get out there so it's not just one focus. And as Guy was saying, uh, I think the idea is it's what people need. It's not harm reduction. It's not abstinence. It's whatever the person needs themselves. And in recovery coaching, that's what we teach, is, uh, is to listen to the person. And one thing I want to mention is in coaching alone, I know businesses get coaching, leaderships get coaching, fitness coaching. There's all types of coaching. And people go there to improve what it is they're doing, whether it's the organization themselves, their body, their mind, whatever it is. So recovery coaching is the same idea. We empower people. And this center sounds like a great thing of where we can empower the person find out what they actually need. Because one thing we talk about also is uh, there's transaction and transformation. Now, I've worked in a lot of treatment centers and other organizations, and they're great. For someone to get in there, though, they need to do certain things. And same with a lot of organizations and services. You have to do certain things in order to receive that service. And so we kind of look at it like that's a transaction. If you go in and you do A, B, C, and D, You'll get roof over your head, food in your belly, and this. In addiction, and I know for myself, it was the transformation that changed me. Transactions are great, and they can keep me clean for a short period of time or sober or whatever the language is you want to use. But that was just the transaction. When I went back out and done what I was doing, I went back into what I did. It was the inside. And one of the statistics out there comes from David Best over in the UK. Is if you can connect someone in recovery with someone else in recovery, they have a 27% better chance of doing what they're looking to do. And so with this community center or recovery center, there'd be someone down there that's like-minded of what that person is looking for and connecting to what they need. So just the one person would give them 27% chance. Now, with all the resources that Guy's talking about, this would improve the chances immensely, improve the recovery capital so they can continue on what they're looking for, 
build on the recovery capital, figure out what they already have and what they need to empower them and let them uh, let them continue on in the life that they're looking for. And it also helps society, right? We know that. When someone improves their health, their health, hospital use slows down. And as I was saying, a lot of people like to employ, they start paying taxes or they start volunteering and helping others. So there's so many positives to this. It's it's fantastic. I know back east in Nova Scotia, they just opened up a center back there. I, I've moved out here years ago from there. They just opened up one uh, in the middle of January, I believe, and they're going to open up four more this year throughout Nova Scotia. And this is kind of the same idea for what I'm reading. I'm trying to get a hold of government back there to talk to them about it. They're doing the same thing because they realize what's missing. And they realize not everybody can go to treatment. So they need a place to connect to. And a resource center like this is fantastic. Where they can just walk in off the street. They don't need an appointment. They can walk in, see each other. Uh, I like what Guy said about the uh, the cheers thing, you know. Hey, whatever your name is, it was Norm on Cheers. Oh, I think that's my time there. But uh, that is that is your time. But you do have um, questions from a couple of counselors so far. So um, I'm going to advance Councillor Kirby Young for three minutes questions to the speaker. Yeah, hi. Sure. Hi, good morning. Um, thanks for speaking to Council. Uh, I'm really interested to learn more about a recovery coach. And I know you touched on it, but just trying to get a better sense and understanding of um, what that's like and if you could describe in a bit more detail for those of us that may not be as familiar. Um, what's it like in terms of your ongoing work with a client and can you sort of, you know, add some color to that and some detail to that? In terms of how that sure. relationship works and, and how, how, how the process goes? Absolutely. So, so in a lot of recovery coaching, we, we get skills in uh, motivational interviewing, uh, appreciative inquiry, how to empower someone, ask questions and know boundaries and know our lane. So as a recovery coach, we don't step out and do therapy or counseling or anything like that. We connect them to what they need, what they're looking for, the person. That's one of the big things with the coach is, we just ask powerful questions, so as any coaching. So you can go inside, find out what it is that you're really looking for. I started working with a coach in the latter part of my years. I still work with a coach. I've moved, moved more in the past five years than I have in the first 15 years of my recovery. Now, I, I've done a lot, but in these past five-plus years with my coach, it was way beyond because he, he was able to ask me questions so I could look inside myself and see what I already had and what I can use and what I can build on. And he empowered me to know that I am a smart guy. I can do these things. And I am allowed to do these things. That's the biggest thing. Because a lot of times people tell, especially in addiction, we are told what to do. I have guys come to me all the time and say, what, what do I got to do? And I say, I'm not sure. Let's sit down and talk and I'll ask you questions. And you find out what you can do. Because people are so used to being told what to do instead of, what do you want to do? So that's what a coach does. And we work with them. And it takes a while to build the relationship and the trust that that is what we're here for. We're here to empower people. We're here to find out what they have in the term is recovery capital. So what strengths do you already have? What is it you need to get where you want to go? Not where someone else thinks you want to go. It's what do you want to do with your life? And as Guy said, with a lot of the restrictions and uh, stigma, I was held back for years because of the stigma. I was a carpenter most of my life. And then when I got into this field and people started to find out actually who I was and what I could do, and even myself, it changed. That's a really quick, <laughs> quick analogy of coaching. But again, we've taught all across Canada and it's, a lot is changing. Thank you. I really, help. I really appreciate that perspective. Thanks for speaking. Thank you. You still, uh, you do have more questions, Councillor Fry. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Brian, and thanks for sharing a little bit of your story there as well. And always nice to hear from a blue noser. I'm happily married to one myself. So. <laughs> right on. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I want to ask you a little bit about. Uh, so, uh, you know, outside of the construct that we're talking about here about a, a center, um, you know, I live in the downtown east side, and and I hear a lot of folks who tell me that, that it's difficult to recover in the downtown east side and that there's there's just too many triggers. And 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 so it leaves me thinking, 
is there some kind of opportunity for like a more distributed model, like a, a light recovery kind of approach that maybe say in, in libraries or something kind of co-located where, where, where we could kind of have a lighter footprint uh, but still offer those services outside of, obviously we want to meet people where they're at and that's likely the downtown east side or downtown south. Do you, do you, do you, you follow where I'm going with that? Yes, and, and there's there's so many opportunities that people have, are missing right at the moment, like you're talking about. Actually, we have a community of coaches, and we meet tonight, and there's an organization that is, is showing what they are doing in their community, and they're working with, with different organizations. So even downtown, Mission Possible, I know most of the council members there know Mission Possible. They do great work. I've connected to some people out, outside in, in the outer communities that will supply work for people. And so supplying a place where people can go, like libraries and that, I, I think is a great idea. And to get the education out there of how to do it well, right? And because, again, with this here, there's some misconception that it's either abstinence-based or it's harm reduction, and it's not. It's the people. What, do, what does the person need? Because everybody recovers a different way one of my biggest things for recovering i mean i went to na for a lot of time but one of the biggest parts of my recovery was a running group no one was in in active addiction or recovery i was the only one not too many people knew about me but that was i still run today that's one of my biggest things for my health and my mental health and so getting out connecting is i took guys hiking even with the guys i work with today that I coach. I, I coach through insurance companies. They, they finally started working with recovery coaching. I'm working with a health authority that uh, they gave me some of their staff. And when I coach, we usually hike somewhere or bike somewhere out because that's, there's no walls, it's freedom and it opens everything up. And it's while well, I'm walking beside someone instead of in front of someone, we're looking across the desk. We're shoulder to shoulder. We're not, there's no power dynamic. We come from the same place. So we can get some, I guess the word would be satellite in a way, into other communities. That would be fantastic. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate you joining us. Thanks. I, I have a couple of questions for you, Brian. Um, so I'll just advance myself here. So you talk about empower, uh, around recovery coaching and empowerment choice, you know, uh, not necessarily telling somebody what they need, but helping them sort of discover for themselves what they need. How how important would you say the physical space of somebody who sort of can access a Tuesday morning at 10 or a Thursday night at 7 o'clock, that when they say that it's time that they get to walk through that door and they can receive some support, uh, even if it's guidance, like how important in the process is it to have that uh, place for somebody to go? It's very important because you have a small window to help someone. Say more and about so, can you can you say more about the small window? Why that is? Well, it's the same as here. So the first person you called didn't show up. Maybe they couldn't hang on the phone long enough. They had other things to do. And over, I know I've I was here for almost three days before we got to this here. And you've lost people over time because you have a small window for that person to come into. So it's the same idea as addiction. When someone comes in, it's like, I need help right now. And if someone says, okay, fill out this paperwork and do this and do A, B, C, and D, and we'll let you in, it's like, I'm frustrated. I don't have time to do that. I got to go. So it's the, same, it's the same idea. If we have someone where someone can walk through and say, I need help, it's like, yes, come on in. Let's sit down and let's start talking. Or can you talk with Joe? He can talk to you for a while, and then we can get you in right away. We can get you someone to talk to really quickly because it's such a small opportunity. Right, So okay. people get frustrated, yeah. Yeah, no, that's helpful, it's very clear. Um, so the second part of um, what I'd like you to clarify, and I just have a, just under a minute really, is um, the term recovery capital, I think there's a, generally, this is a new, new-ish term, but there's a lack of understanding, and I think it gets um, sort of funneled into a bit of a negative connotation because of the words themselves. Um, can you just give us a, a sense of what recovery capital actually means? Sure, and recovery capital has been around for years. It's been under a few other terms, but it's it's capital you have. So it's the same idea as going to a bank. You want to buy a house, and they say what you have already and what you need. 
to get that place. And they assess what's going on and maybe you need to get more some, some capital so you can borrow the money. So same idea as recovery. Now people take it big. And I mean, oh, you gotta have a car and you gotta have this. Not true. So working downtown in the east side, recovery capital, literally when I was an outreach worker, could be a pair of shoes so they could walk around downtown and get to the next food line up or get to some services they need. It could be a poncho because it was rain out that day to keep them dry. Recovery capital can be very simple. Two bigger things to, uh, you know, do you need a bus pass? Do you need a car to get to work or get around to the resources? So recovery capital is just something someone needs. Okay, that's really to clear. Continue on. Does that make sense? Absolutely. That was very clearly explained. That is the end of my time, but do appreciate uh, you explaining those extra pieces. Uh, those are the end of your questions, Brian. So thank you for being here. Thank you. So I am getting a note from the clerks here that we need to take a very short recess um, to identify some unidentified callers on the line, and that would be important to make sure they're not with this item. Um, so we're going to take a quick pause, and we will come back in two minutes. I'm just doing a check here. Uh, sorry, clerks. Yes, okay, so just two minutes, and we'll be right back.
Okay, Council, we have, uh, thank you for your patience. We have identified those speakers. They are not to this item. They're um, on the line for another item. So we have a final speaker on the line currently, and that's speaker number six, Dominique Vinchez. Uh, Dominique, we cannot hear you at this moment. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. You have five minutes. Okay. Please go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I am in support of the motion, and I wanted also to speak on recovery coaching and recovery capital because it was mentioned in the motion, and lots has been uh, already spoken about, so it might be a little bit of repetition, but that's not a bad thing. As a person in long-term recovery and a professional coach and recovery coach, I was really encouraged when I read Rebecca Blythe's motion for Recovery Community Center here in Vancouver. I believe it would be a powerful addition to our city's efforts to support the many people in Vancouver who are seeking recovery, but because of their physical, mental, personal, and social challenges are stuck in a prison of addiction. I have personally been in recovery for over 16 years now, and have been working within the field of recovery and mental health for close to 12 years. And my own recovery was a path that I chose and created for myself. But the concept of recovery may in fact and actually will definitely look different for everyone. For some it might include abstinence and for others it might be medically assisted or include harm reduction. And people often ask me, what does a recovery coach do and why is it different to an addictions counselor or even a 12-step sponsor? So firstly, what a recovery coach is not. It's not an outreach worker. It's not a health care provider. It's not an addictions counselor or a therapist. It's not a social worker or a 12-step sponsor. It's sort of a recovery concierge. Recovery coaches don't promote any form of recovery as being the gold standard. And through using the framework of recovery capital, recovery coaches help people seeking recovery to identify firstly, what are their strengths? And yes, everyone has strengths, as well as the areas in their life where they might need more support. So recovery capital is defined as the internal and external resources that may be drawn upon to initiate and sustain recovery from addiction. But what does that mean? Simply put, it means, what does this person need? It, it focuses on four key areas, physical, personal, family and social, and community. And it might be something, as Brian just said, as basic as a pair of shoes. It might be access to trans transportation. It might be, as Guy said before, trauma therapy. It might be an introduction to a peer support group. It might be whatever they need. There's no one-size-fits-all model for recovery as we all enter into recovery with different levels of capital, different amounts of currency, and we need to meet people where they are today. So recovery coaching is not some prescribed methodology. It is instead, it's a deep listening to each individual, a relationship that is there to create a safe place for those seeking recovery and bolster the key components of recovery, which are connectedness, hope, identity, meaningfulness, and empowerment. I personally know that addiction is often a lonely and hopeless place. And I also personally know that so is early recovery. So to have a coach, a partner who can link people to resources, who can listen without judgment, who can ask the right questions to support a sense of hope, identity, and meaningfulness, and the first steps towards taking agency over one's own well-being and health, this is a dignified path to recovery. So I have been fortunate to witness the change in many people over the years, and each has chosen their own path. Recovery coaching is not the magic elixir to prevent the overdose crisis in our city, but it is, in my opinion, a service that is highly complementary to the many other tools and professional help that is essential to saving lives 
and offering so many a way out of the devastation of our addiction crisis. And recovery coaching can help bridge that gap to recovery. That is my statement. Thank you very much. You spoke very well. There are no questions for you at this time, but we really appreciate hearing your perspective today. Thanks, Rebecca. So that does bring us to the end of the speakers list, but as indicated, I'll just go through and uh, check that there aren't any speakers on the line. So speaker one, Grace T. Speaker two, Derek Maldonado. Speaker five, Sarah Blythe. And those are all the speakers that we have. So uh, I see that we are on a main queue. Um, and Councillor Kirby Young, you do have the floor. It's a holdover. So th that brings us to the end of the speakers list. And we can um, move to discussion. And I'll ask at this stage if uh, Councillor Fry, as vice chair of the Finance Committee, could take over the chair. Sure thing. Happy to do so. Thank you very much. So I'm happy to um, provide any closing remarks, not seeing anybody else on the yeah. queue. Councillor Bly, if you wanted to move on to the, yeah. Yeah, okay. So if that would be allowable, Vice Chair Fry, thank you. Uh, so we've heard um, from speakers today that are clearly in support of um, a recovery community center. Um, as, a, as an additional model to what we are currently um, working with in terms of continuum of care to address the poison drug crisis that we are grappling with in our city. Um, of course, the, the, um, the numbers that come out every month around those that have um, sadly lost their lives to the um, drug crisis is escalating. And what is clear is that there is a missing piece in the, in the continuum of care that um, has been worked on for, for more than uh, two years with uh, Vancouver Coastal Health, and that is getting to the point of enabling some type, some type of recovery-centered um, uh, uh, location, a physical space. And so really this motion at the end of the day is asking for council to um, endorse in addition to all of the other ways that we uh, support safe supply and harm reduction um, the need to establish a recovery community center space in the city and to stay within our lane and mandate um, by simply en enabling in every way that we can whether it's um, staff working with um, our, our licensing our permitting real estate services um, our ACCS to continue to um, work with other staff, uh, other health authorities, Vancouver Coastal Health and others, uh, the province, to enable this type of community center. And that uh, as those conversations pers um, persist and, and there's developments that staff come back to council, uh, if any other actions are required as part of um, this process to um, have uh, this type of center um, open and then finally of course uh, any future policy changes that could help um, expedite processes permits applications for any of these life-saving um, critical facilities and this council approved a facility at Clark and first a withdrawal center that uh, is still not opened um, and um, is still sort of navigating that process and so there is a need to make sure that we're ensuring um, any of uh, the ways in which we can manage a process and, and expedite a process within our jurisdiction that we're doing everything we can when it comes to life-saving uh, amenities such as those that address the, um, the poison drug crisis. So uh, I'll leave it there. I see others are on the queue. Uh, Councillor Swanson is next. Tools to advance the queue. So, Watson. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think I'll vote for this, even though I still have a lot of questions about it. The speakers were really eloquent, and I think they described a type of place that's needed for a lot of people. Um, I like the type of facility that they described. I don't know if that's what would actually happen since I don't know what VCH, what VCH's response to this will be. Um, this is a motion. We don't know who would staff it. We don't know who would fund it. Um, here we are, we're trying to move 
permit heaven and earth um, to get a facility like this. And I'm also wishing we would move permit heaven and earth to get facility for more facilities for safe supply. Uh, but it's needed, I, I think, although at this point, um, it, it appears that there's nobody that really wants to fund it or open it or build it. Um, but if we can bring together people like the speakers and our staff and work on getting something like this, um, it'd probably be a good idea. That's it for me. Thanks, Councillor Swanson. Uh, over to you, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Vice Chair Fry. Um, in the interest of time, because I'm knowing we're cl closer to 12, I'll, I'll keep my comments brief, but simply to say um, uh, thank you to Councillor Bly for bringing forward this motion. I think it's a really important conversation that we have in the city. I think we're all cognizant, uh, as Councillor Bly noted, about uh, the tainted drug supply and the impact it's having on our community and communities, uh, not just in Vancouver, but around the province. Uh, and... Um, also, that um, pervasive in our society uh, is not unique to Vancouver, but is the issue of addictions. And having um, options for people uh, and different pathways, I think, is incredibly important. And so it does speak to um, that spectrum or um, and, and having uh, a range of options for people. Um, and... Um, we do have a number of them. We have harm reduction. We have other options, but we do need to have uh, meet people where they're at. Uh, I think that's critical. And uh, you know, the when I was still serving on the Kettle Society, we were starting to look at um, the recovery cafe uh, that was a partnership with Street to Home. But what I appreciated about uh, the conversation today and some of the callers and speakers who talked about the recovery coaching, was a, which was the new model for me to learn about through the process of, of this motion. And, and I think, again, um, to Councillor Bly's point, is it, it addresses a gap. Uh, we really do need that continuum of care. And uh, this is not about us delivering the service, but it's about being the enabler as a city regulator in terms of land use and other options. So, um, but I think at the end of the day, the core of this is that we have a really complex um, health crisis on our hands and we need to collectively work together at the local level, at the civic government level, at the provincial level, at the federal level. And I see this as being one piece of that. So I, I thank Councillor Bly for bringing it forward. And I will pause there because I did say I would be brief. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dominetto. And before we go to Councillor Carr, just noting the time, we may need a motion to extend to complete this item of business. Uh, but over to you, Carr. Motion to extend to complete this item. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. OK. Uh, that carries. Thank you, Councilor Carr. Please. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, also very grateful um, to Councilor Bly for bringing this motion forward. Uh, I think that, uh, and I'm incredibly impressed by the speakers who came. It was um, very uh, heartening and um, illuminating, and uh, I think um, points to the need, well, their comments seem to point to the need for this kind of an uh, option. Um, we have, the, I mean, we have a public health emergency and it's not going away, it's increasing. We have more deaths from the poison drug supply uh, than ever before. Um, so we need some new approaches and I think this one, ha I have hope around this one. So uh, thanks again for bringing this forward. Councillor Carr, Councillor Kirby Young. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I also want to thank Councillor Bly for bringing it forward. I think that we need to broaden the dialogue um, because when dealing with the, I think it's 7,000 now British Columbians um, that have um, died since the then PHO declared the health, other provincial health emergency in 2016, which is staggering. And I think a couple, I think the majority of those have actually been in the last two years, right? If you look at the numbers, it, it, it's not only is it, um, not abating, it's actually getting progressively worse. Um, and I think that we spent a great deal of time um, on focusing on harm reduction, but not enough on recovery, right? And I think that we need to give people paths to better um, 
in whatever form that looks like. And so for that reason, I'd really like to see us spending more time and attention on recovery to get people to a better place because we're failing um, them, I think, at this point. And so for that reason, I'm happy to support it. Thank you. Councillor Kirby Young, Councillor Bly. Thanks very much, Chair, uh, Vice Chair Fry. I just wanted to close on the motion just to say thank you uh, to um, my colleagues for, for their words of, of support and um, particularly um, their attention to speakers and acknowledging um, that those with lived experience are our greatest uh, advisors when it comes to how we in this particular role as, as council in the city of Vancouver can do what we can appropriately um, to help enable uh, it, some sort of improvement in, in what feels like, as uh, has been pointed out, an extremely complex issue. So I, I think it's worth stating that we know that these are quite heavily bureaucratic uh, solutions. And so I take the point um, Councillor Swanson made around funding and who's going to, but what I can say is that it's very much uh, in, uh, in motion and the momentum is there and allocated funding and, and things have not um, perhaps maybe been fully uh, disclosed and announced. Um, however, a, uh, a vote of support from this council for this type of facility in our city will go a long way uh, to realizing uh, this community center, hopefully in, in as short order as possible for those that absolutely need it. So thank you so much to the speakers who took the time and waited um, and, and share their stories, um, and that is all for me. Thank you, Mr. Bly. And just uh, uh, just adding that um, uh, the Recovery Cafe in Seattle is now uh, celebrating its 13th year, and and uh, it's been quite a success. They just got half a million dollars in funding for their two locations from King County, and uh, they have expanded their services uh, or the, the model has been replicated throughout the Pacific Northwest, in fact, throughout the United States. So clearly there is a success there that uh, we would do well to consider and hopefully replicate and uh, really uh, hopeful about this and happy to support it. And I hope this does send a signal that this is something that, uh, that could be more robustly pursued from the various partners that have been mentioned. Uh, Councillor Bly, or Councillor Weeb, sorry. Council table, and I appreciate Councilor Bly for bringing it forward. Um, finding a space for people to find recovery is so important in this city. Um, as someone, obviously, we, uh, my family struggled to find a space for my stepbrother, and it's really difficult to find spaces when people are in need. Um, I've been working with a group to create a space here in Vancouver, recognizing the gap of finding safe spaces where people feel comfortable in making this journey. Um, that meets them where they're at. And so I really appreciate this work coming forward because I think there's so much demand right now um, and so much support needed and so many people willing to put their um, work into this, mostly people with lived experiences that want to give back because they got helped out and they want to help others out. So really appreciate this idea. I'd love to see it grow and love to support it throughout its process. So thank you very much. Chair, are we voting? Vice Chair? Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure your mic is on. Vice Chair, I think I can take the chair back if that's okay with you at this I moment. I think we have to. And Council, have to Council DiGenova, you we're just waiting on your vote. Oh, okay, because I, I had voted and I just hadn't heard the results. Okay, that's great. We've registered your vote now. Thank you. So that motion does uh, pass with unanimous, unanimous support. Okay. Um, so that actually brings us right up to the noon hour. So I think we can recess for lunch now. Um, and uh, we will be back at 1 p.m. to uh, continue on with the agenda. We'll be looking at item three next. Thanks, Council.
Hi, Kirsty, can you hear us on Talus? Hi, David, I can hear you. Thanks. Council. We are continuing on with our agenda today. Um, our third item is the 2021 Housing Progress Report, Housing Needs Report, and Update on Housing Targets Refresh. We have uh, Dan Garrison, Assistant Director of Housing Policy and Regulation in the Chamber, uh, and I see also Edna Cho. Um, so there is a presentation and, uh, of course, to answer questions. So over to you, Edna Cho. Thank you. Can you see the screen? Great. Can looks good. Awesome. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Let me I'm, just check. We'll just, yep, there we go. Okay, thank you. I'm Edna Cho, Senior Planner in Housing Policy in Planning, Urban Design, and Sustainability. <clears throat> 2022 marks the halfway point of the Housing Vancouver strategy. So today's presentation will start with an overview of some broad trends impacting the housing affordability crisis in Vancouver and the region with that context in mind. Overall, you can see that the Metro Vancouver region is growing, with some municipalities in the region showing significant increases in population between 2016 to 2021. Vancouver is the center city of this dynamic region, and you can see that our population is also growing, 5% increase over the last census period. This growth is largely fueled by job growth and a strong economy, as well as increasing migration to BC, both from other parts of the country or outside Canada, of which upwards of 90% make their way to the Metro Vancouver area. Another important driver of growth in housing demand in our region and across Canada is the large generation of millennials forming their own households and looking for housing. This graph shows the Metro Vancouver population over time from the 1970s through today and projected out to 2051 with major age groupings in shades of green. We've tagged the millennial generation in orange and if you track the orange bars over time, you can see the demographic bulge of millennial households hitting their 30s and 40s in the coming decades. And this bulge will be a significant driver of housing demand over the coming years. Oh, often on the screen. Okay. Okay, I'll, thank you for bringing that to our attention. We'll keep an eye on it and make sure that um, if it continues, we'll have to address it. Thank you. So all this has resulted in greater demand for housing, which has exacerbated Vancouver's affordability crisis. This chart shows housing costs over the past 10 years in Vancouver, shown in the solid line, and the region, shown in the dotted line. You can see the housing crisis is not unique to Vancouver. It just hit us sooner. Housing prices for all ownership housing types, apartments and detached houses, as well as rental, have soared over the last 10 years. Let's look more closely at rents. This chart shows the percentage change in rents in the region. You can see that in the past five years, the entire region has experienced significant increases in rents, with some of the largest increases in further out suburbs, including Langley and the Tri-Cities. Low rental vacancy rates are another sign of housing pressure across the region. In 2021, Metro Vancouver had a 1.2% rental vacancy rate, far off what's considered a healthy rate of between 3 to 5%. And, and in response to this crisis, the region overall has been creating new housing. This chart shows the number of units under construction as of February 2022 by a municipality by the different types of housing shown in the different colors. The red line shows each municipality's share of the regional population. Vancouver is a leader in the region in total units under construction. We can also see other municipalities pulling their weight relative to their share of the population, especially Burnaby and Surrey. In terms of the type of housing, Vancouver is definitely leading the way in new rental and social housing. But despite this, we know prices continue to rise. 
That's why governments have stepped up in recent years. Vancouver adopted the Housing Vancouver strategy in 2017 at the height of the housing crisis to shift new housing to rental and social, protect the existing affordable stock, and to support marginalized residents. Other municipalities in the region have also been increasing their supply of housing and are participating in the Metro 2050 growth strategy. The province has introduced the Homes for BC plan, as well as put in place new housing need report requirements that all BC municipalities must meet. And at the federal level, the national housing strategy was adopted. It's clear that, all, that no level of government can solve the housing crisis alone. And over the last five years, all levels of governments have been more collectively aligned to address the housing affordability issues here and across the country. So within this context, today's presentation will provide Council a summary of the 2021 Housing Annual Progress Report of new housing approvals and completions. You'll see through the presentation that we're enabling a significant amount of new housing, but more needs to be done through partnerships to achieve deeper levels of affordability. Next, my colleague Sarah Ellis will present a summary of our housing needs report, which identifies significant and diverse housing needs in Vancouver among future and existing residents. The province has put in place a requirement that BC municipalities must submit a housing needs report by April 2022 and update it every five years afterwards. And the housing needs report that is attached to Appendix B in the Council report will satisfy this requirement. And finally, the presentation will end with an update on the housing targets refresh. Let's start with how we did in 2021. Just a reminder that Housing Vancouver set a housing target of 72,000 new units over 10 years with a goal of 65% of that housing to be for rental and social housing and 10,000 units of ground-oriented housing for families and downsizing seniors. This is a chart showing overall approvals by housing type over the last decade and as you can see, 2021 was a record year of approvals with almost 9,000 units. This is the highest in recent decades. So let's break this down further in the types of housing. Let's look at social and supportive housing. We supported our target, we exceeded our targets and had strong approvals in 2021 with almost 1,350 units approved. We had a record year for purpose-built market rental approvals, almost 3,000 units approved. That's higher than any year we have data for going back to the 1970s. In terms of condos, we've seen a rebound in condo approval since 2019, with almost 4,000 units approved this year. Turning to ground-oriented and coach houses, we've approved about 450 units, just shy of our 500-unit target. And finally, laneways. Approvals were down in 2021, with about 300 units approved. The pandemic had impacted the timing of laneway housing permits, but staff in DBL have addressed and cleared this backlog through the creation of a standalone laneway housing approval stream. Overall, in 2021, we approved a variety of projects that meet the housing needs of, a di of diverse communities with differing incomes. These are just some examples of the projects that were approved, including social housing for seniors, women, and Indigenous populations, market rental targeted to artists through live-work units, as well as ground-oriented ownership townhouses for families and downsizing seniors. Again, 2021 is the halfway mark of the Housing Vancouver strategy. So let's see how we're doing cumulatively towards our goal over the last five years. One of the biggest goals in the strategy was to shift approvals to rental, and you can see this is the second straight year where purpose-built rental approvals have surpassed ownership, 52% rental versus 48% ownership. And this is important because, as you know, over 50% of households in Vancouver rent, and over three-quarters of net new households are renters. In terms of family units, Housing Vancouver set a target of 42% of units to be two or three bedrooms. And you can see in the pie chart on the left that we are exceeding that target at 49% family units. And most of that is being approved in the ownership housing types. However, where we are falling short is in creating units with deeper affordability for households under 80K. 
This has been a consistent issue since we approved Housing Vancouver in 2017. And our conclusion is that while municipalities are able to, are able to enable the supply of social housing, meeting deeper levels of affordability requires significant additional funding and partnerships with senior governments. Let's look at completions now. 2021 saw about 700 units of purpose-built rental completed and is leading the region in rental completions over the last five years. And finally, we had a record year of social and supportive housing completions and acquisitions, almost 1,700 units. About 1,200 of those are completions and about 450 are acquisitions, thanks in large part to the CMHC's Rapid Housing Initiative and through funding from the province. This is the highest year of social and supportive housing project openings that we know of, and you can see some examples of these diverse projects targeting Indigenous artists, families, and SRO replacement, such as the Rodden Lodge, Luma in the downtown east side, and the Catalyst Project at 221 Main Street. In summary, we've had a record year of approvals with lots of social and rental housing, as well as a record year for completions for social housing. What we need to rethink and re-strategize is around how we create units with deeper affordability for households under 80K. The last five years has demonstrated that with the tools we have available as a municipal government, we can create supply, but we're not able to achieve units geared to lower incomes without significant additional investment and partnerships. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah Ellis, who will talk about housing needs and provide an update on the housing targets refresh. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm Sarah Ellis, Planner and Housing Policy in PDS, and I'll be walking you through highlights and key findings from Vancouver's first housing needs report. As Edna mentioned, even with the significant effort put in by Council and the City toward enabling needed new housing, we continue to experience serious housing pressures in Vancouver, the region, and across the province. In response to growing housing pressures across the province, the BC government in 2019 passed legislation requiring municipalities to create housing needs reports with the goal of helping cities connect their policies to housing need. Housing needs reports have to be received by Council every five years, with the first report due in April 2022, and must highlight specific content on current and future housing needs, as well as needs among specific communities. To comply with the new provincial requirement, Vancouver has developed a housing needs report for Council to receive today. The full report includes in-depth data and analysis to comply with the provincial requirements and is included in Appendix B of our Council report. But overall, the report identifies four key findings. First, that there is significant unmet need for housing among existing Vancouver residents, as well as substantial future demand for housing from a growing and changing population. Second, that these needs are incredibly diverse across the spectrum of incomes and households. Third, that housing pressures fall disproportionately on equity denied groups and lower incomes. And then finally, that we've learned that housing needs are not the same thing as housing targets. While needs play an important role in shaping targets, many other factors must be considered as well, as I'll discuss later in the presentation. Looking at our process to date towards this housing needs report, the first phase of work focused on engagement with local stakeholders and experts to learn best practices for understanding housing needs. We kicked things off with a series of workshops last summer, followed by small group discussions in December and January. We plan to engage with the public in the fall with a specific focus on First Nations and equity seeking groups, and then bring an updated needs report to council in 2023. One note on data and timing, due to the timing of the first provincial deadline, this report relies on older data from the 2016 census, so data that's almost six years old, while 2021 census data is released progressively over the course of this year. Our plan and the reason for delivering an updated report next year is to include new data to council in our update. Now an overview on Vancouver's approach to housing need. The provincial requirements specifically ask cities to define and consider two distinct categories of need. The first category is current housing need. We know many Vancouver households are currently in need of housing, including households in Vancouver struggling with affordability or living in a home with not, without enough bedrooms for their family. 
also people experiencing homelessness or housing insecurity, and other people in need, like young people living with their parents for longer because of affordability, or families leaving Vancouver. The second category is future demand. We know that newcomers to Vancouver will be looking for housing in the near future, coming for jobs, school, and lifestyle. We also know that many other demographic changes in our population are driving housing demand, like a wave of millennials starting families and downsizing seniors, as well as a Canada-wide trend towards smaller households. But how do we break down and estimate these needs? We've spent the last year in dialogue with experts and stakeholders about these questions and more. In our conversations with housing experts, we heard many different ideas and opinions about housing needs in Vancouver, as well as a few key areas of agreement. For one, we heard from some experts that our report should focus just on core housing need data from the census, which is the most commonly cited data on housing needs. But other experts told us that core needs don't capture the needs of many other types of households, and we should take a broader view. Second, we heard from some experts that housing market indicators like prices, rents, and vacancy rates are the clearest signs of need in our housing market. But at the same time, these experts were honest that it's almost impossible to determine a specific number of homes required to moderate rents or achieve a healthy vacancy rate. Third, we heard from some people who believe that future housing need can be predicted based on past growth trends. However, expert demographers and economists urged us to consider that the high demand for housing from new migration and demographic changes in our current population mean that we could grow more if we built more. And that if we fail to accommodate this future demand for housing, we risk, we risk worsening pressures on existing residents. Even with these areas of debate and different opinions, we heard agreement on two basic and important points. One, that there is significant housing need in Vancouver, and also that because of all the moving parts and data limitations, arriving at a specific number of households should be approached with caution. So keeping in mind what we heard from experts, we created a framework to help us define and estimate current housing need and future housing demand so that we could meet the province's requirements. In our current need estimate, we include 86,000 households who are living in Vancouver in unaffordable, unsuitable, or inadequate housing as defined by the census, as well as residents who are homeless and people living in SROs. In our future demand estimate, we include a projection of 50,000 new households over 10 years, based on the city's current 10-year development forecast. You can see a dashed line around the future demand bubble, meant to symbolize the feedback from experts that actual growth could change based on future trends and policy choices. We also show current need intersecting with future demand to reflect what we learned about the connection between need today and future demand. With this in mind, we have a range of potential total needs in 10 years at the top right. We also include a box at the bottom indicating 20,000 households experiencing other unmet needs not included in census or city data. You can read more about these in the report but they include things like low vacancy rates, social housing wait lists, family-aged households living van leaving Vancouver, and job vacancies. We don't factor these into our estimated range of needs due to the potential risk of double counting with other categories. A few important caveats here. One is that our need and demand estimates all involve assumptions at our, and are impacted by data availability. And they're all based on 2016 census data, which is quite old at this point, and need to be updated with 2021 data when updates are released. And as mentioned before, these numbers are about households in need and are not targets for a number or specific type of homes needed. So up until now, we've talked a lot about numbers, but behind the numbers on housing need are real people. And one critical thing we've learned is that just as Vancouver is home to tremendous diversity, housing need in Vancouver is also diverse, ranging across incomes and jobs, families, age, migration status, and more. But we do know that some communities face disproportionate impacts of housing pressures, and we want to profile some of these communities in the next few slides. Our first profile focuses on the needs of people experiencing homelessness and SRO residents. As of the last homeless count, over 2,000 residents were experiencing homelessness, and upwards of 7,000 people were living in aging SRO hotels that continue to serve as housing of last resort for many residents in the city. One key finding in our report is that people facing housing insecurity and homelessness often deal with intersecting challenges. One example is the incidence of homelessness among youth, with almost half of people in the city's homeless count saying that they experienced homelessness for the first time before the age of 25. Other intersecting identities are overly represented in our homeless count. 
for instance, people who are indigenous, black, seniors, and LGBTQ. These groups are also disproportionately impacted by the major drivers of homelessness, shown in the graphic on the right. Our next profile looks at families and seniors. The chart on the right shows the share of families and seniors overpaying on housing, broken down into renters and owners. You can see that single parent families and seniors who rent are particularly vulnerable to rising housing costs. We also know that many dual parent families with children are also facing affordability challenges, with roughly a quarter of families with children spending 30% or more of their income on housing among renters and owners. One way that we see families dealing with a lack of affordable and suitable housing is by leaving Vancouver. Vancouver lost 14,000 couple and family households to the rest of the region between 2011 and 2016. These are on average families with higher incomes over 100K looking to own. Our final profile looks at indigenous residents and other equity seeking groups. Vancouver is home to diverse communities experiencing diverse housing needs. The chart on the top right shows how the prevalence of low incomes varies among people of different backgrounds, with Arab, West Asian, Black and Latin American households more, more likely to be low income, and Chinese and South Asian people less so. Chinese and South Asian households also have higher rates of home ownership, while other communities are disproportionately renters, like Black and Arab communities. Looking at the housing situation of Indigenous people, we see the impacts of colonialism and systemic barriers. For instance, Indigenous households are much more likely to be renters compared to the population as a whole, and almost half of Indigenous households in Vancouver spend 30% or more of their income on housing. These needs are reflected by work of local First Nations and groups like AMA to advocate for, par for partnerships to deliver secure, affordable housing for Indigenous people in Vancouver and across BC. There's much more detail on all of this in our housing needs report, but to wrap up this section, I return quickly to our key findings, that there is significant unmet need in our housing system, that needs are diverse, and that certain communities face disproportionate impacts. But there are also some things that our needs assessment does not tell us. For one, data limitations mean we don't know the exact affordability requirements of all of our households in need, though we can generally assume that they're diverse and include lower and higher incomes and many different types of households. And as we mentioned before, our numbers look at households experiencing a diversity of needs, but don't tell us how much or what type of housing to target to meet these needs. And lastly, our assessment does not speak to the capacity of the city, government partners, and development sectors to address these needs in the immediate term. These are all topics critical to supply targets, which I'll cover in the next section. So the last part of this presentation looks at ways we can connect housing needs to housing targets. As a reminder, Council has directed staff to look at options for refreshing the current Housing Vancouver 10-year targets. First, what are housing targets? Housing supply targets are an implementation tool for measuring progress toward a city's housing goals. For this reason, how a Council sets targets depends first and foremost on its vision for housing and the city it wants to be. Targets can take a variety of approaches. They can be aspirational reach goals, or they can be more realistic looking at past performance or the performance of peer cities. Best practices are for targets to be clear, measurable, and set over a defined and realistic time horizon. Targets should also take into account housing that's already underway, which in the case of Vancouver is our pipeline of almost 50,000 homes set to complete in the next 10 years. Many different factors play into housing targets. Housing needs are, are of course a critical component of targets, but targets need to be informed by other things too including city and partner capacity, senior government funding, and trade-offs with other city priorities. The most recent example of housing targets in Vancouver are the Housing Vancouver targets. Adopted in 2017, the Housing Vancouver targets cover 10 years and are reach targets based on the goal of diversifying the type of new housing created by shifting our development pipeline towards a greater share of rental and non-market housing. Housing Vancouver also featured our first ever attempt to set targets based on affordability to local incomes, looking at the number of new homes affordable to incomes below 80K. So why are we revising our targets? Two council motions direct staff to explore different approaches to targets. The first motion from 2019 directed staff to explore setting targets based on the incomes of existing renter, household income, renter households in need. The second motion from 2020 directed staff to recalibrate targets and policies, looking at data on past development and demographic trends. 
We've also heard a range of different opinions about our targets from experts, stakeholders, and the public, summarized on this slide and detailed further in the council report. So based on council direction and stakeholder feedback, we've created three initial targets concepts to test through additional consultation in the upcoming year. The first two respond to the two council motions I mentioned before. The first is a concept based on past development trends, and the second is a concept for housing geared towards existing housing need based on incomes. We've also introduced a third concept that also prioritizes rental, non-market, and missing middle housing based on needs, also taking into account feasibility and other constraints. This slide shows a high-level summary of these initial concepts and how they compare to each other, the range of housing needs from our housing needs report in the teal bar on the left, and what's currently in our 10-year development pipeline shown by the blue dotted line. The first scenario involves recalibrating our targets to match past 10-year completion trends, looking at 2006 to 2016 based on available data. These targets result in a total of 35,000 units of mostly condo housing over the next 10 years, which is lower than the current development pipeline. The second scenario, the needs-based approach, involves approving 56,000 units over 10 years for existing households in need identified by our needs assessment. Over 80% of these households earn below 80K, and new housing for them is targeted at 30% of incomes by income band. In order to deliver a portion of these units, we've estimated an additional 74,000 units of condos and market rental are needed, plus an additional 12 plus billion in low cost financing, non-repayable loans and government grants through senior government partnerships. And finally, the last scenario involves continuing to shift the current development pipeline towards priority housing types, adding rental, non-market, and ground-oriented missing middle housing to the existing pipeline to accommodate diverse housing needs. This scenario is higher than the current pipeline, but also considers city and partner constraints. Comparing the three scenarios, we've identified some initial opportunities and trade-offs that will be further explored in consultation. The first concept based on past trends sees a reduction in housing targets compared to the current targets and pipeline. However, we heard from stakeholders that the scenario risks repeating past affordability trends associated with a constrained supply and limited secured or affordable options in new housing. The needs-based concept scales up non-market and below market delivery to meet housing needs, but the concept requires significant senior government funding and partner capacity to deliver very high targets which likely also exceed industry, devel industry development and federal government funding capacity in 10 years. The last concept, the constrained needs-based approach, is more in line with the current pipeline and city capacity and provides more opportunities for families. But this approach still relies on significant partner contributions to deliver non-market social and supportive housing at affordability to the lowest incomes. We're going to be doing further testing and refining of these concepts over upcoming months and supplementing the analysis with new Census 2021 data as it's available. So in conclusion, this presentation brought us three major highlights. First, we made significant progress in 2021 towards approving and completing priority rental and non-market housing. Our first housing needs report identified significant and diverse housing needs following provincial requirements and three targets concepts illustrated considerations and trade-offs involved in creating housing targets. Staff will come back next year following engagement on needs and targets and release of 2021 census data with an updated needs report and finalized targets. This concludes the presentation. Staff from PDS and ACCS, as well as Andrew Remlow from Rennie Intelligence are available to answer questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, you do have um, a number, we do have a number of councillors on the queue and we're going to kick it off with Councillor Hardwick. Before I start, Chair, um, I would like to request that we have a second round of questions. That is well within your right to do so. So we have a motion on the floor for a second round of questions. All those in favor say yay. Yay. Any opposed? Okay, so we will have two rounds. Uh, go ahead, Councillor okay. Hardwick. So that's eating, eating into my time, but um, my first question is, um, we we're saying we aren't meeting the targets for uh, housing unit growth. Is it we or is it not the industry? Are we conflating government and the industry in our approach here? Thank you, Councillor uh, Dan Garrison for Housing Policy and Regulation. Um, I, th I think when we say uh, we aren't meet meeting targets, we would we would say it's the entire uh, industry together, right? It, it, meeting the targets will require action by multiple parties, local governments, 
uh, the in development industry, both private and nonprofit, uh, other levels of government in terms of financing, financial institutions that do private lending. So meeting the uh, housing targets that are set out in Housing Vancouver or any new targets that uh, council may adopt uh, will require concerted effort from numerous parties. Uh, if the targets aren't met, then whose fault would it be? Well, I, you know, that's, that's a good question. I mean, it's... Um, Again, I think if we need uh, concerted effort from a number of parties, then it's it's going to there's going to be collective and shared responsibility for achieving it. Do you not see a conflict in uh, asking industry to uh, drive this process in large part, since they are the ones? I mean, you're not going to ask anybody that's in the business of producing pro housing product if they want to build more housing product. How do you reconcile that? Um, well. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that right now we have, a, in the city of Vancouver, we have approximately 9% of our housing stock is non-market, non-profit housing. Across Canada, that number is closer to 4 or 5%. Um, so the, the role of the private sector in the delivery of affordable housing, the delivery of all kinds of housing, um, is is a, a necessity in, in our system. So that that's really how I reconcile, is, is that that's, uh, that's going to be part of the system of housing delivery. Um. In terms of numbers, you, I've had uh, talked about this before. You set a, a targets of 72,000 units over the decade from 2017 to 2027, um, and that was broken down by the pipeline, um, ex, ex, doubling the pipeline bas basically and adding 12,000 as you deemed necessary for affordable housing. What is the average household size according to the census in uh, Vancouver proper? Give me a second to take a look at my notes here. Um, so the average household size in Vancouver in 2016, which is a data that we have, we'll be able to update it shortly, was just under 2.2 people per household. Of course, that's an average. So the actual household size depends on dwelling type. I understand what tenure. average means. Yeah. So if, if you were looking at 2.2 individuals, let's just call it two individuals, as an average per dwelling unit, and you were setting targets of 72,000 units, would that not suggest that we were looking for something in the order of 150, expecting 150,000 new residents to the city over that period? Thanks for the uh, question, Councillor Hardwick. Um, it, yes, in some senses, the way we, uh, oh, thanks for putting that down, short people. Uh, the way we actually looked at this was in a little bit more detail rather than the 2.2, which is the overall average from the census for the existing stock in the existing population. Uh, we looked at it in a little bit more detail and looked at it how those persons per units were shaped up for those people who actually moved to the city, uh, also on a structure type basis. So while the roll up is 2.2, depending on what types of units we're adding, uh, apartments versus ground oriented, the numbers will certainly come down for smaller household sizes. But then also when we look at recent movers, those, num those numbers aren't biased by the existing stock of people who are already in the city, uh, which are predominantly older and predominantly in a detached. Uh, we're a talking about stock. orders of magnitude here. So um, do you know what the population growth was, even though we've not looked at the numbers between 2016 and 2021? Uh, in, in terms of absolute population growth, it was... Ask, yes. I believe it was in the range of 4% without the number right in front of me. Right, and and between 2011 and 2016, do you know what the growth was at that time? I do not. 4.6%. So um, what I'm getting at here is that over the period for, that's covered under this, we'd this be looking at something like 65,000. That is your time, Councillor Hardwick. I'm sorry, it's your time, and because okay. it's not debate, I'll, it's I'll not come time back to, to answer. And I just want, just so that everybody is clear on procedure, if you're going to move a motion, even if it is to ask for a second round of questions, that does take up your time as the mover of the motion. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we're moving on to Council Boyle. Thanks so much uh, for all of this information, staff. Um, my first question is about um, more uh, non-market and below market housing. I'm interested to hear what we've been hearing from non-market and co-op housing leaders and providers about how uh, we as a city can support and accelerate that type of housing that's clearly identified as a need in the report. Thank you. 
So um, some of the th questions that some of the um, uh, feedback we've gotten from nonprofit uh, partners is that um, putting the zoning in place is um, is something that municipalities can do that really helps. So that's kind of like what we did with the RM4, putting that into pre-zoning really helps um, nonprofits be able to uh, get their get their funding. Um, because a lot of um, federal funding is dependent on actually um, having the zoning in place already. So that's one thing that, um, that governments can do. And of course, you know, additional investment um, and, and funding from all levels of government is, is helpful as well. Okay, appreciate that. And um, is there anything that we are learning or looking at based on Victoria's uh, leadership in their recent decision on that front? Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor. Yeah, um, we're, we are looking at, and in fact, are meeting next week, I think, with the staff from the City of Victoria to look at their approach. Um, in Vancouver, uh, one, of, one of the things to note is Victoria is um, putting in place the changes that would allow them to go without a, a public hearing to approve projects that are compliant with an official community plan. Of course, in the City of Vancouver, currently, we don't have an official community plan, so that specific um, ap approach that they're using um, yeah, is not is not possible uh, under our current construct, but that is one of the things that we're looking at as we move forward with the Vancouver plan. So we are very interested in understanding uh, what the approach they're taking is. Okay, I really appreciate that, and look forward to hearing how that meeting goes. Um, what uh, can staff speak a bit to accessible housing um, for people with disabilities, but also in recognition of uh, the aging population that we have, are we meeting, I assume we're not meeting the need for uh, accessible housing units across the income spectrum, um, but would be interested to hear um, if we have numbers on that and what more we are looking at on that front. Thanks, Councillor Boyle. Sarah Ellis, uh, Planner and Housing Policy. So the housing needs report does include analysis of the affordability needs of people with accessibility requirements as identified in the census. And we do find that people experiencing limited accessibility are also disproportionately represented among people with low incomes, people living in rental housing, and people overpaying on rent. Um, in terms of actions from the city, um, in uh, city-owned turnkey housing as well as in BC housing projects, we do see a requirement of 5% accessible units. Um, this is something that we're working toward. Um, in addition, staff are working toward a seniors housing strategy that will be looking at additional ways that we can be improving accessibility in housing for seniors and people with uh, disabilities. Okay, appreciate that. Um, I have one more specific question, which is on the um, outline of three target scenarios um, in uh, on page 10 of the staff report in the middle option it uh, I'm just confused about the numbers it says 130,000 homes over 10 years including 56,000 homes affordable to existing needs and 75 additional market homes required to deliver the non-market so can I just get a clarification is it that those 74 market homes would fund 56,000 non-market affordable homes? Yes, that's a good question. So the 74,000 units um, are to uh, fund the um, below market rental units. So of the 56,000, 8,000 are below market rental. So um, some of that will fund the below market rental as well as a third of the social housing units that would be required under the 56,000. Um, will we... Um, are projecting to be delivered through inclusionary housing. Yep. Okay, um, maybe we could get a, in a follow-up a bit more of a breakdown of those numbers. I understand their estimates and we'll get more information back. Um, I had a couple questions from the public about those numbers that I uh, couldn't answer. So what, just to get a sense of what we anticipate would fund what else and um, how that all uh, falls out. But I will leave it there for now. I see I'm out of time. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Councillor Royal. Councillor Fry. Thanks, Chair. Um, so, yeah, I'm curious about the delivery of non market housing and, and how we can speed that up. But I appreciate on one of the slides, I forget what page it was, um, but it showed the four non market, including Rodden Lounge and and looking at, at 950, and, and I appreciate, Edna, you mentioned that getting rezonings out of the way 
uh, was 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 going to expedite these. But my understanding, 950 was not a rezoning. We approved the DP. Well, not we, but the DP was approved in 2017. So what what's taken it so long, and where else are these gaps? How do we speed this process up? Is it a matter of construct? Like, do we have a labor force to build the housing we need more rapidly? Is it permits and and red tape that's tying these things up? Yeah, thank you for the question, Councillor Fry. So yeah, yeah um, 950 Main Street is a project with Luma Native Housing Society on city-owned land. I think I I think your timeline is is correct. So. Um, Certainly, we are looking at development process and development processes review and trying to uh, accelerate those as much as we can. Um, the city has a, t a task force um, that is looking at that, so that's part of the element. Oftentimes in these projects, um, there are also challenges related to funding and financing. So it's to some extent, it's often about aligning uh, the city's approval processes with the funding and financing approval processes of other government programs. So that's something we regularly meet and talk with BC Housing and, and CMHC about. Uh, so it's it's trying to align those programs and, and line them up. I am hopeful we'll be able to, as we've created this sort of pipeline of non-market projects with our community partners coming through the, the city system, that we'll be able to accelerate not only our uh, part of the approval process, but also um, with both the uh, CMHC and BC Housing sort of all rowing in the same direction at the moment, uh, we'll be able to also accelerate um, how we can put those pieces together to get the projects in the ground more quickly. In a perfect world, is there anything else we could do to sort of leapfrog that process? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a good question. I think, uh, as Sarah Ellis talked about, the the process of going from rezoning to development permits, but you're right. Even even in the development permit process, on that on that process, uh, the, we should be able to look at ways to accelerate it. As you get down the road into some of the some of the permitting processes that you get to, there are um, important factors related to building code and life safety that have to be taken into account. So we have to consider that. Um, but certainly, we're always looking at ways that we can try to try to speed up getting um, both the the projects in the ground, but then also people actually obviously into homes. We have a larger sort of metric or some kind of formula that that can determine what delays actually cost in the, not just non-market, but market mm -hmm. housing. Like, so every year, you know, and, and I know labor shortages do play a factor. And, and <clears throat> what, what, is, what is the opportunity cost on some of these? As yeah, it's, it's significant. I don't have it off the in, in front of me. It's something that I know we often hear Jill Atkey from BC Nonprofit Housing Association speak to that every month there are actually significant cost increases related to uh, delays. So we are aware of the importance of, of moving the projects forward quickly, absolutely. Okay, um, I appreciate that. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Councillor Fry. Uh, Councillor Swanson. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, so there's a Steve Pomeroy study that the nonprofits are quoting all the time that says for every affordable uh, unit that we get, we lose 15 existing, we lose affordability in 15 units. Um, that was between 2011 and 2016, might be the same now. So I'm wondering, do we have any information on the number of affordable units that we're losing either to demolitions and to rent increases, particularly rent increases um, when the tenant leaves? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Yes, we're we're definitely um, uh, keyed into that, and we agree with the nonprofit sector and and with the the Pomeroy reports showing uh, the concerns about the loss uh, of existing affordable housing, both both in the case of redevelopment, but even uh, without that, just through rent increases in the in the market. Uh, we don't have the exact numbers on that, and that is one of the one of the challenges. The data is is uh, is difficult. We did talk to our the stakeholders and experts about. Uh, understanding that. Um, regardless of the fact that I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, I think we acknowledge that it's an issue, and this is why we have joined with the uh, nonprofit housing sector, the community housing sector, uh, to ask both the federal and provincial governments to look at the potential of acquisition funds, uh, to, to look at the possibility of transferring some of that privately owned stock uh, where we may be seeing erosion of affordability into public and nonprofit ownership. So that that is something that we are um, we are looking at. 
uh, we would obviously need the federal and provincial governments to come along with us because the cost uh, the cost of doing that sort of thing would would exceed the municipality's capacity but it is something that we're interested in so one thing that the nonprofits are looking at now um, because this loss of affordability is so great as vacancy control or even targeted vacancy control has the city staff looked at that for beyond um, SROs? Well, where we've looked at vacancy control, where we've tried to secure it in the in the stock is in new uh, rental buildings that we're building through things like the moderate income rental housing pilot program and our below market rental uh, programs where we are securing um, vacancy control in the units uh, that we're securing at the below market rates. That, of course, is being enabled because uh, council is approving significant increases in, in market density but on those sites. for existing housing. But for, exi for existing housing, uh, we haven't moved that forward and um, we haven't recommended vacancy control in the existing housing stock, um, primarily because we're in a situation where we also need to be encouraging new rental housing supply. Um, and so the vacancy control broadly in the stock, we've heard both from um, from a, a range of organizations. But what, if but you ex what if you exempted new units? Yeah, that that is interesting. It, it is something that we that we could look at. We have heard uh, we have heard that more recently that if we looked at exempting um, new units, uh, is that something we could look at? And it's something we can certainly follow up on. Okay, great. So that that. Um slide that Councillor Boyle referred to with the 74,000 extra market units to pay for some of the social housing and some of the below market unit units. Do we need 74,000 extra market units? Will, will we have enough population to, um, to want them? Or is this, um, are some of these units gonna be for people who want their security safety deposit box in the sky type of thing. But I think when we looked at that, the main driver of that scenario was looking at what would be required to meet the affordability requirements of existing households in need. So it was really around, these are the 56,000 new units we would need that are income targeted and quite <laughs> affordable. Um, then how would you deliver that? Uh, the 74,000 is, is an assumption based on our current capital plan assumptions about the proportion of non-market stock that's delivered through inclusionary models versus uh, funded by okay. other levels of government. So, but I would say um, that, it, it, you know, indirectly in response to that uh, question, there are a number of capacity limits that we think that that uh, scenario would exceed and that would be staff's concern with it. Uh, not, not only a uh, number of people moving to the, the city and region, but also the industry's capacity to build that many units in that period of time. I think my time is just about up. I'm gonna go on again. Thanks, Councillor Swanson. Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, and thanks to staff for the overview, obviously kind of the one of the key issues in our city that we deal with every day. Um, I've got a few questions I wanted to touch base on. Um, my, I'll try to get through them. Um, my first one is, if we are setting housing, tar revised housing targets in response to current need and the current market, if we know that a huge cost of housing is the city costs and the timelines for development permits and rezonings, have we considered attaching goals to reduce those turnaround times to the housing strategy? and directly setting quantitative measures? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, we, we have tried in this, in this term through the uh, social housing uh, rental tenure program through um, both through PDS and through development building and licensing to do that, to set targets to, to basically cut in half the permitting time for projects that uh, come in through that process. And so that is something we've tried to do. I think it's something we could look at further taking in um, you know, a, a more robust approach in terms of looking at the total targets. Could, could we actually bring them together for ease of tracking if, you know, you focus on one thing into one plan and one strategy and one document so that when we get this update, we can see in conjunction together how we're tracking on both? Yeah, that's a good uh, a, a good recommendation for the, how we would bring those metrics to you, Councillor, so we can, we can look at that. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, the next question that I have was, I was really struck by, and it, kind of affirm something for me that I've been thinking about and worrying about with our growing seniors population. I think the chart that you had that showed the 
high need, I think 52% um, in terms of the amount of income that seniors are spending, and particularly renters and how vulnerable they are um, in terms of their housing situation. Are we looking at shifting strategy to include seniors more explicitly in our need groups in this next update? Yeah, so we're starting work on a senior strategy this year. So that is one of the things that we're going to be looking at. Um, we're going to be getting a consultant on board to look at the different range of gaps and needs, as well as policy responses um, to, to look at seniors across the board from the very low income to ones that are more securely housed. And, you know, we would incorporate that work with the next round of updates on targets. Okay, that's, that's good to hear. Uh, I mean, I'm sad that we have to do that, but I think it's important that we need to. Um, Moving on, I, I want to kind of address a couple of things that come up around the council chamber all the time when we're discussing different housing projects, because a lot of, I think, council collectively shares the aspiration to get the right type of housing and for people in, but we go at it differently sometimes. And so this notion of what's the impact of not approving housing projects? Um, because sometimes we have some folks will vote against them because they're not affordable enough or um, they're concerned for other reasons. And so what's the impact of turning down some of these projects and just con effectively constraining supply and keeping what we have? Uh, yeah, thank you. I guess I, I would look at it in terms of the aggregate. Like, uh, it, It's hard to say on an individual project by individual project basis, but on aggregate, the addition of that housing supply is extremely important in terms of um, mitigating and slowing price growth, especially on the rental side where we see a really direct uh, correlation between things like vacancy rent rates and the rent uh, rate at which rents increase. So it is very important to keep um, new... Um, housing supply uh, coming, both in terms of addressing existing need, addressing demographic changes in the city and household formations, as well as immigration. So it could just get more expensive. It's like if you want to go to a really great concert, there's only so many tickets, a smaller venue, it's going to cost you more money versus if you could yeah. potentially open up more tickets. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Um, can I also touch on this other sort of hot point of topic of um, discussion that comes up sometimes um, amongst councils, sometimes from speakers that we hear on a lot of different projects, and that is around this notion of zone capacity. We have enough existing zone capacity in the city, so we don't need this. Our targets are too aggressive for housing, and it's fine. And my question is, can I, can I get staff's perspective on that? Because given the fact that 80% of our land is privately held, just because somebody could do something with it doesn't mean they're going to, does it? Or they will want to change their single family home into something else overnight. Yeah, that, I mean, that's correct. We think a more useful metric is development capacity that blends both an idea of what's allowed in the zoning, but also the rate at which the development is actually taken up. So a great example that our citywide and regional team uses is, is if you think about laneway houses, there's sort of 68,000 detached uh, or, or RS zoned lots that could have a laneway house but we got 300 last year. So the fact that you could build 68,000 is not necessarily relevant. Um, um, I think that's, I have to just pause there, Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah. yeah, no problem, I'll pick that up on the Okay, side. great, yep, absolutely. Okay, uh, Councillor Carr. Great, uh, thanks so much. Uh, thanks for the report, long awaited, and it's great to have. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm gonna ask a very quick first question, uh, which is if we go with meeting population growth, um, uh, only the first scenario the report says it will be I mean you said actually verbally um, the, it will be mostly condos can you explain that why would that be so the first target scenario is um, based on past development trends so you know looking at the past um, 10 years um, that, that's just what was approved. So it, it would be 21% um, are rental and 79% would be ownership, primarily condos. Yep. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, I, again, I, I completely fastened on the same um, page 10 of the report with the three concepts that other councillors have regarding the needs based targets. Um, so uh, um, regarding the 74,000 additional market homes, um, can we not sort of add other alternatives? My worry is that when it, when it, when you see something like that, say you're, say you're a housing minister in the provincial government or federal government, and you see that, you go, oh, they've got a solution. They're just going to build all that housing. Yay, you know, that's development. Um, can we not say something like um, equivalent dollars from senior governments 
would be this much, right? Or uh, capacity of the nonprofit sector um, and or um, uh, co-ops um, to, you know, and I don't know what the capacity is um, actually within the city right now of, of, uh, of co-ops and non nonprofits. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering if that, that's my first sort of question around this. Yeah, and that, that's, a, that's a really good one. So the 74,000 um, units that we're, you know, projecting to pay for a, a third of the social housing units and the below market rental units, um, that, that's just, you know, a portion of how that, that um, scenario would be funded, you know, to fund that 56,000 units that are deeply affordable. The other part of it is actually, you know, in, in the report we talk about the need for 12 billion in um, senior government and partnership uh, in terms of financing uh, grants and, and loans, of which upwards of about 7 billion of that would be direct cash to enable that level of, of affordability. So it's, you know, in, in that scenario, to achieve the levels of affordability, we're kind of looking at, you know, kind of um, significant um, investment from all levels of government. Yeah, yeah, that's only half the cost of a, a pipeline that they want to build. Um, so federally, so there are some equivalents we could offer them. Um, uh, are you evaluating potentially changing the ask um, uh, of developers. So I remember when we did the MERT program and I put that amendment in to say, make it, you know, 20% at 30% of income. It was like, ah, oh, we're not sure if the industry will take it, but they did, right? Um, maybe not as much as we wanted, but they did. So we can, uh, can we look at things like inclusionary zoning um, and changing the percentage? Um, I don't know what the industry standards are. I don't know what the city standards are in other places, but I'm wondering if, there aren't ways in which we can increase that ask. Yeah, so on, on the BMR, that's a good question. And we, there will, we are going to be starting a review of our, all of our different below uh, market rental policies that we have out there um, starting later this year, just to, to um, look at what would be a good consistent approach that we bring back to council next year. Um, Dan's gonna talk a bit about the inclusionary policy. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Yeah, and, and we do when we're looking at implementing inclusionary policies, um, we do the analysis to see how far we can push it uh, in terms of how much we can secure as as the affordable component of the project. I appreciate sometimes council pushes us to to push further, and that that's okay. Um, I think the limit the limiting factor is when you look at the affordability requirements. Um, if we get to the point where the affordability requirements are so great that the um, that uh, the project that you're trying to get built uh, is worth less than the land under its existing zoning, then what ends up happening is nothing gets built. And so that, that's the sort of fine line we're trying to walk in terms of those affordability requirements. Um, so that, that's the one sort of uh, governor on, on our ability to require more affordability, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I'm all for pushing home. Right? <laughs> um, and I appreciate that. I've got you know, time left to ask another question, but I'll get back on, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Uh, Councillor Weed. Yeah, um, I'll go to that same slide. Can you talk about the third option? Because you've talked about the second option, like the 8,000 below market and the third social housing. How much affordability is in option three of the constraint needs-based targets? Yeah, so option three, um, it's uh, 14,000 non-market units. So that's still more than our current target of 12,000. Um, it's 24,000 market re uh, rental units um, with uh, 24,000 market rental with 4,000 below market rental in there. It's uh, 10,000 ground oriented housing um, and then the 23,000 condos. And that's just because that's already in the pipeline. So in that scenario, 33% of the overall target, if you look at the income distribution, would be affordable to incomes under 80K. So it'd be kind of a third, a third model. Mm -hmm. okay. about, yeah, more balanced. I like that. Um, and then you talked about we shouldn't be looking at zone capacity, but development capacity. What is our development capacity as a city? Do we have those numbers for the next five years? Is that something we've talked about? Yes, we do. And um, we have a, a citywide staff who will expand further. Okay, thank you very much.
I'm Ingrid Huang, planner with the citywide and regional planning team. And in terms of, of, so over the next 10 years, we projected that there's going to be f about 50,000 units for the city. So that's in the pipeline. In the pipeline. How about the development capacity? So the capacity, or is that what we call that's, the pipeline? Okay, so that's, and is that including the Broadway planning work, the city planning work? Right. Some snuff, like some of the ones that haven't been approved yet, Jericho Lands, mm -hmm. Renfrew. So because they have not been approved, we do not take them, them into account in the development pipeline cal um, cal calculations. So however, if they, if applications have been in, in uh, if they've been applied for, then we do account for them in our development pipeline because we project that they will likely be completed within that time frame. Okay, so the 50,000 units is mm -hmm. what we've already approved or what we think with the laneway program over the next five years with the current pickup of that program will right. be delivered. So that's Correct. kind of that. Okay, but it's not including anything we haven't approved of. Or, or policies that we have or not approved, approved. yeah. Okay, um, out of the three, can you talk is a little bit more about the third option there and where that came from? And is that the option that staff's more recommending? Can we talk a little bit more about where that third option came from and a little bit more about the nuances to how that's gonna deliver more affordable? So the third option was really trying to look at um, um, uh, more of a constrained needs model. You know, we think that, you know, having done the housing needs report, we're, we've learned a lot about housing needs, um, but we also, you know, recognize that meeting the full needs in the next 10 years is, is going to be impossible. Um, so this model was really kind of looking at, you know, where we could meet needs um, based on capacity, you know, capacity in the existing pipeline. So, you know, for instance, in the non-market, there's about 7,000 units in the pipeline. So doing, you know, looking at this 14,000 is like a doubling of, of, the, of the pipeline. And we think, you know, in terms of partner capacity, that's, that's probably, you know, the upward limits. Although, you know, the next phase of work is to go out and consult and talk with stakeholders to talk to them about, about capacity and what more we can do. So part of it is, is looking at the needs model, like where all the needs are, and part of it is looking at capacity of what's possible with our partners. And part of it is also based, you know, on, on the consultation of, of, um, of needs and desires from the residents, right? So we have, we do have uh, a... Sorry, because looking at the time. Sorry. Are those housing needs going to be like looking at, like we talked about, access to nature, right, light, um, accessible units. Like, are those part of the housing needs that we look at, or is it more just we need an extra bedroom, so an ADU, or, cre like, are we looking at creative solutions as well that might come back in the next report on some of the new housing forms that we're hearing that could deliver some of these housing needs? So for the housing needs report, it was primarily looking at um, more of the indicators in the census, like around incomes, around demographic groups, you know, and looking at the housing market overall, like vacancy rates and, and house prices, house price rises. But certainly when we do policy work, you know, to enable um, areas for new housing, that would be the type of solutions and types of housing forms that we would look at. Okay, thank you very much, appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor Weeb. <clears throat> uh, just noting that um, Councillor DiGenova has, I, I don't believe has had a first round of questions. So what we'll do, if that's okay, Councillor Hardwick, is we'll move Councillor DiGenova ahead. Oh, I'm gonna, Chair? I'm, I might have two rounds too, but if it's easier than reorganizing the queue, I'm, I'm You're happy Councilor to go Hardwick after Councillor Hardwick? First. Okay, that's great, thank you very much. Councillor Hardwick, over to you. Thanks. Um, yesterday we uh, heard about the capital plan and I'm just looking at the capital plan slides uh, showing $856 million coming from developer contributions over this period. Um, what is the relationship between that number and the pipeline of development that you uh, discussed um, in strata condos? What I'm getting at is, is that not the source of revenue from that the city is taking to fund capital? Thank you, Councillor Harwood. We have a Chris Cliven on the line who can respond to that question. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, it's Chris Cliven from Citywide and Regional Planning. The, um, the development contributions in the capital plan are made up of a variety of different sources. There's uh, revenue from development contributions. There's revenue, both in kind and cash from 
community amenity contributions, and then there's also density bonus zoning contributions, as well as um, connection fees provided by developers <coughs> that are required through um, redevelopments. Uh, the DCLs, uh, you've asked specifically about um, whether market strata contributes to those totals in the capital plan in terms of development contributions. Yes, they do, but they also, we get development contributions from all forms of development, from uh, rental development. Of course, rental development does pay DCLs and, and is subject to community amenity contribution policy. Um, uh, Non-residential development, industrial development, they are all subject to development contributions. So it's a sum of all land use categories and developments. Fair, thank you for, for that. But the point that I'm making here is that the revenue that is generated uh, from the development is what we're funding capital from. And a big chunk of that, of course, is going to quote unquote affordable housing. So um, as I'm looking at these targets, um, I'm also looking at uh, over the decade in land inflation that we've seen now, BC assessment told us that the land and the air above it uh, went from 188 to $480 billion, which is a 2.5 increase over nine years. And so my question is, do we see a relationship between promoting development to extract revenue to fund capital and the land inflation that's plaguing the city? Councillor, I would say we definitely agree that the land costs in the city are a challenge and are, are, do make it difficult to achieve affordable housing. Um, we have seen, though, that land costs have gone up in neighborhoods across the city, whether or not there has been uh, a redevelopment. Uh, at a very rapid pace. So the, the cost of detached housing, for example, in areas where there's been uh, little or no redevelopment uh, has also gone up uh, significantly over the last decade. So then the, the, the correlation between the act of rezoning and land inflation has to be taken into consideration. July 1st, BC assessment comes in and looks at every property at highest and best use based on the rezoning that has taken place over that year. That's one of the key determining factors. So if we are pr promoting development to extract revenue and that is inflating land prices, does that not in fact, uh, I've described it as putting up fire with gasoline in terms of our approach to um, ultimate, our ultimate objective, which is affordable housing. Again, I'd say three things. One is the cost of land is going up as a result of a number of factors, including market factors. Um, secondly, we know we need new housing supply, so not adding new housing supply is not going to help the... Yeah, it's not a question of not adding. It's a pace of change that I'm getting at here. It's the difference between walking inflation and galloping inflation because we've seen exponential land in increase. So again, I want to go back to uh, what we were talking about before in terms of population growth and household growth and the demand for that. Um, I just ran the numbers and... Uh, the 72,000 households, uh, which translates uh, to what you're calling your homes targets, would mean that there was, um, that would anticipate 158,400 new population, when in fact what we've seen from the census is more in the order of 65,000. How do you reconcile such a, an exponential difference between the reality of the numbers that we free, see from um, the census and the targets that you've set? Thank you. I would say that the reconcile comes to the number of dwelling units that are expected to be added. Uh, looking forward, uh, what's in the pipeline is already above what the historical averages are uh, that we've seen, whether that be through the census or, uh, or through CMHC. Uh, and in terms of uh, moving forward, the population output from that says that, yes, the growth rate is going to be a little bit above where we were historically moving forward. But again, I ran the numbers here as well. Looking forward, uh, over the next two census periods, uh, the growth forecast is for about, for each census period, about 6% growth. Uh, and again, that compares back to the most recent census period. We're going to have to leave it there. Sorry. Sorry. This is a very quick answer. 10 seconds. So. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Councillor DiGenova. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, my first question is, I was hoping that staff might be able to share the numbers specifically on how many projects uh, we've seen this year go through the short program, social housing or rental tenure. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> I can come back to that. Uh, 
Uh, hi, Councillor. Yeah, I mean, we certainly uh, still have projects going through the short program, and we have uh, staff in DBL that are leading that uh, through uh, Amy Villas, the manager of affordable housing in DBL's team. So we certainly do have uh, particularly nonprofit led projects going through that program. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, just a follow up question Do you happen to know how many projects in the past year have gone through the program? I don't have it right in front of me, but I could uh, try to look it up. Maybe for my second round, yeah, if possible. Perhaps, that's fine. yeah. Uh, can I also ask, so right now, it's only the social housing. You know I've said this before. It's called short, not chart. It's not social housing and rental tenure. It's social housing or rental tenure. I know that we just don't have uh, the capacity, is my understanding right now, to, to offer that to rental tenure. But when we compare rental tenure to condo, condo um, to strata condo I'm wondering is it the same time frames that a project that was condo and a project that was rental would they have to go through would it be about the same timelines for them to complete and hit their milestones and their performance for uh, rezoning for DP for BP yeah, I mean, certainly we do try to accelerate priority council projects, regardless of whether they're in the short program or not. So that includes nonprofit. It also includes rental, and particularly rental that includes below market. So we have, an, for example, in our rezoning center, we have an affordable housing priorities team that focuses on and tries to expedite the projects that are priority council uh, projects related to housing. Uh, so we do still try to accelerate those projects, even if they're not going through the, the, the short project in sort of name. I appreciate that. If we were looking at two projects, um, one being market uh, condo and one being just market rental, would we see those running in the same time frames? I think it'll depend on the nature of the individual projects. Like the pro projects will have a number of factors, including things like their level of complexity in terms of. I how kind they of meant comparable. Through. I'm not talking about but, something that's you know 16 stories in one yeah. part of town and you know four story you know strata condo in another yeah. part of town. So I, I don't have the timelines right in front of me, but we certainly try to ex accelerate and expedite the projects that are that are rental particularly below market. And if there were more resources sort of in your department and, and in DBL and in planning, would this be something we would want to expand to the most affordable rental? As you know, the motions that I put forward, the kind of, you know, this kind of came of, of that and a number of other council motions last term uh, looked at the idea of expediting the most affordable projects would go first regardless of what they were, if they delivered more affordable housing. Is that still the aim right now? I, I think it, it is the aim, but we obviously have to balance other key council priorities. Those projects, for example, that, that deliver other high priority public benefits that council's looking to achieve. So I know uh, that our, our team, Teresa, led by Teresa O'Donnell, does a, um, a sort of balancing act to try to make sure that all the projects that are getting uh, expedited through the system are um, meeting council priorities. It's like a tightrope, I'm sure. Um, it's challenging. Can I also ask, I mean, you can, my favorite topic, affordable home ownership. This council <laughs> recently passed a motion, um, and, and I'll come back on for a second round, so I don't expect you to answer it in the one minute that we have here, but I will ask it now, and that's, uh, how how are we doing with those MOUs with BC Housing right now and CMHC and looking at moving forward? Because the last time I checked, we had two units, not two projects, two units of affordable home ownership under the BC Housing program that offers the second mortgage. We have no risk. We don't have to change the charter. So can you give us a bit of an update? I have 30 seconds now, and then I'll come back on the queue. For sure. So um, on the next round, we can talk a bit more about the need for AHO, but I'll just say quickly, we are working on a staff report, not a staff report, a consultant report that'll be coming to council in May, reporting back on a study of affordable home ownership in other jurisdictions and some recommendations. So that'll be mid-May, that'll come to council. Okay, and could you speak a little more about the MOUs maybe when I come back on, if that's a possibility? We can do that. Great, thanks so much. And I'll leave it there. I have eight seconds left. Thank you, Councillor DiGenova. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I just wanted to pick up, uh, I think it was with Dan, um, on that last question uh, that we were discussing with respect to, sorry, my brain's a bit tired today. Um, yes, development capacity, and we were talking about zone capacity versus development capacity, and I think you were starting to say that um, a better metric would actually be picking up on the development capacity, so I kind of linked that back to my other question around 
reporting out on permitting times is can we and would it be beneficial to adopt that as a measure um, in our housing plan and in the next update? And, and any other comments you want to add and just because you didn't get a chance to really finish that? Sure, yeah. I, I, and also we had Ingrid Wang speak a little bit more to the zone capacity um, question, but uh, I, I do think it's something uh, we could we could build in. I think you're right to reflect on the fact that we have a lot of work going on around development uh, processes and you're getting reports on that. We have a lot of work going on on the housing file and you're getting reports on that, but the idea of bringing those things together to, to draw the explicit connection I think is a good idea. So that's something we can um, we can talk with uh, Teresa, the team in DBL on on how we link those things. So I think that's a, that's a good idea. Uh, just again, in terms of zone and development capacity, um, I, we just don't find the zone capacity measure to be as useful to measure as looking at the actual development uh, pipeline and actual development that's, that's underway. Uh, can you, large. Can you just define, um, while we have a bit more time, can you just, just sort of define development capacity so that we all have a sort of a level setting around how you, how you view that? Yeah, that yeah, might, it might conjure sure. up a different connotation in people's minds than okay. how many people have actually, how many projects we have in the pipeline, for example. So what, right. what do, how are we defining that when you're talking about Yeah, that? so Ingrid Wang is our expert at defining development capacity. So I'm going to ask her to come up and... Um, so thanks. A zone capacity is what we defined as under the zoning and development bylaw, what is allowable and what uh, people could theoretically build. And... In City of Vancouver, because we have so many overlapping policies and guidelines that enable uh, different development types on top of zoning, that's what we use to calculate development capacity. So we look at all the layers of um, policies that, can, that allow uh, different types of um, development that can be built. We then look at the, the choices that people are making. For instance, in some zones, um, for instance in Marple, the RM8 zones, um, they allow people to build uh, four-story apartments or they can build townhouses. So we look at the trends to determine what choices are people making when they, um, when they build in these areas. And we then project forward based on like some of the trends that people are making based on like some of the market demands that people are seeing. And does that help? It's almost more, I mean, is it fair to say what, it sounds like what you're describing is almost like a development pattern as opposed to capacity. Like it's, you're almost kind of looking to a, what's what's really happening in the market. Is that a good way of? I, yes. It? It, in conjunction with, with the context of, context of what is the city of Vancouver enabling within its current policies? Yes. Okay. So closing that loop then, just in terms of trying to get towards some better achievable kind of metrics and outcomes, is it possible, and I know that we talked about it could be valid, but is it possible to actually quantify and bring some of that work in? I guess we're seeing some of it in the graphs that you presented around um, how much is built, for example, but are we able to any further illuminate that in terms of in specific areas? This is where we're seeing policies, but here's where the pickup is. Because I guess what that would identify is where are those opportunities mm -hmm. to lever and actually encourage a different type through zoning changes, right? Yeah. If that data is daylighted, do you have a comment on that? So, so we do look at, um, internally, we do look at the performance and uh, what people are choosing. So I guess in some ways it's like the success of the different policies, but I um, do, however, I don't believe we, I mean, we could do more work to make those linkages in the future and make those public. Okay, I appreciate that. I think the spirit of the question was in sort of data driven. <laughs> sure decisions to enable council uh, to kind of look at potential policy options through that. Thank, thanks for the, the answer, appreciate it. All right, so those are the end of your questions, Councilor Kirby Young, okay. Uh, Councilor Swanson. Yeah, I've got three questions, so hoping for brief answers here. Um, Dan, you said that we've got 9% non-market housing now. Could staff come up with a, a strategy to have policies that would help us increase that non-market percent to 20 or 30 or 40 like Vienna or have you been looking at the CCPA reports about how to build affordable housing? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. 
Uh, thank you for the question. If, in, in fact, that is um, that is sort of built in as a notion to the Housing Vancouver strategy and the Housing Vancouver targets. If you think we have nine percent right now, our target in Housing Vancouver was for twelve of twelve thousand of seventy seventy two thousand units, which I think is approximately fifteen percent. And so um, we do have a, a strategy to try to incrementally build that up because I I do think that increasing the role of the community housing sector in our housing system is going to be an important part of meeting housing need, um, both in the city and the province. So, uh, so <laughs> yes, we could we could try that. Getting to Vienna, uh, you know, they took a hundred years to get where they are, so it's probably going to take us a while. But, uh, but we could start <laughs> making steps in the right direction. So there's a certain UBC prof who's saying that we should require fifty percent affordability for rezonings, not only to get the affordability, but also to reduce land price so that more affordability becomes possible. What do you think of that? Uh, yeah, Councillor, I, I, I think in some ways it's similar to the question that Councillor Carr asked earlier just about how far can we push the sort of inclusionary requirements. Um, and, and I think, you know, uh, the, the notion of requiring 50% of the housing to be affordable is, uh, is interesting. It would certainly have a dampening effect on, on land values. But again, if we push it to the point that the dampening effect on land value means the most valuable use of that land is its current use, largely single family houses or, or, or what have you, then we wouldn't see any housing development. And so that, that's the sort of balance that we need to strike in terms of requiring affordability. Okay. Um, then I noted that the report said that we have uh, 345,000 jobs in the city, but only 187,000 people who live here and work here. And it made me wonder if we should be encouraging more jobs, if we should be working with Metro to encourage more jobs outside of the city and fewer jobs in the city so people wouldn't have to travel so far. Like we're saying, well, we need housing close to work but that it looks to me with from these figures that it means like we that we need housing close to work in other parts of the region rather than here hi council matthew burke citywide and regional planning uh, i'll try to answer that really quickly um yeah about 40 percent of the jobs in the city are held by folks who commute in and um um uh, you know that is due to many factors um for example, folks may live in the suburbs and uh, their, their partner may work in that suburb. So um, things that we do with um, jobs and housing in Vancouver may have a uh, limited impact on um, choices people make in terms of where they live. Um, but certainly we know that Vancouver uh, continues to be a really uh, desirable place for um, employers to locate. Um, and we have a significant uh, amount of um, employment space in the pipeline today. Um, and so we're looking to um, add housing uh, to create that opportunity for people to live close to where they work. Okay, last question. Uh, you said that we have 1,669 1, social housing units completed in 2021. Does anyone know how many we lost? Uh, Councillor Swanson, staff are just looking for that information. You can email it to me if you like. We'll, we'll follow up with you on that. It's a small number, it, um, but we can follow up with you on that. Okay, thank you. That's it for me. Thanks very much, Councilor Swanson. Uh, Councilor Cart. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, one thing, Steph, that you noted um, in one of your answers, but you said that pre-zoning helps nonprofits get funding from senior governments. So what are the best examples of zoning for housing affordability that, that can do that, it help, help nonprofits get senior government funding? Best examples of zoning, either in our own city or somewhere else? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Councillor. We, we do have a number of good examples in the city. For quite a while, we've had, for example, um, in the downtown east side, and particularly in the downtown east side Oppenheimer district, we've had density bonus zoning uh, that allows bonusing for basically only for uh, social housing. And the reason is the priority in that plan area is to address SRO replacement requirements. Um, and that's been quite effective at attracting senior government funding uh, where it's it's predictable, it's stable. They know the nonprofits and the government levels of government know what can be built there. And so that's that that's kind of the model that we're looking at um, expanding. Uh, it is a, it is often a factor municipal approval in in federal and provincial financing and, and funding. And so it is something that when you put that in place, it is it is sort of one more box that the nonprofit that's applying for that funding can check. Right. Does that help? prevent the escalation of land prices speculate and speculation I, I think one of the ways definitely to address land price uh, escalation and, and speculation is by having the development uh, opportunities and requirements uh, absolutely clear and putting that in the zoning is probably the the sort of gold standard of, of, of how to do that yeah. good. that's good to know second question um, can we develop another graph other than this one that you've got on page 10 that actually just reflects the needs, the housing needs, like to really meet um, the, the problem of supplying housing for those most in need. I'm thinking something that would um, have the actual numbers and types of units and price ranges even for each income category. Um, and although it, you know, then it would clearly show that. I mean, I don't mind if it goes above and you can have condos at the other end of it, but if, it, if you want a whole housing thing. But in terms of actually a housing needs report, I'd love to just see exactly how many of the units in those different price ranges um, and, um, and income ranges are needed. Yep, absolutely. We can, we can do that in the phase two of the of this work when we go and consult further on the target concepts we can break that down further so that um, it's more clear what is need what the income ranges are um, and, and show even the housing types um, and you know that that next phase of work we're um, hoping to get underway in the fall once we get the updated census data that shows the income and the tenure um, tenure from the 2021 uh, census which won't be released until the the summer and the fall of this year. Right, great, looking forward to that. Um, my final question um, is around protecting existing affordable housing. Um, the report doesn't talk a lot about that, so what can we include uh, measures and uh, um, potential solutions around protecting existing affordable housing? Yeah, I'll, I'll start this answer, and then I think Sarah's going to add to it. So, you know, this this was looking at um, housing needs, which w a lot of the um, what we were looking at was set out by the province. But certainly, um, protecting existing affordable housing is is critical um, to our success, and it's a fundamental goal of the Housing Vancouver strategy. So, you know, we're always looking at ways that we can improve our measures to uh, protect the existing rental stock. Uh, look at ways that we can work with the provincial government to improve tenant protections and to also um, uh, encourage reinvestment um, in the existing stock, noting that so much of it is now, um, you know, built before 19, 1980. So, and those are things that we would look to do as part of, um, you know, part of this work, but more part of the update of the next housing three-year action plan. Right. Yeah, we did, we did as count, in council yesterday, um, I get a hint of some, I think, really, really important measures to protect existing um, low-income renters in, that is going to be coming in the Broadway. But anyway, love to hear the rest of your answer. Thanks. Yeah, I can just ask and um, add in the way of data, um, the loss of affordability in the existing stock due to demolitions and also due to um, just increasing rents in existing in existing rental housing. That was something that was flagged by experts when we were consulting on the needs report as a gap. You'll see there's a part of the report where we talk about it, but in terms of quantifying, that's just a serious challenge that's been addressed across the board. But the good news is there is a team that's working on trying to figure out a way to estimate it using census data. We're a part of that team and hopefully can come back with something more concrete in the next Absolutely. report. It Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, Councillor Fry. I'm all really excited to see that report come back on the Broadway plan and with some of those new renter protections. It's very exciting. Looking forward to that. Uh, looking forward to the whole plan. 
Uh, but since we have you guys here, I thought it would be an opportunity to ask, because we do have a member motion coming later today about the empty homes tax. And I'm wondering if you could in, let us know, how effective has the increase uh, to 3% on the empty homes tax been in addressing um, not only affordability, but also uh, meeting our housing targets and so, Councillor Fry, I, I can start that. Um, so, w the staff right now are doing, I mean, this is the first year, uh, so that assessment is underway. I'll speak to the staff. So, just want to caution that it's early days um, on that piece of work, and it's something that we are looking to report back to Council on. I would defer to the team if they've got anything else to add to that. Yeah, I'll just echo that. It's still really early, so I know data was circulated to Council um, from the first round of returns, um, declarations from empty homes tax, kind of showing a continued trend uh, towards decreasing the number of empty homes um, and increasing the number of homes that are tenanted. Uh, we're working on that review right now, and obviously the motion that's still being decided by Council will, will impact that review and what we come back with. Um, so we'll have more concrete data hopefully soon. So no, no specific timeline, but... No, I think that'll well, be impacted by... the next couple of hours. I don't think so. Um, but we can try to... I, I, I think you have some data from a memo from previously, so I don't think we have any updates um, relative to that. Okay. I don't want to put you on the spot and ask you what you think about it jumping to 5% then. Um, I won't put you on the spot. Is that it, Council Fry? That's it. Yes. Council DiGenova. Thanks. I was hoping we could start with the answers to my affordable home ownership questions from before, if that was all right. Uh, yeah, so you were asking about whether there's the progress on MOUs with BC Housing and CMHC. So as part of the study, the consultant study on AHO, we have been engaging BC Housing, so they've been part of a workshop with us, and then as staff, we're also in dialogue with them to understand their AHOP program. And I think the key point there is understanding how AHOP would work with some of the AHO priorities that we're starting to hear about through council motions, especially around the idea of plexes, seeing how those two programs could potentially align. It's still early days. The two programs don't quite jive with each other, but... Uh, that's kind of the topic of discussion now, and we'll be bringing back more updates on that uh, in May. Oh, okay. I was just wondering, is there a reason we'd have to wait for that, considering, I mean, this, I think the original motion I moved was back in 2015, and I understand, you know, looking at, like, four plexes and six plexes, but, I mean, we're usually seeing these happen right now in multi-residential projects and that's how BC housing is working so why would we wait if we could start with those yeah councillor I, I think that the previous councils of which you were a member had the benefit of um, understanding uh, numerous approaches and implications of affordable home ownership programs and the current council hasn't really discussed those yet and so we wanted to have an opportunity to, to brief the current council on um, the options and alternatives around affordable home ownership, of which BC Housing's program is absolutely one of the key ones that's that's on the table, and so um, at BC the same Housing time, takes on the risk with the second mortgage as well, do they not? They take on a number of things, including the risk on the second mortgage, including the administration of the program. So there are a number of factors of the BC Housing model that are attractive for sure, but we just wanted to make sure that Council had a bit of an understanding of what the alternatives are when they're looking at that. And I mean, I'm if, not selling the program, but I am yes. wondering the money that's invested in the community. So right now, I know that they're doing a lot of their AHOP program um, out in Coquitlam. So when a unit is sold, that, that investment is reinvested in the city of Coquitlam. So the city of Coquitlam keeps that, although it might not stay with the unit. That's my understanding. Is that is that your understanding? Yeah, and that is consistent with the conversations we're having with um, BC Housing staff in the housing hub. So that's, yes, that's consistent. I just don't want us to be left behind, so thank you. I, I also have some questions on co-housing and after speaking to a number of applicants, understanding, you know, that there are some applicants uh, and, and some developers in our city, even nonprofit developers that want to take those risks, that they're not seeing those guidelines currently. They're not seeing an approach that allows them to look at co-housing in a way, and I'm talking about some shared living space for families like we see in European cities, uh, where 
you know, it's very different to that idea of multi-residential, where you'd have some shared living space or shared laundry space in a condo strata case or in rental. But I'm hearing um, from applicants that that risk is just too great, considering the city doesn't have any policy. Um, can you update me on that? Sure, yeah. I mean, co-housing is an interesting model because I, I think that you're right in the way you're characterizing it. It sort of falls through a gap in city policies. We have rental incentive programs. We definitely have programs to work particularly with nonprofit co-op housing developers and providers. Um, co-housing, particularly in strata uh, sort of forms, we don't really have policies that differentiate, differentiate it from a, 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 any, any strata condominium project. And so... Um, Could we know, do that with limited common ownership of? Certain... I mean, I, th I think that that may be something that we'd have to look at and, and bring back to council for a, a, an understanding on how they might want to do that. I mean, I am aware of co-housing projects in the city that were just built under existing zoning and uh, following the same rules that a normal strata condominium project would follow. So that is possible. Um, I appreciate there may be some risks that, that uh, involved in those projects that don't get mitigated in that way, but that is that is possible. Thanks, and I'd be happy to move the recommendations before. We do have speakers. Oh, my apologies, yes, we have speakers. No problem. Thank you to staff for answering my questions. So we are going to uh, move to our speakers queue. So thank you very much, staff, for answering all of those questions. We have um, our first speaker, who I believe is on the line, speaker one, Tom Devidoff. Yep, I'm here, thank you very much. I'd like to make uh, six points quickly. Uh, and then maybe uh, go into an extended analogy, which may be helpful in explaining them, and of course, delighted to take questions. First one uh, is that a range of numbers for need is totally appropriate. Anybody who would claim certainty uh, about how many housing units need to be built, even you know by type, you, you, you couldn't do that. It's just not realistic um, because it's too hard of a problem to solve. Uh, the second point is a number is very useful. You know, Councillor Carr and others mentioned this issue of do development charges uh, scare off uh, development or uh, either cash charges or asking for affordability. Well, the way you can find out is if you have a target each year of how much you need you want to get built, if you're hitting your targets, then you don't need to worry that you're asking too much. If you're failing to hit your targets, uh, you should ask for less. And if you're hitting more than your targets, then you should ask for more. Uh, a third point is gentrification. Uh, the evidence is, uh, you know, allowing more market housing to get built uh, does not cause gentrification in the sense of rising rents. It may be that you make neighborhoods kind of sh sh more chic, but the bigger effect, evidence from Evan Mast and Jody Lee tells us, is that when you allow more housing units to get built, what happens is you absorb the top of the demand curve, and that takes pressure off of other existing buildings and makes things better, not worse. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young made a very important point, which is the unaffordability of uh, new units proves the need for more units, right? So, for example, new townhomes, I think, cost about a million five. So you need an income of something like three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars a year uh, to be able to afford, under the stress test, a new townhome on the west side. Does that say, well, we should? That means everybody making less than three hundred thousand dollars a year should be. Uh, uh, absorbed into social housing? Of course not. It proves you desperately need more housing units. Point five, land price inflation, uh, which Councillor Hardwick brought up. Uh, yeah, when you have uh, more uh, housing allowed, of course, uh, land may become more valuable. But if land values are increased when you relax zoning, that just proves economically that there's more than enough demand and that the world is a better place because more people get to enjoy Vancouver more uh, if you allow more units. So, uh, you know, you could make an argument that if land prices inflate, you should charge higher CACs or impose uh, greater affordability requirements. That's fine. But the only reason to limit uh, density is to preserve amenity. And if land values are rising when you relax density restrictions, that means you were destroying value. And of course, again, if you don't want it to go to landowners uh, and developers, just ask for more uh, CACs. Uh, zone capacity, uh, Kirby Young also mentioned, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, and, and, and this was mentioned by staff, right? If you have 10-story uh, zoning and a bunch of nine-story story buildings, 
you know, that that's not very meaningful because, of course, people aren't going to tear down a nine story to go to 10 stories. So, um, you know, saying we've got capacity to build more units uh, if enough units aren't getting built, not particularly meaningful. I think I've got two minutes uh, to go into an analogy on this. And, and let me just, uh, you know, if it's helpful at all, talk about a um, – a, a nightclub with a line out the door, right? And and we we have customers coming into the nightclub who are arranged from their greatest willingness to pay to the least willingness to pay. And we can think of the cover charge as how much it costs to live in Vancouver. If you want the cover charge to go down, uh, the, the way you do that is you let in more people. The last person in has the lowest willingness to pay. If we let more people into Vancouver, that reduces uh, willingness to pay. Think about immigrants. There's got to be uh, 400,000 immigrants immigrants into Canada, 100,000 of them probably would like to live in Vancouver every year. So how do we keep them out? They're kept out with high prices. Okay. If prices were lower, you'd have more people moving in. And the inverse of that is if you let more people in, the marginal person who's entering the, uh, the, the Vancouver housing market has a lower willingness to pay. And so you're putting less pressure on prices and rents. Uh, so uh, we do have that, uh, that, that need. You know, it, it expand entry, lower the willingness to pay of the new uh, entrants, and that takes price pressure both off of new units and, of course, uh, existing units because the top of the demand curve, the most willing entrants uh, are absorbed by the new market units. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, Tom, it is important to hear your perspective. There are no questions, but we are grateful for you coming to speak to Council today. Thank you. Next on the list, uh, we have um, speaker number two, Patrick Condon. Hello. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to comment on this very important thing. I have a few slides, so if you could put the first one up and I'll tell you when to change slides. Uh, I've reviewed the 2021 housing needs report and in the interest of your time, I will focus only on one aspect that seems most problematic. <clears throat> it's lack of attention to the real problem, which is wildly inflating land price. While the issue of inadequate supply is mentioned over a dozen times, land price is mentioned not at all. And yet skyrocketing land values are quite obviously the real reason that the market developers are no longer able to supply affordable housing. As the separately assessed property values for land and improvements make clear, shown here, it is not the value of the buildings in our cities that have skyrocketed in the last 10 years. It is the land under those buildings. Our land values have jumped citywide over 300% in constant dollars. And the consistent and unsupported reference in the report to the need for new supply clearly evidences an assumption that adding new supply will somehow lower the price of housing and presumably also lower the price of land. It would be nice if this was true. I know because for decades I promoted the same policies. But a careful study of the effect of adding new density to a parcel in the hopes that this would reduce the cost of housing disappoints. The elevated ratio of land price over building value holds true no matter what the density of the parcel is as shown in this single family view and also the multiple family view where the proportion of the land price relative to building price is just as outrageous. So sadly, adding density in the hopes that this will enhance affordability just enriches the land speculator and not the new resident as we had all hoped. Now, some argue that the elevated land prices and resulting housing prices are just an indicator of the demands exerted on our housing stock by low vacancy rate, mentioned 53 times in the report or immigration pressures mentioned 16 times. Next slide, please. But these assertions are contradicted by evidence from all around the globe, indicating that many major metropolitan areas in the English speaking world are similarly affected no matter their population pressures. Los Angeles shown here has lost over 100,000 people in the last census, yet their land prices are up over 250% in seven years. Next slide, please. Auckland, New Zealand, with very low immigration and prohibitions on foreign ownership, 
yet land prices are up 300% in only 10 years. In short, what we are seeing is our own local case of a globe-wide problem, a problem that is afflicting every city where urban land is feeding an insatiable appetite for secure investment value. Now, here's the difficult part of all this. The housing strategy that this report consistently supports is making all this worse. By assuming that our problem is lack of housing supply and by responding to that assumption by considering various forms of density increases across the city, we are pouring gasoline on the dumpster fire of urban land price inflation. Our every attempt to help people afford homes just elevates land prices and enriches only the land speculator. If this is true, then what should we do instead? To be clear, Please do add missing middle density to our neighborhoods, but only in return for guaranteed affordability. I would suggest one affordable unit for every unaffordable unit as a good place to start. This will exert downward pressure on the residual value of land and open up new opportunities for our non-market housing providers to fill our affordability gaps. In short, don't just zone for affordability, insist on it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. You do have uh, questions from counselors. We'll start with Councillor uh, Hardwick. Thank you, Patrick. Um, how do you respond to this oversimplified supply demand narrative? I think the uh, supply demand narrative is very intuitively compelling, but the problem we have here is that it doesn't really apply to land. Urban land is a monopoly resource and therefore behaves in the economy very differently than other commodities like oranges and Brussels sprouts or what have you, even automobiles, because there really is no substitution for it. So that is why I think that council needs to take a laser focus on land price and through inclusive zoning strategies, reduce the residual value of land so that speculators don't gain that uh, that uh, $30 billion worth of new value that you referenced earlier in the conversation. But that value goes instead to the people who need it, which is people who need housing. I thought it was uh, unfortunate that certain staff members were saying anybody under $80,000 in income we simply can't accommodate under present market conditions. We'll have to depend on higher levels of government for that. The strategy that I'm talking about doesn't require higher levels of government support because if you manage your own land prices through attacking the residual value through inclusive zoning demands, then the market will take care of that. Presently, the city of Vancouver is inflating land value by inducing speculative demand on on land parcels citywide by its seeming willingness to add density here, there, and everywhere without requiring any social benefit in return. Why do you think that there's a disconnect between the realization that rezoning inflates land values and the, the uh, impact on ultimately on affordability? I think Vancouver is experiencing something, experiencing something very dramatic and relatively new. Since the 1980s, we've been depending on the market to supply our, an unfettered market to just allow the market to do whatever it wants at, at you know, various densities that are lobbied in favor of in the hopes that that will en enhance affordability. But for the reasons that I've discussed, that does not, that it does not appear to be working anymore if it ever did in the first place. And the evidence for that is not just from Vancouver. It's around the world, no matter where you are in the, particularly the English speaking world, and no matter what their allowance is for new density, the prices are going up literally out of control. And it's land, not the building that is costing money. Building price, the cost of building a building per square foot has not gone up dramatically. It's land that has doubled, tripled, uh, and so forth. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you. Uh, you do have more questions, Councillor Boyle? Yes, um, thanks so much. Uh, I, I'm wondering, you spoke about a proposal to require one affordable 
unit for every unaffordable unit. And I'm wondering if you suggest we should be looking at a similar approach when new uh, detached housing is built. Yes, I think so. I think that could be a rule. And uh, and your own motion earlier in the year, which gave certain advantages in terms of additional density, but only to those nonprofit providers who agreed to give affordability in return was a measure that was going in the direct in the right direction. And I hope that can be retabled during this same session, because a one to one ratio is certainly quite possible given given the market's appetite for our market units, which is at $1,200 per square foot, that level of vigor, if we can control uh, land prices, gives us the flexibility of insisting on affordability at at least that one affordable unit to those making $80,000 and below uh, in return for every market unit, which would only be available under present market circumstances to those making a about about two hundred thousand dollars, as has been reported uh, just today. Thanks. That's helpful, and I hope that motion comes back too. I, I'm trying to wrap my head around what that would look like if somebody, for instance, is um, purchases and tears down an older single-family home, and they're building a new or bigger single-family home. How do we require um, include the same affordability requirement in that, which is still the the vast amount of our um, new residential square footage across the city. Yes, as I've mentioned, uh, I think I published something that some of you may have seen, you know, with uh, some praise for the making home proposal that is before council now and you're considering it. I think it's, I think it's a step in the right direction, although a rather modest one. I think that is the model that you could use to get 50% affordability into, into into regular ordinary neighborhoods that we kind of now erroneously erroneously call single family neighborhoods they're actually uh the act the uh the the the, the allowance now is for four units not one as and the point i want to leave you with is as you go as you consider this uh the requirement for affordability can be layered into your requirements for those new additional units such that we're not always talking about build, big buildings that need to have this affordability component. Ideally, it would be working within the existing parcel configuration and having a certain number of the units within that newly uh, revised parcel, whether it's four or five or six units, be affordable. And I think the 50% would be a reasonable target that gets you affordability without without the unintended consequence of displacing a lot of people from those uh, those basement suites okay. and so forth. Okay, great. We're going to have to leave it there. That's uh, well over the time. Thank you, uh, Councilor Boyle. Over to Councilor Dominato. Uh, hi, Patrick. Um, yeah, just a hi. question. Obviously, um, a lot of questions are centering on on what we would do uh, with zoning. How would we enable? To your point. You talked about one of the solutions being adding missing middle, but guaranteeing affordability. But I guess my question is this, how do we address the existing housing stock that's out there? We've got rentals, we've got strata, we have detached homes, we have row homes, we have townhomes that exist today. And when I look around at people looking at the market, um, the, you know, you put a, a house up or a strata condo, they are being purchased, but they're still at um, what many people deem unaffordable prices. Um, so how do you deal with that existing stock? I know we're thinking, looking forward, but how do you deal with that? Well, I think it's been mentioned before that the, uh, uh, Dan Garrison mentioned that the, the difficulty of inclusive zoning is that the inclusive zoning requirements are always in competition with the value of uh, of, of the, the, the status quo zoning. So I, I'm aware of that problem. I think that the in, the inducements need to be such that you outcompete in the context of requiring affordability uh, with the additional density. Uh, uh, and I'm not prepared to tell you that 50-50 is the magic number, but I will say that in a place like Cambridge, Massachusetts, which has a very similar situation to our own, what they've done, rather than the direction I think we're moving in, is to say, all, mi all missing middle density in our city uh, must be 100% affordable. In other words, there, 
they're not upzoning any part of the city for market product. They're only upzoning the city for middle density, for for missing middle densities if there's a 100% affordability in return. Now, that's a very aggressive, inclusive zoning requirement to be sure. And I hope that Dan Garrison isn't back there laughing into his sleeve. But I think uh, when we do a careful examination of the, of the relationship between the price that's being paid for status quo use and the prices we can command if we increase density for additional affordability, there will be a number that we'll arrive at. And I think currently we're sort of intuitively at the 20% level, which I don't think is sufficient to uh, mitigate the inflationary influence of our new density on land prices. I think certainly 50-50 might be appropriate. Uh, you know, Cambridge uh, is a different situation, but uh, they were smart enough not to do a citywide plan where they're saying, oh, we're going to add density throughout the city. So land speculators go crazy. That's already happening on the Broadway corridor. Okay, we're going to have to leave. Thank you. No, it's helpful. Thanks, Patrick. There. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Carr. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming to speak, uh, Patrick. Um, I'm very interested sure. in the one-to-one -one affordable uh, uh, to market units. Um, so would you suggest, first of all, is there a minimum size? Like, I think you said one unit for one unit, but is there a, like a minimum number of units that you say they should apply to or should it be to all? Well, you know, a uh, place to start the conversation would be new construction in the city of Vancouver could meet that standard. Uh, I also will interject here. I think it's very important to have vacancy control at the same time as well. That would also exert downward pressure on land values and uh, and discourage the uh, uh, the uh, real estate investment trusts from picking up our existing uh, affordable units because that's an, a very important part. But to the specifics of your question, I think on new developments, it's not inconceivable at all, as far as I can figure out, for us to be moving from a 20% affordability up to a 50% affordability, and then do, and then also have a more calibrated approach in terms of our real need is two bedroom, three bedroom units. So, you know, uh, uh, that becomes part of the calculus. Uh, can you get uh, a two bedroom or three bedroom unit for every market three bedroom unit? I don't know, maybe that'd be great. Or maybe it's one and a half uh, units, uh, one bedroom units that generate <clears throat> a three bedroom unit or something like that. I mean, you've got great staff there that can figure these things out and working with the development community and, and land economists try to understand the, the vagaries of this issue that I'm, I'm bringing to the table about how to, how to manage residual price. You know, even Tom Davidoff, who I don't often agree with, was talking about similar things when he talked about, uh, you know, calibrating the CACs and other taxes on the project to the point where the market still delivers it. In that sense, I'm talking about the same thing, but I think I'm talking about something more aggressive than he usually okay, is so, uh, mentioning. So you're talking about two things then. Um, if I, I'm just correct me if I'm wrong. Um, one is um, is decreasing the threshold. Currently, the threshold in our inclusionary zoning is, I don't know, was it 200 units? I can't remember. So it's some amount where you have to have so many units before it applies. But you're saying, like, just from, like, all all development, correct me if I'm wrong on that, and that it's... Um, no, you're right. Okay. And and it's one, for, it's one for one. So it would go from our inclusionary right. zoning is 20% right now, so it's 20% to 50%, right? That's right. Okay. And um, you're already so, considering. Go ahead. Yeah. So sorry. just just to, to sorry, ask you another question. Bring you. Your oh, I only have three time. minutes. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm out of time. Darn. I'll contact you with other questions. Thank you. Okay. okay finally, we do have Councillor Swanson uh, for questions. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Patrick. Um, if right. you were moving from the twenty percent to the fifty percent, would you do it all at once? Yes. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> there is theory and there is practice. And in theory, I would say yes. Uh, uh, but the, the underlying issue here is how do you manage land price inflation? 
So going to 50% would put downward pressure on land price inflation. Now, it might take a certain amount of time for the, to, to what I call discipline the land market, because the current land market in the city of Vancouver is assuming uh, unlimited increases in value. That, and they are making that assumption because council is, is encouraging them to, to see it that way. But uh, it would take uh, a strong conviction of council to say that's, that was yesterday. Uh, from this day forward, we have a different strategy. And okay. in time, the, the land market would respond. Let me try and squeeze in another question here. Um, the previous speaker said that uh, basically market, market doesn't create gentrification. Do you think that gentrification is something we should be worried about? Yes, I think we're gentrifying the whole city at the moment, and it, and it has to do with the issues that I'm talking about. It doesn't have to do with a particular building in a particular neighborhood. That is definitely going on. And in terms of the research, you know, us, us academics like to argue these points all day long. So there's plenty of evidence that gentrification is actually a problem and that adding new market density has a negative impact on affordability. There's also other studies that show the reverse, and that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, thank thanks you. for coming. Thank you, Councilor Swanson, and thank you very much. Patrick, those are all your questions. My pleasure. And next, we have a speaker who is here in person, uh, John Rose. Thank you very much. I'll, uh, in the interest of time, spare the uh, pleasantries of introducing myself, uh, apart from just saying I'm an urban geographer at Kwantlen Polytechnic University, although I'm not representing them formally. I am interested in speaking about the housing needs report, uh, which I think uh, as an 88 page report is going to engender agreement with some items, disagreement with others, and maybe questions about yet other elements of it. Um, it's a conventional report in many respects, but also radical. And I wanna focus on that latter component here in my presentation today, because what I find radical about the housing needs report is that it organizes our understanding of housing and supply and demand um, in a way that makes supply rather more active, where we think then about supply, not just simply as responsive to demand, but actually actively inducing and shaping demand. And in this way then, uh, the housing needs report is an indictment of housing suppliers. Uh, the claim essentially is, is twofold, that housing suppliers have been unwilling to provide a sufficient quantity of units to meet the need for housing on an ongoing basis, and secondly, that they've been unwilling to provide a sufficient quality of units to meet housing needs in terms of affordability, suitability, and adequacy uh, for both current and future residents of the city. Let me talk about those two things in turn, the quantity argument. So an explicit and at times implicit argument in the housing needs report is that there's an insufficient quantity of housing in the city of Vancouver and that this has restricted the number of people and the number of households in the city. And in part, this serves as justification for future projections of housing demand of 50,000 units versus, say, 35,000. Although, of course, other considerations, increased international immigration for one, I see that's no longer a dirty word here, uh, have been articulated in that report as well. In the past, I've questioned this critique of housing suppliers at the CMA level, finding that considering new construction, uh, net new construction and intensification of existing structures, Dwelling unit growth in Vancouver, Metro, significantly outpaced household number growth, 119 to 100 for the 2001 to 2016 period. Now, for the city of Vancouver, that ratio over that period of time is even more striking. 126 dwelling units added for every 100 households added. So it's hard for me to see how past quantity supplied in and of itself has served as a limiting factor to population and household growth. But this data and my position is consistent with the province's expert panel on the future of housing affordabilities assessment, that we have an inelastic supply of housing. Namely, that suppliers are willing to provide a high quantity of housing units, but only at high prices. Essentially, the law of supply on steroids, given that price is the independent variable and quantity is the dependent variable. In other words, quantity increases in response to price increases. 
But if there is a case to be made that quantity of housing has been somehow deficient, we should ask why suppliers have been unwilling to provide such units. Secondly, on the quality side, significantly the housing needs report also discusses as a significant focus and a significant component of housing need existing unmet housing demand. So housing that does not meet the needs of affordability, suitability, and adequacy. So we are well past the point now of saying any housing is good housing and celebrating five kids, one condo as some kind of desirable new normal in housing occupancy. As a participant in the consultation process, and thank you to the planning staff for that, I was surprised, uh, even shocked, to see in this final report figures of 86,000 households in need, essentially double you know, the 38,200 to 46,200 sums in draft reports. Figures are shocking, but I understand that working out these numbers has been an ongoing process. And certainly the overall picture painted by the housing needs report is in and of itself not surprising. We know there is a dysfunctional housing supply situation in Vancouver. Suppliers are not willing to provide housing that meets the needs of current, let alone future residents of the city. So turning from housing needs um, to targets, how do we address this inelastic supply of housing problem? Uh, in the past, I've been critical of justifications for targets in the Housing Vancouver strategy. Um, where people have cited unmet demand and have kind of wondered, well, where does that demand come from and how does that immediately translate into a target? So I'm very pleased to see in the housing needs report, and I want to emphasize it here, that housing, <laughs> sorry, my apologies, that housing needs are not housing targets and that housing needs may be met by measures other than net new construction. Although I have to say I'm a little bit uh, disturbed to see some of the discussion here today immediately go from needs into targets without really thinking about what occurs in between those two. Take thank you very thank much. Thank you, John. Um, appreciate you timing yourself as well. Um, <laughs> uh, we have questions. First up, Councillor Hardwick. Thank you, John. Um, one of the key things that's been discussed here today is the difference between zone capacity and development capacity, and this is something that, that you've focused on in the past. Could you uh, talk a little bit about that to, to help us understand the difference from your perspective? Right. Um, I agree with um, what planning staff has said in, in several respects. Uh, insofar as, for example, zone capacity does not instantly mean, let's say if you had capacity on paper for an additional, let's say, 500,000 housing units, that doesn't mean instantly you're going to get 500,000 housing units or perhaps even uh, a significant fraction of that. Um, but, you know, it is part of our discourse around housing in Metro Vancouver. And so one of the reasons I've been interested in trying to find data on zone capacity as well as development capacity, and I appreciate uh, several of the councillors uh, probing questions to try and get at, you know, what exactly development capacity entails. Uh, one of the reasons I've focused on zone capacity is it's been a big part of the discourse, the narrative around housing here, whereby the city has been implicated by you know, groups like Abundant Zoning Vancouver um, to say you haven't, or sorry, Abundant Housing Vancouver, to say that you haven't had enough zone capacity to reduce the inflationary pressures on land. In other words, that if you had the entire city covered by blanket up zoning, this would create more competition among existing property owners so that when it comes time to sell, developers would be able to purchase land more cheaply and presumably pass along those savings to prospective homeowners. So I find, you know, some of the, some of the, um, the downplaying of the importance of zone capacity here to be, um, you know, unfortunate because it is a huge part of the discussion around zoning in Vancouver and um, it bears investigation. So the logic being that um, there's been, a, we've heard a tremendous amount of zoning, rezoning done over the last number of years, which has led in, in part to the, um, significant increases in land value and property value. So if we've got all of that zone capacity um, and every time we rezone more, we're increasing land values, we're kind of, it's a self-defeating proposition. Well, I suppose to uh, put myself in the, in the shoes of the critics, they would say that um, sort of spot rezoning or sort of, you know, this ongoing process of having to submit a zoning uh, permit application to upzone 
um, doesn't solve the, the land inflation problem. Their argument would be, you know, you need widespread upzoning uh, to then, as I say, increase the potential pool of sellers who presumably then are competing amongst themselves for the business of the development industry, and, you know, that competition will drive down prices. Now, I think that's kind of an untested, um, in some respects, that's like an untested assertion. Um, because we know in general, you know, upzoning is going to make the land worth, you know, the highest and best use. Um, so the argument would be that blanket upzoning is different than kind of the conditional sort of uh, spot upzoning, but I think that uh, has to be tested and interrogated. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I uh, took my eye off the ball on the timing there. Thank you very much, Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Carr. Great. Thanks so much for coming. Really appreciate it. Um, and your work on the subject. Uh, so you said at the very beginning that, that housing suppliers focus on high prices and that they are unwilling to meet um, the actual needs. To me, it's fairly obvious they're making more money if they focus on the high prices. Um, so first of all, there is a difference, I'm, I'm assuming in, in your own mind, but you, you didn't say it, so I'm interested, that there are some suppliers Nonprofit societies, social housing society, co-ops that do do this because they have a different motive. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. But right. I would say, if you don't mind me extending the answer, yes, go ahead. That this focus on non-market housing and non-market suppliers, I find very interesting because, in a way, it's an indictment of the market. Right? The market is not providing affordable housing. Um, and I think it's kind of perverse that we sit here and we talk about like the share of housing that should be below market versus market. And we're just looking to get 20% of affordable housing or 50% of affordable housing. Um, why isn't the market providing affordable housing? Uh, yeah. Why is there this disconnect between the prices that are being asked and which are baked into the land values um, and, and what people can afford? Yeah, okay. Okay, so good. I, I agree. <laughs> We've got at least a section of the uh, of the housing supplier um, field that does it. So how do we <clears throat> how do we require what are the best ways in your mind to require the others housing providers, the regular market based mm -hmm. housing providers to do what they won't do of their own volition, which is to supply um, to create supply for those who are in the lower um, income brackets. Absolutely. That's a great question. Um, uh, at the very end of my presentation, and I cut it short because I knew I was short on time, my phone told me that. Um, I was going to mention a quote from a local developer um, on social media in one of those typical Vancouver exchanges. He said, you can give me the land for free, but I and every other developer are still going to charge a market price for our product. In other words, the price is going to be to the, the highest bidder. Mm -hmm. um, and so where, where, who are these people that are being catered to uh, when you have a $1.5 million townhouse or a million dollar condominium? What is the market for that? Um, because it does seem to be so decoupled from what local incomes would suggest, and many people have pointed out, would be actually affordable for local residents. So I do, I am convinced that there has to be actual meaningful action, probably beyond the purview of the municipal level, unfortunately, uh, to really deal with the demand. We've seen that federally, but I think those have been pretty much half measures. Okay, thank you. Um, we will need to move to uh, our next councillor, uh, Councillor DiGenova. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm just trying to reconcile the vacancy rate in Vancouver, considering your what you've said about there being enough supply. The supply isn't the issue. So supply isn't the issue. Why do we have such a low vacancy rate? That's a great question. Um, so the the number is like 126. Or 100, sorry, the city of Vancouver, 126 housing units added for every hundred households added. Now, that could be on top of an existing kind of scarce supply. In other words, you're, you might have had a lower rate to begin with and then a larger rate afterwards. Um, so it's a little, it, it can be somewhat misleading, but one of the big missing elements, I think, on the data side is data on the secondary rental market, right? So we hear a lot about like low vacancies for the primary rental market, 
Um, but we don't really have a lot of data, at least that I have seen, on the vacancy rates in the secondary uh, rental market. Well, if you go on Craigslist, I can tell you that the units that you can get, I mean, you can get a closet for like $1,000. I've, I've, it's concerning to me. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously, if there was an overwhelming supply of that, then we wouldn't see the prices as high as we see them now. So, so I'm just trying to understand, and I appreciate numbers, uh, I, how we reconcile the vacancy rate, even in secondary rental suites, with the cost of housing and the scarcity of it. So how can we say that we have enough supply if these are our vacancy rates and these rents are being charged? Because if we had adequate supply, then we would see rents come down. But supply follows price, right? Price is the independent variable. You get more supply when the price increases. And I'm just kind of concerned about this idea that there's going to be people who will just continually oversupply the market. Um, and this then is going to kind of create some kind of glut that's going to drive down uh, prices. Um, when, I, when I was in, like, when I was uh, in university, you mm -hmm. could get a two-bedroom uh, rental suite in... Uh, in, in a you know secured rental building for eight hundred and fifty to thousand dollars a month, depending on you know what you were mm. getting. Yeah. Now you can can't even get a one bedroom, maybe even a studio for that. So, do you think that there's not you think there's still adequate supply when it comes to rental housing? I'm not here to defend the industry. What I'm saying is that if there isn't adequate supply, I mean, I've argued numbers that say, you know, the rate of dwelling unit growth has exceeded the rate of household growth. Uh, so something must, be, in terms of like the occupied by the occupied by the regular you know, residents of the of the unit. Um, so I've argued that the number of units supplied has exceeded, the growth rate has exceeded the rate of people occupying those units. That's an aggregate figure though, right? For the entire metro or for the entire city. And so that may, <laughs> there may be very low vacancy, there could be very low vacancy rates in one type of housing and a higher vacancy rate in another type. Thanks so much. Thank That's you very much time. for wrapping up that answer. So th th those are the end of all of your questions. Thank you very much, John, for being Appreciate here it. Thank being you. here in person. Um, we have next on the line, uh, speaker number four, Brian Palmquist. Thank you. Um, I'm speaking in opposition to this report. You can hear me okay? We can hear you. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I was initially excited when I electronically cracked open this 158-page report. I've seen a report of this size and title would answer the questions I've been struggling with for at least the past year. What progress are we making in housing, especially affordable housing? What housing are we producing and what's still missing from the mix? And how well are we doing and how can we do better? Sadly, this report answers none of these questions in a researched, defensible way. My time as a citizen speaking to council is very limited, so I'm gonna get right to it. On the matter of what progress are we making in housing, especially affordable housing, the answers can only be, we just don't know. The 2021 housing approvals section of the report, starting on page 20, has nice bar charts, but unlike reports prepared by housing experts such as CMHC and most of our universities, the basis for these bar charts is not explained. There's no way for anybody to determine how the charts were generated. So I must set these aside, and you should too, until and unless their basis is explained, referencing data that a member of the public like me can get to and understand. Regarding the question of what housing are we producing and what's still missing from the mix, the report early on injects a bit of mystery. Figure two on page 10 tells us there is a 10-year pipeline from 2021 through 31 that includes 51,000 units of housing. But nowhere is the origin of this number explained. I actually searched the number across the report and also the word pipeline, assuming that the, the long report would educate me about what's portrayed as an important estimate of work in progress, except it doesn't. Rather than giving up entirely, I instead looked at my Homes for Whom database, which tracks the more than 380 spot rezonings commenced since the current council was elected. My database exists because city staff will not provide councillors, let alone ordinary citizens, with aggregate data around spot rezonings. It does not include the incremental housing that's built when a homeowner or developer adds a laneway house, a duplex, or a secondary suite or redevelops within existing zoning regulations. My numbers just include specific upzonings that occur all over the city. After carefully reviewing my data, all of it extracted from the city's own Shape Your City websites, I discovered different numbers. 
Just over 22,000 homes have had their spot rezonings approved by this council. That's a six-year supply that's not been built yet. An additional 21,000 homes have had their spot rezonings in progress. That's an additional six-year supply that's not been built yet. So now we are up to a 12-year supply of housing based on population projections by Metro Vancouver, CMHC, and other experts who have made their data publicly available. But we're not done yet. In addition to the 12-year supply of spot rezoned homes approved or in process, we have the Northeast Falls Creek, Sanok, Jericho Lands, the Broadway Plan, and most recently that I'm aware of, Skeena Terrace. I may have missed some. Together, these projects will provide at least 57,000 homes by their proponents and city staff's own estimates, albeit over a longer than 10-year horizon. In total, this represents an additional 26-year supply. Add these up and it comes to exactly 100,000 homes with spot, spot rezoning completed, in progress, or tabled but not formally applied for as yet. That's a 38-year supply, not including already zoned incremental development such as laneways, duplexes, and secondary suites. Finally, regarding how well we're doing and how can we do better, I only wish I knew. The report offers little help, none of it explained, footnoted, or otherwise informative. Figure 1 on page 8 of the report asks me to truly believe that fully one-quarter of Vancouverites are living in affordable, unsuitable, or inadequate housing without any credible evidence beyond because we say so. The same figure one expects me to believe that the future housing demand in Vancouver will be 50% more than any projections by Metro Vancouver or Statistics Canada. I know full well that we have significant housing issues, but overestimating them without factual evidence helps nobody. In conclusion, the 51,000 unit pipeline in figure two has no attribution. It makes us feel guilty because it is below aspirational targets that only exist because staff says so. Council's already approved or has in progress more than the report's 10-year horizon uh, based on projections by data experts such as Metro Vancouver, CMHC, and Stats Canada. Thereafter, rezonings below the horizon represents enough housing to last until 2060, not including the Vancouver plan. But barely 20% of that 58-year supply is identified as any kind of rental, and that 20% includes social housing, below market rental, secured, and market rental. I urge you to send this report back to staff and insist they return with something that will not embarrass council and upset its electors. Thank you. Thank you. You do have questions uh, from Councillor Hardwick. Please go ahead. Thank you, Brian. And thank you for the work you do gathering the data that we still look forward to receiving. Um, in terms of, uh, I've been going through the slideshow again. Uh, there was an emphasis placed on a need for diverse communities. And there's a slide, um, 2021 approved housing for diverse communities. Have you seen um, that slide and those particular developments in your, in your data that you've been collecting? Um, well, yes, I have. And, and when, I, when I saw that slide, I, I, it perked my, my, it piqued my, my interest. So I went to the city's building permit database and the city's Shape Your City database. And here's what I discovered. 70, 1766 Francis, which is housing for uh, indigenous, social housing for indigenous people, had its first building permit applied for six months ago and it's not issued yet. 516 East 13th, which is social housing for seniors, women and lone parents, had its rezoning approved in July 2021. No building permit has even been applied for nine months later. 8725 French Street has been in for its first permit for six months, and that's social housing for seniors, families, and the disabled. 338 East 2nd took 13 months to get its first permit, and that's market rental and live work studios. And 322 East 15th took 14 months to get its first uh, permit, and that's ground-oriented family housing. So as I've said in, in, in comments made elsewhere, Part of our problem in getting uh, affordable housing or housing of any kind is the incredible amount of time it takes to get it. Forget the rezoning process and forget the provincial government saying that they should uh, uh, obviate the, the need for, for rezoning that, that, uh, uh, that meets ODP or OCP requirements. Um, we, when we get to that point, it's still taking an average, uh, I did this calculation recently, an average of two years between the time a rezoning is approved 
and the first permit, first permit, which is usually digging a hole in the ground, is actually issued. And that's the city of Vancouver, an average of two years over over 380, pro, well, 200 projects, sorry. Thank you very much. I'm going to run out of time, but um, as you know, the regional growth strategy attributed 32,000 uh, households over the decade versus the 72,000 uh, from the Housing Vancouver strategy. Why do you think the city would set targets that are more than double projections from the region? In just 10 uh, seconds, Brian. Uh, possibly in the hope that somebody in the development community will take it upon themselves to actually create this. Thank you. Short answer to a lot of questions. Thank you very much for making that work. Uh, that brings us to the end of your questions, Brian, but thank you very much for being here. My pleasure. Uh, next, we have uh, speaker number five, M. Wickman. Hi, good afternoon, Mayor. Well, there's no mayor, but assistant mayor and councillors. I'm Marlene from Vancouver. I'm a mom. I am uh, not a housing expert, and I have slides. Are they available? Just give us just a moment, um, Marlene. I haven't started your timer yet. We're just going to pull them up. Okay, they are up. You can start whenever Wonderful. you're ready. Okay, so I'm wanting to discuss a segment of the, the Vancouver Housing Report about the missing families in the middle. Okay, so the, the strategy in the report is based on three core principles. One, shift the city's housing development pipeline towards right supply. Two, protect and retain existing rental stock. And three, ensure support for the city's most marginalized residents and disproportionately impacted communities. This inspires several comments. Uh, slide two, please. Housing forms need to be equitably distributed throughout Metro Vancouver, not just in Vancouver. As you can see, many cities are not building much rental housing at all. I believe these same communities are not providing adequate housing for low-income individuals, and they need to provide their fair share of this type of housing. Next slide, please. As you can see, um, in well, this is still 2016 uh, stats. Uh, Vancouver residents have 53% renters, and in Metro Vancouver, it's 36%. Point two, rent has increased disproportionately to income from 2011 to 2021, with increases of 45% in Vancouver and more than 50% across the region. Uh, slide four, please. The right supply for families is not adequately addressed and they are disproportionately impacted, especially lower income families. Uh, it is, and as you can see from this, um, this graph, Vancouver has less families with uh, children than uh, the rest of Metro, 30% in Vancouver and 41%. And that's pretty much since uh, 1981. So it is vital that these families have equity, which means having improved opportunities for right-sized housing where children can bring friends home and parents know what's going on in their lives, more opportunities for different schools, activities, friends, and employment that broaden horizons and stimulate new goals for the future. Larger family-sized units allow for aging in place and less need to move. The report states future housing demand is for 50,000 households or 85,000 people over the next 10 years, which amounts to 1.7 people per household, which are not family size numbers. Slide five, please. There is a stated goal of 42% of the proposed 70,000, 72,000 new homes being family oriented with two or more bedrooms with two thirds being rental. Uh, however, to know how many actual family size units of three or more bedrooms, I had to um, make my own calculations. I don't, I, I didn't provide those, um, those uh, slides of those different types of um, approved units for 2021. But however, in my next slide, slide th uh, six, I made my percentages. So non-market housing, two bedrooms, 21%, three bedrooms, 7%. Purpose-built rentals, two bedrooms, 31%, three bedrooms, 6%. Condos, two bedrooms, 37%, three bedrooms, 10%. So in total, 8,079 units, 32%, two bedroom, 3%, three bedroom, 
um, negligible four bedroom and 1% townhouse. So in actual fact, 9% of new housing units are family sized. Uh, slide seven, um, please. Um, in, in looking at housing types by tenure based on the 2016 census data, twice as many uh, families are in owned units versus rental units. So to try to um, parse out uh, the families in these numbers, I made a, another slide. So the next slide, please. So for uh, renters, uh, about 20% of them are families and for owners, about 44% are families. So overall, this matches a 31% family from the, the uh, 2020 social indicator report. So to achieve housing equity with owners, renting families would need double the number of family-sized three-bedroom units. So at least another 29,000 are required. So this information is not obtained in the 44 participants in the housing focus groups or elements taken out of the Vancouver plan, Broadway plan, secured rental policy engagement. Um, this methodology could be considered to be democratic if you're motivated to find out about these groups and participate. However, they aren't representative of people trying to finish work, prepare a meal, get homework done, and get their kids to bed. No one from the city is soliciting opinions from people that are associated with unions, professionals, societies, or at the grocery store. So how to achieve family-sized housing goals? Well, you need to define the size and the bedroom count required properly. You Marlene, that does bring us to yes. your five minutes. So uh, if you have one sentence to wrap up, we're going to have to close there. You do have questions, though, so you will have oh, an opportunity. Okay, sure, sure. Okay, okay well, you Let's need 30% with... and not 9%, and more family-sized rental could curb enthusiasm for building excessive and more profitable studio and one-bedroom apartments. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay great. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hardwick. Thank you, Marlene. Um, so your, your core message to us today is that this uh, report is paying insufficient attention to the needs of family housing. Is that accurate? Well, yes. Okay, yes. Most people still would like to have a house they can't uh, afford one. So what's your next best option is do you actually have like a unit that mimics the size and the function of a house? All right, and actually these things aren't being produced and you they kind of gloss over putting oh two and more bedrooms all together in one lump. But I don't know how many families are actually in the, the two bedrooms. You could have roommates, you could have a person that likes to have a lot of stuff, you could have a couple with no kids. You actually don't know how those are two bedroom units are being used. And if you actually have kids, okay, they need a place to sleep in, they need to have a room to have all their junk and the room that's the farthest away from you so you can actually like sleep at night. You need you need that physical space. And you know, we've had decades of lots of one bedroom and, and studio apartments being produced. Well, people don't want those. Those that can move out, you know, into Metro Vancouver do that because the apartments are bigger, they're relatively, you know, cheaper. Okay. So, you know, we've created a problem for decades by, by you know, building the wrong size of housing. They're having more commuters because they've gone out, you know, elsewhere to find the right size housing for them. So, I think we need to kind of prioritize that, okay, well, we need to have right size housing for family. We need to have a better distribution of the, the different types of housing sizes across Metro. I thought we were supposed to have some Metro plan for, for transit and housing now. So there actually should be some plan to get the families back in and have, uh, you know, more equitable proportions of all the, the type of, um, you know, groups of people in the lower mainland. You do acknowledge um, that the mean average uh, household size has been declining uh, regularly. Well, yes. Well, yeah. Like, well, yes. Well, where are you going to reproduce and have children? You're going to go to Surrey. They have at least like three plus children. Okay. So this is, you know, this is what you're going to have if you, you know, have the wrong type of housing. Okay. And there are people that are having children. Now the report is, uh, makes some mention about, uh, you know, Arabic groups or some other newer um, you know, uh, groups that are coming to Canada, well, they have lots of, they have lots of kids, you know, and they're not going to come here because there's no place to put those kids. So they're out in Maple Ridge or wherever out there. I know a social worker that, uh, you know, was dealing with refugees. Yeah, they're out, they're out in Maple Ridge. So, you know, we can, you know, have families with kids, you know, there's all kinds of people moving to Canada, but if you don't have the right housing for them, they're not going to come here. Great. I'm just at my time. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Marlene. Those are all your questions. Okay, great. Uh, next, we have speaker number six, Marika Albert. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marika Albert, and I'm here today to voice support for the Housing Needs Report. I am here in my role as Policy Director of the BC Nonprofit Housing Association, speaking on behalf of our members from the nonprofit sector to show support for the findings in the City of Vancouver's Housing Needs Report, and also as a resident and renter in the City of Vancouver with a keen interest in seeing housing solutions delivered across the city. As an association, we represent more than 500 nonprofit housing providers operating affordable housing across the province and are closely collaborating with many partners in the community housing sector who share our vision to offer safe, secure, and affordable homes for everyone. And a significant portion of our members operate housing in Vancouver. To begin, I want to recognize the hard work of this council and City of Vancouver staff for the record number of social housing approvals and market rental approvals over the past year. What's even more exciting for us is the record number of social housing completions. These units will make an essential contribution to the non-market and market rental housing stock across the city. However, we know that these units will only scratch the surface of addressing current and future housing need, as was made abundantly clear in the Housing Needs Report. We know the majority of residents of Vancouver are facing significant challenges with affordability and securing appropriate housing that meets their needs. Our research shows this, and so does the Housing Needs Report. The motto of our research and policy department at BCMPHA is what gets measured gets done. And in order for communities to effectively and appropriately address housing need into the future, planning needs to be based on robust evidence of current need and thoughtful projections on future need. While the need projections outlined in the Housing Needs Report may appear alarming to some, it is important to note a few important details. One, while the 2016 census data are the most recent census data we have available, we all know that these data do not account for the significant changes we've seen uh, in the housing market and the city since 2016. Soaring housing prices, a global pandemic, and economic growth have meant the need continues to grow at an unprecedented rate across the city. We anticipate that the 2021 census data are released. The data will show that need continues to increase in severity and complexity, and it will come as no surprise to us that the estimates provided in the housing needs report and our own previous estimates will perhaps be an underestimate. Two, housing, future housing need projections are based on what we know now. But what we've learned from the last two censuses is that often our assumptions around tenure and shifting housing trends surprise us. Between the 2020, uh, 2011 and 2016 censuses, BC and PHA noted an important shift in housing tenure trends. When previously we had assumed that there was a tenure trajectory based on the life cycle, young people rent, then they move into middle age and home ownership, and then perhaps move into rentals again when they reach old age. The 2016, 2016 census showed that more people were staying in rental situations having been priced out of home ownership, indicating that the current supply of market and non-market housing will not be able to accommodate this trend. The City of Vancouver's Housing Needs Report provides a strong basis from which to anticipate these types of shifting trends. Finally, our current housing system is suffering from years of neglect and lack of, lack of investment into non-market and market rental housing stock. This means communities are having to play catch up while at the same time anticipating future demand. In our 2017 Affordable Housing Plan for BC, we noted that we needed to build 80,000 units of rental housing across the province to address this backlog of housing need. And then on top of that, we needed an additional 70,000 units over 10 years. In order to fully and completely address the housing crisis, is it essential to account for this backlog? And we feel that the housing needs report does this, which is why the, the need projections appear so high. The pandemic has made it abundantly clear that providing adequate housing for all of our community members doesn't just mean safety and security for individuals, but also ensures the safety of entire communities. We all know that our region will continue to grow in the coming years and decades. And to accommodate this continued growth, we need a robust and affordable housing system that includes continued adequate and diverse supply. The Housing Needs Report does an excellent job of taking into account the shifting demographics of the city, demonstrating that residents of the city require a diverse array of housing options from the unit size to cost to ensure that the most impacted households, particularly those with low incomes and households from equity denied groups such as Indigenous and racialized households, can access housing that meets their needs. We acknowledge that the City of Vancouver will not be able to address housing need alone and that other orders of government will need to come to the table to address the housing crisis. But I'm pleased to say that the community housing sector is ready and willing to partner and collaborate to be an essential part of robust responses to address housing need across the city. I'm happy to add the name of BC Nonprofit Housing Association to the support for the findings of the City of Vancouver's Housing Needs Report. We need robust data and evidence to inform planning for the future. Thank you for your time today.
Thank you very much. Perfectly timed. You do have questions, Councillor Boyle. Okay. Yes, thanks so much for taking the time. I'm wondering um, what you would recommend we as a as a council can do to make it easier for your sector to be building more uh, non-market housing um, and more affordable non-market housing, more more housing and, and more deeply affordable housing, both of those pieces. Um, thank you for the question. I mean, we um, we were really uh, excited to see the sh uh, the policy change that happened in the city of Victoria. Um, and although I know that um, that is attached to their OCP, and the city of Vancouver does not have that plan, um, that fast tracking and not um, and ensuring that there is needs to be no rezoning hearings attached to nonprofit housing development, we think is an essential step towards making sure that we can fast track that development and bring those units um, to fruition. Um, also, inclusionary zoning is something that we are we see as, as helpful, not only um, because it, uh, it aligns you know, with our mission to provide affordable housing units, but it also means that there are contributions from uh, the private sector uh, to realize uh, the vision of affordable housing as well. So um, those two pieces, I think, you know, policy change is really essential, but we also need, um, we also need uh, support from other levels of government as well, and we have been working with them to make sure that those supports are in place for our members who are poised and ready to develop. And one more thing I'd like to add is just that uh, it has been referenced uh, a number of times um, through through this discussion today that the development process itself, approvals and, and permitting, um, the length of time it takes to do that often uh, increases in, uh, the cost of the development itself. And what happens is that that often will then be downloaded onto uh, the folks who will be living in those units. So that's even in the case for uh, sun, uh, under, um, excuse me, sorry, um, just below market rentals in particular. But we see that um, as the time ticks on, more and more money uh, is is needed to actually finish the development. And so we are, we're looking to, uh, we're excitedly anticipating and hoping that we would see some sort of um, support for nonprofit housing developers moving forward through policy change. Okay, I appreciate that. I have one question for you about the Victoria uh, policy change. When I, I brought a similar approach um, to council a year ago, which the BC Nonprofit Housing Association supported, there was quite a bit of discussion about the definition of affordable housing. But my understanding when Victoria made the change was that they didn't have a set um, floor or definition Boyle, of affordability. Mm -hmm. Boyle, oh, it's I'm just three minutes. I'm sorry. Yes, I thought it was five. Yes. No, it's three I'm minutes. I'm so sorry. Uh, Marika, I'll send you that question um, offline and can circulate the answer oh, to that council. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Swanson. Yeah, if, uh, thanks for coming and uh, thanks for building nonprofit housing that we desperately need. <laughs> Um, if we had zoning that allowed nonprofits to have three times the zoning as profit making companies to keep mm -hmm. the land price down, could nonprofits build housing for people in the 50 to 80K range on those sites? Uh, <laughs> that's a really good question. I mean, I don't have uh, specifics in front of me, but I think it would certainly go a long way. Um, Councillor Swanson in um, increasing affordability um, and it would help deliver more units and it would help um, spread the cost over the entirety of the building. And so I think that that could be a very helpful solution. Okay. Um, you've probably seen a study by Steve Pomeroy about how we're losing affordability 15 times as fast as we're replacing it. I wonder if that's yeah. uh, brought you guys at the Nonprofit Housing Association around to vacancy control or targeted vacancy control at all. Yeah, I'm happy that you asked that question. Um, we are we are actually currently uh, in the last week or so having our own internal discussions about what our position on vacancy control is. And while we don't have a, a set position yet, we are certainly exploring it and really recognize that vacancy control does have a, a really important impact on affordability um, in the rental market. And so stay tuned for that. 
Okay, and just maybe to follow up on Councillor Boyle's okay. question about the Victoria motion not defining affordability, <laughs> would you find that useful? And what would the result of it be in whether or not the housing was actually affordable to folks in the 50 to 80K range? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I suspect that what was the case there was that there was, um, because the sense of, because of affordability shifts over time, right? So, um, and it is, you know, often connected to our levels of income. And so, and what's happening in the market. So I could see why the city of Victoria would be reluctant to actually place um, any kind of specific floor or measure on that uh, to avoid um, to avoid not being able to account for those shifts. However, um, in terms of ensuring that we see that those types of, of units being developed, it might be helpful to include at least some sort of guidelines around what affordable might be. It may be based on proportion of rent, uh, you know, of, of housing costs to um, the income of the household, or it may be based on, on, on other factors. Uh, but I think that that could be, uh, it, it, I think it, it, providing frameworks for that can be very helpful, and also in terms of tracking. Okay, that's just Thanks right so much. Time. Sorry. Thank you. And you have questions? Uh, one more counselor on the list as of right now. Counselor Carr, over to you. Great, thanks. Yeah, I got Thank on, the, on the list before Councillor Boyle um, asked her, uh, her question that she didn't get the time to completely ask. So I'm going to ask that same question, <laughs> uh, which, is, okay. which is around um, uh, what happened uh, or, or the, um, what happened when Councillor Boyle had tabled a motion earlier and a lot of public <laughs> debate a year ago, a lot of public debate around um, around the definition of affordability, saying that mm -hmm. it's only thirty percent that is, um, you know, a, at sort of a um, a more affordable rent, and the other seventy percent could be market. I wonder if you can just explain to us um, sort of that definition, which is embedded in our by, in our in our bylaws or our policies. Um, what? Mm -hmm. Why it, is it? That um, and can and do nonprofit providers um, reach for more affordability? What are the oh. sort of limits um, on your ability to do that? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, nonprofit housing providers absolutely reach uh, beyond that, uh, you know, 30 percent, and quite often will look to, um, particularly in rent geared to income units, will look to, look to even re reduce that to, you know, to 20 percent if possible, if if the operating funds are in place and other uh, levels of funding are in place to maintain that deep that deep subsidy. That level of affordability does take some deep subsidy, but our members, you know, work really really hard with all levels of government or closely with BC Housing and the City of Vancouver staff um, to try and make projects work to uh, to, to meet uh, deeper levels of affordability for sure. And the 30% um, threshold was developed uh, through CMHC um, and, it's, and it has become a standard. There are some criticisms around it that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't take into account um, transportation and other, you know, essential costs that come into play when you're living in a community. Um, however, it's, it's, the, it's the measure we have at this point, and so um, that's the one that we use and we see embedded in policy. And it's become a standard, and so that really makes it helpful when we're, when we're trying to track um, and measure what affordability looks like in the experiences of, of, uh, of uh, residents uh, in communities. I'm not sure if that answered your question. It does. Um, so it's embedded in CMHC policy. It's embedded. Mm -hmm. it's, it's embedded also, I gather, in, in a BC housing. That's as, correct. As yeah. the, so that, the definition of social housing at 30% um, of the household geared to income. But anyway, um, and, uh, and and I'm assuming by what you've said that this in. Na oh, I'm out of time. I can't assume anything more. Sorry. <laughs> but thank okay. you so much for coming. Thank you. And thank you, Councillor Carr, uh, for keeping an eye on your time. Those are all your questions, so thank you very much for coming, Rika. Thank you very much. And then our final speaker for this item is uh, speaker number eight, Elizabeth Murphy. Hello? Hi, we can hear can you. you hear me? Yes, you're free to thank start you. whenever you're ready. Thank you. 
so generally I agree that there are many unmet housing needs in the city. However, the problem with the approach of this report is that it recommends doing more of the same, and we can't keep doing the same thing and expect different results. Uh, first, for context, um, Vancouver continues to overbuild expensive new units that average incomes cannot afford while demolishing the older housing that is generally more affordable, livable, and larger in unit size than the new stock. New development is putting inflationary pressure on land values and rental rates, as well as speculation. Based on the 2021 census, uh, the population continues to grow at an average of about 1% per year, as it has for the last 40 years, and this is in spite of record levels of immigration. Vancouver has been uh, building 20% more units than population growth would support. There continues to be 20. 3,000 empty dwellings uh, unoccupied by usual residents. Uh, the assumption that build it and they will come is just not happening. However, the downtown is now the densest in Canada with 18, over 18,000 um, inhabitants per square kilometer in the 2021 census. For comparison, Manhattan, New York is 28,000 uh, in 2020. Other top places in Canada are Toronto at 16,000, Montreal at 8,000, and uh, Calgary at 7,000, and Hamilton at, at 6,900. So this doesn't include the approximately 900 units under construction that staff have mentioned, but uh, prices of housing and rents continue to escalate. Uh, the densest cities also tend to have more extremes in poverty and wealth and gaps in infrastructure. Vancouver neighborhoods are already having amenity defi deficiencies. Many local schools are at full capacity, such as downtown. Completion for entrance by lottery often uh, forces unlucky students to commute across town. Rezoned areas such as Northway, Fraserlands, and Camby Corridor still require increased amenities and services. The approach in this report is to take unmet housing needs and just add them on top of the enormous capacity currently in the pipeline that is causing much of the pressure on affordability. Then on top of that, the report assumes that the needed housing will be provided through density bonusing of yet more unaffordable housing that even adds more unsustainable growth and development pressure. So in other words, the proposed solution is more of the problem. Many of the new market rentals are on the market and the vacancy rates for new units are much higher than the overall older existing rentals. But it is not bringing down rental rates uh, for new units in spite of higher vacancy rates. And I have a theory for that but don't have time to explain it. But for example, in the Bren Hill development in, in Yale Town it's, it, that was approved in 2016 and uh, completed and marketed since July of 2021, uh, the affordable uh, rental units are advertised at 2200 a month for 450 square foot studio with the maximum of one person to 6200 uh, <clears throat> a month for 1000 square foot one bedroom maximum three three people uh, condos at uh, 730000 for 466 square feet studio to 3 million for a 1700 or almost 1,800 square foot, three bedroom. Um, <clears throat> so these are definitely not uh, affordable, um, but they're just sitting there empty until um, until uh, they they get absorbed. So housing needs report um, has a, a number of. Um, uh, it refers to the provincial requirements for housing needs re reports, and the the province um, says that um, one of the requirements is uh, considering the most recently collected information and housing needs report when amending official community plans and regional growth strategies. Now uh, this report is not including the 2021 census data being released today. It is primarily based on outdated 2016 data, so this needs report doesn't meet this requirement for the most um, recently available. And two, um, further
other provincial requirements. Elizabeth, that does bring us to the end of your time. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, is that five minutes? That is five minutes. Oh, okay. Um, but you do have questions, so I will advance okay. Councillor Hardwick. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so um, you're <laughs> suggesting that doing the same thing over and over again, I think, is the uh, definition of insanity. It does beg the existential question in this housing needs report, and, it, and that is, um, why do we promote, do you think, development as opposed to manage development? Uh, well, <laughs> um, that's, um, that is the big question. And, um, and uh, as to uh, why, uh, I, I think that this uh, idea that more supply is somehow going to bring down the uh, costs is um, just not working. And yet, the more it doesn't work, the more they say that there needs to be more supply. So this is the problem, is, is it just keeps begging uh, the question and the answer keeps coming, you know, more of what we're doing. So. Um, and, and also, too, uh, one of the issues with uh, increasing supply, but yet uh, the price is not coming down, for instance, uh, rental rates are considerably higher in the new, more expensive uh, market units, and yet the, the rents are not coming down. And, and part of that is because um, in a, any new rental proje project, or any pro rental project generally, but uh, certainly newer ones with the higher um, mortgages. The lender every year requires an annual review, and they, key, they have to, as part of this review, confirm that the anticipated rents are in fact being met and that the revenue is what is expected. So they often have an incentive to keep a unit vacant um, as long as it takes to rent it at the market rent that that they're required to in order to report back to their their on for their mortgage so there's an inherent baked in need to keep the rents elevated even if they have to leave it vacant for a significant amount of time in order to get those rents so this idea that we're going to flood the market and all the rents are going to come down. That's just not the reality, uh, you know, based on, on how most of these are funded. I only have 10 seconds to go. What, what should we do? Well, um, what I, one of the things that I was uh, going to um, uh, complete with was uh, that the um, provincial requirement for local governments that um, uh, have already been working on their housing needs report before April 2019 may be considered Elizabeth, to have I'm really sorry. Councillor Har Harvick oh, literally sorry. had 10 seconds. So um, oh, sorry. you're welcome okay. to email in that response. <laughs> okay. No worries. We will leave that there. Um, and those are your questions. So thank you very much for coming to speak to Council. Okay. Thank you. I'm Council. happy to move the recommendations, we Chair. Yes, we can have that happen now. Thank you very much, Council Di Genova. So the recommendations have moved. I actually was going to suggest we take a five minute recess. We've been going for about three hours and maybe just stretch our legs, come back and then we can have our discussion. And I'm getting some nods in agreement, so that's great. We'll do that. So we'll come back at um, five minutes past four.
There we go. We're actually good, Councillor Weeb, if you're happy to stay. Yep. And then I believe we had Councillor Di Genova first on the queue, and we are re. Councillor Hardwick was on for questions. Yes. Uh, fair enough, but I believe Councillor Di Genova moved the motion, and then. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to advance Council D. Genova for discussion. Thanks. Um, I'd just like to, before I speak to, to the overall recommendations, I'd like to introduce an amendment that I had sent in to the clerk. So we'll just uh, move over to an amendment queue, Councillor D. Genova, and I'll put you back on the queue to introduce that amendment. Thanks. And, and the amendment states, and I did send this to staff in advance, um, and the council directs staff to consider expanding the expedited process in the social housing or rental tenure, also known as short program, uh, to affordable rental housing that is not classified as social housing and report back with an update in 2023. And this just simply looks at an update because I understand that our staff currently don't have the capacity to do this and to go beyond uh, looking at uh, rental tenure that is not social housing or does not have that deepened affordability. But I would hope that as we move forward that we do see uh, there be a process for rental tenure, even if it's market rental tenure, that it would be put in line before um, strata condo in some cases, unless that were to become more affordable. So that's the intent of my amendment. And again, it's just an update uh, back in 2023 on this. Okay, thank you. Um, Council Swanson. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm not gonna vote for this. I think that we have a dire need for 86,000 people who are in housing need, and I think they should be the priority for our staff. All right, thank you. That's all from you, Councillor Swanson. Yep. And Councillor Di Genova, would you like to close on your amendment? Okay, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to say that I agree with Councillor Swanson that 86,000 people uh, are in dire need, but uh, people who require rental housing may be in more need than people who can't afford uh, strata condo. Uh, and right now, there are some projects that have the same timelines for rental tenure as there are for, for uh, strata condo. And so I'm asking for an update on that because I, I know that we've all committed to moving forward with more rental housing in the city. And I think that it's important we do that and we don't lose the plot. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor Weeb. I want to ask a question through you to staff on this question. Uh, yes, you can go ahead and pose your question. Yeah, uh, my question to staff is, I know this is something we talked about before, is expanding some of these processes to um, speed up our timelines to deliver um, housing, including rental. I'm wondering, is this something that we are considering or does this seem to be something that we could do? Um, recognize, and I know this is something that we've talked about, but come out of COVID and some of the constraints on the department might be difficult, but this seems to be like something that would be aligned with our current policies. Go ahead. Uh, th yeah, thank you, Councillor. We are we are certainly looking at how to uh, accelerate approval processes and shorten timelines. That is definitely something we're doing. Um, you, specifically related to short, we are continuing to focus it right now on social housing and rental tenure and the, or social housing projects. So the reason for that is um, the actual volume of non-market, non-profit housing projects moving through is quite high. So short itself is, has continued to be focused on those nonprofit projects. Okay, but would would we see, this is talking about considering, mm -hmm. would we see a benefit if we did expand it to some of the rental tenure, recognizing that is something that we continue to see in our housing strategy as an important part of the city? Yes, and, and I think because the, the this is, would be asking staff, my understanding is would be asking staff to consider it and report back on on the sort of implications, how it would be possible, what the resource implications would be, those sorts of things, that um, that that that's would be okay for staff to consider that for sure. Okay. Thank you. Those all your uh, comments, Councilor Weed. Yep. Councilor Boyle. Thanks. I was just going to ask a similar um, point of information uh, to staff uh, through you, Chair, which was 
just wondering, recognizing how busy um, staff are, particularly who are working on um, these affordable and non-market housing efforts, if this would take attention away from uh, that work to expedite social housing itself. Go ahead, Dan. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I mean, I think it's a it's a good question. We certainly right now have been focused on the uh, expediting of the social housing projects through the, the short program. Um, I think, it, you know, it would depend on the, the resourcing, I think, and our ability to um, to move those projects through. So um, it would depend on how we structured it and how we responded. So I would say we would have to actually look at the, the piece of of uh, that I think is entailed in the motion around considering how this would work um, before we could could have a fulsome answer to that question. Okay, I, I uh, appreciate that answer. And I'll just say by comment, I, I guess, uh, um, I also want us to continue to focus um, our efforts on social housing and, and uh, it makes sense to me that it's a resourcing um, issue and that we uh, have not um, uh, uh, funded or resourced this work uh, sufficiently to be doing everything um, all at once. And so knowing we can't do everything, I, I uh, would like to see this work continue to focus on social housing. I, of course, have consistently supported policies that make it easier to build both social housing and affordable rental housing. Um, but I'm happy to uh, see this continue to be focused for now. Thank you, Councilor Boyle and Councilor DiGenova to close on the amendment. Thanks, I'll, I'll try and close again. Um, I actually have a point of information for staff and, and that is in looking at rental tenure, would, would you see this sort of update and work at, at looking at sort of the processes as to how quickly um, rental tenure housing, even if it is market rental, is uh, progressing in timelines compared to condo strata, for instance, because that's the idea of the short program was to look at the housing that we want to protect and we want to move forward, as Councillor Boyle said, social housing. But after social housing, we also look at and we see a number of projects before us here at Council. Our, we sit in public hearings on rezonings for rental tenure housing and also strata condo. So would you interpret this also in looking at the timelines for rental tenure and strata condo, and if rental tenure is moving faster than strata condo. Okay, Dan Garrison. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something that we we certainly could look at. But I would, I when if uh, council were to approve this motion, I think our next step would be to take it away and talk to the teams that are doing, for example, the development process review, the reg, the reg reviews, and um, and and sort of build out build the the intent of this motion into that work so I'd, i would want to talk to the staff and that are involved in those programs before we sort of thought about what the actual work program in response to the motion would be of, of course um so just to close on this I'll, I'll say i really appreciate um staff answering that question again it is an update but uh to my colleagues that are hesitant about this uh please remember that we do sit here and we do uh sit in public hearing and and we uh, have projects that come before us that are strata condo and we don't necessarily know if those timelines uh, to hit those milestones for the rezoning uh, for the DPs and the BPs are moving more quickly than they are for rental tenure. So I, I hope that you will support this because this is an update and I am cognizant of the work staff has before them. That's why I'm, I'm not asking for a whole bunch of different things like you know, I had questions on co-housing. I could throw something else in about affordable home ownership. I'm not gonna do that, but I think this is important when we think about the spectrum of housing and how quickly we're moving forward with rental housing versus uh, condo strata or strata condo housing as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor DiGenova. So that is the end of the uh, list. So we'll go to a vote on the amendment. And I'll just note that, uh, yes, okay, thank you. Uh, so that motion does pass with Councillors Carr, Fry, Swanson, and Boyle in opposition.
So back to the main queue, and um, Councillor DiGenova, you do have the floor. Thanks very much. Uh, I, I'll just reserve my comments until after. So we will I'll close uh, on the motion. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, Councillor Swanson. Yeah, I sent an amendment. Okay, I'll take us over to an amendment queue. And you are on that queue, so I'll advance you. You can go ahead and introduce your amendment. Um, yeah, this is just a staff report back as soon as possible with the plan, including budget and timeline with some option and options, including how much we need from our partners and what we can contribute to actually meet the housing needs and affordability needs of those 86,000 people in household need, housing need. I remember I took a picture of it. We had a presentation a while, months, months ago saying that the, the three biggest issues in Vancouver were housing affordability, homelessness, and people visibility of people struggling on the street. And all of those issues, all three of them had over 70% of people saying that the city should spend more on those issues. So I think we're, if we get a concrete plan here, so we're not just talking about targets. We, we even if the plan is unachievable at the moment, the first step in getting what you need is to say what it is. And then the second step is to ask for it and then maybe try and create a bit of pressure for it. But I think we need to take that first step and try and push push so we can get a lot more non-market housing. So that's why I made this amendment. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Swanson. Move down the queue here, Councillor DiGenova. Thanks, I have a point of information, Chair, to the mover of the amendment. Feel free to pose your question. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Swanson, you, you state in your amendment that could actually meet the housing and affordability needs. So you want a plan that could actually meet these needs. Do you not feel that staff have already been working on a plan? Do you not feel that this is already happening? No. I mean, I think, no, I think we need, we need to make some changes here in terms of so what maybe are the our zoning, maybe our development permit, maybe how much money we get from the feds in the province. We need some major changes. Otherwise, that 86,000 is just going to keep increasing. So uh, I'm wondering, though, you're, you're not giving a specific direction to staff. You're just asking them for a plan that could actually meet um, the housing affordability needs of 86,000 people. And they're coming to us today with a way to move forward to meet those needs. So I'm just wondering if you can explain to me how you'd like to change what they've brought to us or what you'd like them to do that's different than what they're doing. Well, there's nothing in the plan about vacancy control and how we could preserve affordability using that. There's nothing in the plan about land price speculation and how we could control that. There's nothing in the plan except that one twelve billion dollar figure about how much we we could use from feds and the province to actually get the non market housing that we need. Okay. And you thanks, know, there's thanks, things like that we need to be more specific about. Okay, and now I have a point of information, Chair to staff, on this map. Close your question. So I, I'm sorry to put staff on the spot, but I'm wondering if staff could interpret for me what work they would do that could actually meet, because I thought you actually were putting together a plan that could actually meet. But what work would you do from this amendment that could actually meet the housing and affordability needs of 86,000 people, Vancouver households in need? Ahead, Thank you. Dan. Yeah, I, I think, Councillor, that, you, you know, our next steps coming out of this uh, work would be to take the scenarios that uh, staff have developed as part of the report in front of you, take them out to experts, take them out to the public, uh, and, and have a process around that. And then we would, we're planning to come back to Council once we've got the new census data, once we've done that process, uh, about sometime around this time next year, with two things, and one of those things is updated housing, um, uh, updated housing targets that we'll propose to council based on that work, and, and the other thing is an updated housing Vancouver action plan um, that will entail, you know, what are the actions that need to be taken to address those those revised housing targets. And so, to, to my mind, that that would be the process that we would sort of use to 
uh, respond to this motion. We would take this motion, I think, if council were to adopt it as, as sort of a, a additional direction to staff in that process. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll support it as long as I, I now know that staff kind of have an understanding of what it means. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Councilor Dijanova. Councilor Hardwick. And I find it paradoxical that we're talking about aspirational targets and then coming around and saying, we don't, we don't think, want aspirational targets, but we're going to go out with 86,000 that, again, are numbers that, I, again, I, I really question how they've been arrived at. So um, while I can appreciate that we do need to have a rethink of, of the Housing Vancouver strategy, that's why it's been almost two years since the motion I put forward called recalibrating the Housing Vancouver strategy post-COVID, and we still don't have, in my view, um, the necessary data to be plotting our way forward. So um, it's difficult for me to be supporting this amendment on that basis. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Carr. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, well, I do trust the figures that staff give us, and so if they've um, identified 86,000. It's not 86,761. It's a general number, and I'm sure it's been arrived at by looking at a variety of sets of data. Um, so um, I'm I'm going to support this motion, uh, or this amendment. Um, I'm going to support it because, in effect, it's really what my um, motion of a year ago was asking <laughs> for. Um, I didn't think it was going to be necessary to put it down in words. I trusted that staff actually were going to move forward to do this anyway, um, but this is actually what I'm, I have been expecting all through this report and the conversation is going to be the outcome anyway. Thank you, Councilor Carr. Uh, seeing none other to speak to the amendment, we can move to a uh, voting panel. So right now we are voting on the amendment. Moved by Councilor Swanson. And that motion passes with uh, Councillor Hardwick in opposition. So moving us back to the main queue, Councillor Swanson, you still have the floor. Councillor Swanson, you are on mute, I believe. I'm good. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hardwick. Uh, I have also put forward an amendment. Okay, I'll move us to an amendment queue. And uh, just to pop your name on there, there we go. You can go ahead and speak to your amendment. Yes, please. So um, we have had the 2021 census data available, started rolling out in February. We had additional census data rolled out today. Um, I think it's important that we do have real numbers that are updated into this going forward. It's not a bunch of extra work for staff, all of these charts and graphs use Excel spreadsheets and all you have to do is go in and put in the new numbers to update this and provide it to, uh, to us um, in a couple of months from now. This should be ample time to be able to integrate the stuff, that, certainly the stuff from February and the, and, uh, the additional data from today's that has been released. Um, I, again, think it's, it's very important that we be uh, using the, the most reliable data that we have. <laughs> and um, I struggle with the fact that, this, that we're still dealing with 2016 data in this report. So I urge staff to update it, and that's what's reflected in this amendment. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Weeb. Uh, yeah, question through you to staff. Please go ahead. Yeah, I'm just wondering from staff's point of view, recognizing that the data has just come out, is this a realistic timeline? Recognizing it would be great to have the census data um, in front of us as soon as possible. Thank you. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, from staff's perspective, there are two two major data releases. That we, I mean, we share the concern about the about using 2016 census data. Absolutely, that's why we want to adopt this report now and then revise it when the new census comes out and, uh, with updated uh, needs assessment. The challenge that we have is the two main data points we still need from the census uh, are the household and income data that will be released in July, and then the housing profile data, uh, tenure, et cetera, that will be released in September. Um, and so while the release today does have some interesting data in it and, and, and good information in it, the data that we actually need to fully update uh, the, the needs assessment 
uh, won't be available until September. And so that's just the timing challenge that we have. So we do intend to do that uh, as soon as that data is available. And as, it may take a little bit longer for us to get special runs for city of Vancouver specific data, but that's, that's why our timeline is 2023. Okay. Um, in the amendment, it just talks about report back in June so maybe an update a little bit on the data we had today, and then again in 2023 with probably a bigger release of that. So it'd be fair that you could yeah. get a little bit more of a memo kind of with the news data and then push to 2023. Yeah, Councillor, maybe I can weigh in uh, on this as well. Um, so I think, first of all, it's important to maybe just step back as to the decision that Council's being asked here to make today. There's uh, two reports that Council's being asked to receive for information. And then the third recommendation is that council direct staff to continue working on the targets. There is no decision coming back to this council. Yeah. Um, and I, I am really cognizant of the work that our planning team needs to do over the remainder of this term, including, you know, completing the Broadway plan, the Vancouver plan, the capital plan. Um, so at, at this stage, I, 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 you know, on behalf of the team, I would say that it's not feasible. Um, again, if we, we can certainly take away if there's data that we have that we can provide to council in the form of a memo around the census material that we've already got compiled, happy to provide that. In terms of our formal report back or an update to the data that you've got here today, uh, I just want to be realistic about what we can deliver so we're clear with council uh, as you're considering this uh, amendment. Okay, thank you. Thank you, as city manager, uh, Councillor Boyle. Um, thanks. Actually, m my question was similar, and maybe I'll just clarify, is there new data that we would get between now and June? That That's a staff point of information would... to our that planning is a... staff? Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Okay. I just see Chris Robertson is approaching. Yes, uh, Chris Robertson, Assistant Director, Citywide and Regional Planning. Uh, yes, uh, Council, as per the last release, um, I think it was February 9th, uh, we will be uh, providing council with memos uh, um, updating on all of the census releases uh, in addition to following up with uh, the housing uh, report later. Okay, that's already going to happen? Yes. Okay, um, great. I, I, I'll just say I, I'm glad to hear those updates will already happen and I, um, and I take to heart the city manager's comments that we have a very full agenda um, of important work coming to us in the coming months. So, um, well, I certainly appreciate the intent of this. I won't be supporting it. Thank you, Councilor Boyle. Um, Councilor Hardwick, to close on your amendment. I'd like a question through you, Chair, to, to Chris. And that question is when? Wanting to make sure it's in this term. So the, so the memos uh, will be coming every time the count, uh, census is released to you. So you will receive a memo from staff um, updating on what that release includes. Uh, the housing reports that I was talking about would follow as per the schedule that Dan and Edna have talked about. Well, in that case, what about the data that came out on February 9th? Yeah, so you'll, you'll, well, so we have sent a memo for the February 9th data. Uh, council would have received that. Yes, we did. Um, and then we will be following up today's uh, release with another memo. So every time there's a release, you will receive from staff a memo uh, advising what that census data is showing and how it relates to the previous census. Since we've had it since that time, was it, why was it not integrated into this report? So uh, components of it would be, and, and maybe I'll hand it over to Edna for the specifics, but components of it would have been. Um, I think what you heard from Dan was that there were elements that they still needed uh, and would provide uh, additional information that we don't have now. Indeed, I, I acknowledge that. We just, just keep us on big, track. The big picture stuff is there. Okay. Okay, thanks. You're welcome to ask another point of information or offer any final. No, I get the update. picture. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Uh, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, sorry to belabor this, but I just want to be clear is what I've heard uh, is that from staff is that uh, some of the census data. Uh, uh, that was released in February was integrated into today's presentation. The additional data that we need to complete the picture isn't available till July and September. So a report back in June isn't realistic. We're not going to get a full picture because we, is that correct? Did I understand? And Dan Garrison, yeah, go ahead. 
So. Uh, yes, yes, that's correct. So the population and dwellings data are in the needs report uh, and have been updated. It's just the more fulsome information that we need about uh, households, income, and the housing profiles, including tenure and other elements that, that we won't have until July and then September in the two releases. Right, and, and you will uh, provide updates as that information is available and, and we'll get updated memos or an updated presentation circulated. Yes, that's correct. Fair. Yeah. Um, okay, just, just on that basis, I, 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 I support the intent of getting the additional information, but I can't support the report back in June of 2022 because clearly that information isn't gonna be available to us. So just on that basis, I can't support it. Okay, thank you, Councillor Dominato. And Councillor Hardwick, you do have uh, just under two minutes. I just want to withdraw the, the amendment since it's not going to proceed. So if, if I can withdraw the amendment. Sure, that requires unanimous support. So there's a motion on the floor to withdraw the amendment. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Any, any opposed? Okay, so that motion has been withdrawn. So we are now back on the main queue. And Councillor Hardwick, you do have the floor. Is this to close then? This is to close, um, unless there's more amendments, this is to close on the motion. Okay. Um, there is a lot of housing data that we still do not have to inform our process. It was two years ago that I brought a motion forward to gather that data after I had organized a meeting between our former director of planning, which also included Dan Garrison, Dr. David Lay, Andy Yan, John Rose, who spoke, spoke today, were also all participants. We were looking for the pipeline of development. We were looking for zone capacity. We were looking for secondary uh, rental market and short-term rental numbers. Um, those numbers um, continue to uh, elude us. Um, we're told that 50% of Vancouver's market rental stock is in the secondary market. But where is the detailed um, information on that uh, stock, for example? Um, how do we account in this report for housing adequacy in terms of new housing for young families with children? How does this report account for housing displacement? If there is so much ex exceed existing need, how does the new market rental or ownership stock meet this need? Um, there is still a great deal of information that we need to be able to have a full picture on this. I will also add to this uh, some notes that I received from uh, CMHC, from uh, the housing uh, data specialist there, saying, saying that housing gaps that CMHC has identified include supply costs, timelines for different stages of development, uh, condo pre-sales, how many timing and what type of buyer, et cetera higher frequency rental market intelligence, uh, vacancies and rental on a monthly basis, for example, number size, rent levels and occupancy of secondary suites. Again, rep we should have a handle on the secondary suites since we monitor and charge people um, um, licenses for those. Historical non-resident ownership pre-2016, wealth and its role its role in real estate markets uh, versus the more commonly discussed income. So some of these are, are local to Vancouver, CMHC would say, well, others are nationwide in their scale. But this just illustrates the, um, the need for really having uh, the, the best and most, to use an often used word, robust data in order to be uh, making uh, our policies or recalibrating our co policies as we move into the future. So um, I just have to emphasize that. It's really incumbent on us and as staff to be able to provide that information to inform our decisions uh, in a more complete way. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Uh, Councillor Carr on the motion is amended. Yes, thanks. Um, if I could ask a question through you, the staff. First. Please go ahead. Um, yes, uh, Steph, I, um, during the questioning period, um, I, I raised a number of points, and I'm just wondering if, if those um, are going to pro are, have or will provide direction to you without putting them into an amendment. Um, things like um, taking direction on including measures around tackling the crisis, prices and rents, and you know, at the affordable level in households, pre-zoning of land uh, for nonprofit and social housing for affordability, fast track permitting, vacancy control, inclusionary zoning, protection of existing affordable housing. Those have all been raised. So have you, 
jotted those down so that they are going to be part of your work? Uh, Councilor, yeah, absolutely. As we go forward and we look at and we engage experts in the public on the uh, on the revised targets and the target scenarios, um, and then develop an action plan, those are exactly the kinds of things that we've heard from council that we will be um, sort of putting into the mix as we as we think about new ways to address the housing challenges. So yes. Fantastic. I do not need to do amendment then. That's great. Um, so. Thanks to you, staff, um, for the work you've done in doing this. This has been a long time. Um, I've been uh, wanting uh, this particular report in this um, direction uh, that you're taking. Um, I'm super happy with, uh, with where you're headed. Um, really appreciate the speakers who came and offered a lot of good information to us as well. I uh, appreciate um, the fact that there have been some amendments and, uh, and Councillor Swanson's amendment um, does in fact capture my original motion uh, which set uh, sort of direction for this report and uh, making sure that we focus on the households who really are in need um, and deliver truly affordable housing um, through our efforts at the city level. Um, so the point is um, that, uh, that, we, um, that we have got a housing crisis, a housing affordability crisis. And um, I am, I've got a lot of hope out of this that we are actually going to get down to the, um, the real nitty gritty of how we're going to change the way um, we um, uh, um, manage uh, develop the development processes through regulations, through policies, um, but mostly through a plan that identifies the needs and what we need to do to meet those needs. So very happy to be supporting this. Thank you, Councilor Carr. Councilor Swanson. Yeah, thanks so much to staff for all this work. I know it's a lot. In some ways, I think this is the most, one of the most important reports that we've received. Um, at the beginning of the term, Councilor Carr asked for a report about how to actually meet housing needs based on the income of folks who need the housing. And now we have that report that says what the needs are and it provides a few options on how to maybe meet some of that need, but it doesn't look at potential roles of really scaling up non-market, of vacancy control, of land price speculation. Hopefully the housing minister required the report because he intends to at least help us meet these needs. 86,000 household, probably twice that much actual people is a huge, huge number it shows why affordable housing is a number one issue in Vancouver, and we still need a plan desperately. There's one easy thing we could do, or the province could, and that's vacancy control. That would maintain the affordability we have in tens of thousands of rented dwellings and wouldn't cost even a thousandth as much as building new non-market housing, and would also stop real estate investment trusts and other investors from buying up apartments using the business model of raising rents when tenants leave. The province could raise the safer limit above $803 a month, which is a joke unless you're a senior on low income trying to find a place to live, in which case it's a tragedy. If the province and feds could start pouring money into co-op and nonprofit housing, that would be good. The CCPA has a new paper out saying this could be done and be self-financing and produce affordability for middle-income folks. The province and feds could target their housing money to non-profit rather than profit-making housing. The city could buy more land for non-market housing. We could allow extra density for non-market only in areas where we don't already have apartments. We could re require more affordability as a condition of extra density. The first part of this report was sort of bragging about all the new housing that's been built in Vancouver. Yes, we spend night after night approving expensive rentals and condos, but we still have those 86,000 precious house households in housing need, mostly because they have to pay too much for rent. And I think it's past time that we actually tackle the affordability issue. If we don't have all the tools as a city, then we need to state what those tools are and lobby fiercely to get them. In the end, the solution is going to be to get housing out of the market like Vienna has done. I am hoping we can keep up the pressure for this so we can get genuine affordability and security that renters need. 
Thank you, Councillor Swanson uh, and Mayor Stewart. Thanks very much. Uh, Council, I, I think we all owe uh, staff a debt of gratitude for the amount of work they, <laughs> they poured into this. So uh, uh, please uh, accept my congratulations, staff, for all the hard work you've done here. If you look back at where Vancouver was uh, in the 2010 Olympics, we uh, that those councils approved about uh, 4,400 units uh, in that year, 75% uh, of which was uh, condos. Uh, if you look at what we did last year, uh, I think about 8,600 units double, 8,800 units double of what was being approved in 2010. And I think most remarkable, uh, over 50% is rental housing. And that's uh, when you turn things completely around, that I think is called a revolution. And I think that's really what's starting here is that we are really getting much closer to what the residents of this city are expecting. Um, and it, it's not just for folks that can buy condos or or can afford market rents. We've done so much on uh, for those uh, that require below market rent units. You look at the record number of uh, social housing units that were constructed this year. You think of all those people that would be on the street that are now um, now in in cozy little homes. Uh, you know, and I, and I think this is an incredible thing. I think of what uh, the empty homes tax, how it's forced, you know, uh, 5,000 units back on the market just here in the city of Vancouver. And um, I think of the rental protections we brought in. I mean, there was all kinds of talk about uh, demo evictions and, and rental evictions when we came into council in 2018. And although we don't have a perfect better and our renter protections have done a lot to, to make that happen. So uh, I think we are headed in the right direction and I have a, have a lot of hope. Um, you know, the federal and provincial governments are getting back into the housing game that uh, we've been able to secure over a billion dollars for, for social housing uh, and get that built quickly. I think that's a great thing and that the, the feds and province are still willing to to talk to us even over the even after those large investments, I think that's also a credit to them. So that we continue to discuss, for example, buying all the single room occupancy hotels and uh, turning them over from private hands to nonprofits is is essential. So I think uh, we've done a, a, a good job here. We've we've we're we're going in the right direction, but I still think there's lots to do. So again, thank you to staff for your blood, sweat, and tears on this. Thanks for all those folks have come in through all those public hearings to um, to express their opinions about various projects. Uh, thank you to the building community that the vast majority of this uh, housing is, of course, provided by by the private sector and, and folks that are willing to work with us to try things like the, the, the MERP program. Uh, Twelve of those buildings approved by this council. So again, I uh, you know, we still see lineups of, of renters. We still see people that are overbidding, I think, for, for their first home. Uh, but I do think that um, that uh, we're making progress and, uh, and I've got a lot of hope. So again, thanks everybody for, for everything you're doing and look forward to even more. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilor DiGenova. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to echo my gratitude for staff. I know that when you leave here, you're already working on the next uh, uh, updates that are coming to us. I mean, there's a number of different timelines, I understand. Uh, but there, there isn't a time when you're not working on making housing more affordable in Vancouver. Uh, I know that some of the work that we give you makes that more complex, uh, especially the direction. Uh, to go in different directions, but but I want to say that I do have hope, and I, I do feel that that um, what what we've seen in this update is working towards a plan. We talk about plans that are really plans for plans, <laughs> but I I think that in in seeing this, what it helps me to 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 look at is overall how are we considering housing in vancouver there is a spectrum of housing and as i've said i i think that we need to do what we can to make sure that we're expediting the most affordable housing you know it's one of the reasons that that i i have you know uh, 
been so insistent on, you know, doing what we can to expand the short program, especially for social housing, because I understand that there are a number of social housing and nonprofit uh, projects that just weren't eligible because there wasn't room for them in that program, uh, but they wanted to be a part of it. I think, though, that when we think about it, and, you know, this council has made a commitment to workforce housing, to missing middle housing, that includes rental tenure. That includes market rental housing. That includes family housing. I'd like to see us look at co-housing like we see in Europe, where, for instance, you might see a floor plate of a building where the middle of that floor plate or half of that floor plate is common space. And instead, we see families, you know, living in less space. You know, to, to some of the speakers, and I really want to thank the speakers and appreciate sort of that there were diverse, um, there were diverse views. But you know, some people want to live in a condo with their five children, and I think we have to enable them to do that. Can we do that in a way that works? Yes. Um, if we don't, what we see is people making, you know, pantries into bedrooms, whereas if if they instead had an in you know an inboard or a borrowed light window, at least their child might have some light. So I think there's considering those compromises and those trade-offs and really breaking down the silos and the ideas of what families and people want to see as housing in Vancouver. What what I might want is different than what somebody else might want. And I think, you know, uh, being a millennial and, and you know, I, I put quotes around that, but, uh, you know, and, and, and you can roll your eyes, but my generation does, doesn't need, um, you know, the same things that our parents have um, or even want this, you know, this, the same idea of that single family home, um, that big backyard, you know, there, there's more of a desire for townhomes, for uh, common shared space and more affordability. But I also think that we have to consider, you know, different types of housing. As I said, breaking down those silos and, and looking at, as we have this year already, looking at co-ops and how we enable those to move forward. But I, I really do think that this is a good snapshot and a good place to start as we move forward. And I think that this encapsulates everything from, you know, some of my colleagues who often, you know, uh, there, there will be, a, you know, a certain vote split on public hearings. I think there's something for everyone in here and that addresses those needs. So, um, you know, to those of you who don't think that, that this hits the mark with family housing, I'd say look again, because I think that there are options in here. But I also think that we have to, um, you know, dig deeper, be more creative, and look at the most affordable options for the people who are leaving Vancouver because they can't afford to live here. How are we making them feel welcome? How are we making them feel that they can even afford to live in Vancouver? And I think that by looking at expediting processes for those, uh, you know, first motion I brought this term um, was on that. Um, I feel confident that our staff are moving forward um, with that in the best way possible. So I really want to thank staff for all of your work on this, and I'm looking forward to future updates. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor DiGenova. Councillor Hardwright. I just had one more thing, and uh, that was I, I went back and have been lo looking at uh, an email I'd received from the city solicitor on the subject of, of abstention. Um, under the Vancouver Charter, of course, abstention uh, is deemed to be a vote in favor. But um, abstaining clearly reflects a councillor's state of mind concerning an, an issue. And um, in, in this case, for example, the councillor may feel that they have insufficient information on which to base a supporting vote. And in my never-ending quest for that information and data, I just want to go on to the record that I will be abstaining, and this is the reason why. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hardwick. So with that, I think we can move to a vote on the amended uh, recommendations. And that motion uh, and recommendations in the staff report have passed with unanimous support. So thank you very much to uh, our staff team for all of the work, um, as was noted. And um, we are 
at 10 to 5. And I think our next item was referred but does not have any speakers, perhaps some discussion. So perhaps we'd move to that item now, referred from yesterday's meeting. Uh, and so let me find out where that is. So we do have the three items on the agenda that were referred from council meeting yesterday to today's meeting. Um, another, um, so I'm gonna move us right to item six. This is the first referred motion, um, catalyzing planning for the future of Central Waterfront District, which was, yeah. sorry? I, I just, I wanted to, I had a point of procedure. Okay. Try not to interrupt, but um, I understood there was no speakers to this. Do you anticipate we'll get through debate in 10 minutes? I'm trying. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that's hopeful. <laughs> and if we need a couple minutes, then we can always get a motion. So I'm going to go back to reading the title. Um, planning uh, for future of Central Waterfront District, which was moved and introduced by Councillor Fry and seconded by Councillor DiGenova. There's no speakers for this motion. And so we can go straight to uh, discussion. I'm going to move us to a main queue. If we need extra time, we can take that. Councilor Kirby Young. Yeah, I will just, in the interest of time, speak quickly and um, enthusiastically uh, about initiating a planning process. Vancouver is a waterfront city, and I think that there is such untapped potential um, to really revitalize our waterfront um, in a way that is um, both exciting from a livability perspective, from an economic perspective, from a uh, cultural perspective, um, from a social policy point of view, and I had the opportunity to sit in on a panel, I would like to say it was last week, um, that was convened actually by Dr. Hetty Fry, with a number of folks who have been involved for some time um, in this waterfront revitalization discussion, and were incredibly knowledgeable um, about this area, and really had a very integrated vision for connecting communities all the way from Waterfront Station um, through Strathcona to Japantown, um, providing better access to Crab Park, integration between the working uh, nature of the waterfront and recognizing the trade-oriented um, lands with the port, um, with the sort of leisure activities and how to really provide people access to that. And I think one of the, having sat on the park board last time, one of the um, visions that we've always had is can the contiguous opportunity for people to um, sort of in a circular way navigate effectively the peninsula that Vancouver is on. And so I think it has merit in a number of different ways. It does seem to need a catalyst um, in terms of initiating that planning process. It is a big piece of work and it is complex, but I think the city of Vancouver needs to add its voice and be at the table. Um, and so I won't try to say too much more than that because I see a lot of other councillors on the queue. Um, and I know we're trying to get through this item, but um, I think it is a phenomenal opportunity and we need to have we need to do what I, I used to work with somebody called it cathedral thinking, is that we are planning for future generations. Um, and I think about folks, for example, that had the foresight to protect Stanley Park in perpetuity and what that means to Vancouver. And what and then establishing sort of the seawall and all those amenities that make Vancouver Vancouver. And I think this is one of those situations. So for that reason, I'm happy to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Kirby Young. And I'll just ask, uh, we may need a motion to extend to hear the comments before we go to dinner. Thank you, Councilor Hardwick. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, great. So Councilor Hardwick, over to you. Yes, I'd also like to speak in support of this motion. Um, I sit, um, among other things, on the Heritage Commission and Heritage Foundation um, as the council representative. In both cases, there's tremendous support for uh, a heritage retention and building off of the legacy of our city, which of course we exist as a city because we're the terminus of the railway and the, the western port for Canada. And uh, being able to showcase the, the locations on our waterfront, I think is uh, again, existential to the purpose and, and uh, life of Vancouver. So uh, very happy to support, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Hardwick um, and Councilor DiGenova. Thanks very much. Um, I, I want to thank uh, Councillor Dominato and Councillor Fry for bringing this forward. Um, I've had the opportunity over uh, a few months now to be involved in some conversations with Councillor Dominato and Councillor Fry and uh, a waterfront working group that I have to thank because they have volunteered all of their time and most of them are, you know, uh, previous uh, 
you know, city staff from different cities, planners, engineers. It's kind of like having a dream team come together in a sense and, and try and work with our staff in volunteering their time and work with council to try and create something. And, and I think it has to be unique to Vancouver, but I, I do also, I, I spend a lot of time, you know, I have uh, family that lives in the city of North Vancouver, and I do some work in the city of North Vancouver as well, and I spend some time down there, and I love to take my daughter to the shipyards. I love to go down there with friends and family and walk around because it is such a welcoming and inviting um, place, and it, it's a, you know, free public space that everyone can enjoy, with a billion dollar view, which is the waterfront. And I also, on our side of it, you know, looking at our, you know, our waterfront, it isn't quite that same experience when you're looking at Waterfront Road or you're driving down it or you're walking in it. And I know that there's a lot of work to do. It's very complex. There's a number of stakeholders, the park board, the port authority. You have to look at, you know, uh, the city of Vancouver, the province, the federal government. And I, I also want to give a shout out and uh, thanks to Dr. Hetty Fry for um, hosting a round table uh, that brought many of us together um, and, and talked about next steps and how we can move forward with this because I do think that there needs to be leadership on this uh, and I wholeheartedly not only support the motion but I'm happy to keep working uh, you know, together with uh, council in advancing this and moving it forward because I think that it truly is a special place in Vancouver and everyone should have access to our waterfront and when we think about it, we should think about it as uh, a missed opportunity until we uh, get it to the place that it needs to be where people actually want to come down there and we see people uh, you know uh, convening down there like we do in the shipyards in North Vancouver so that's what I'll say and thanks to Councillor Dominato and Fry for for putting this together I know we've spent some hours together on on uh, you know, with others in meetings and really want to thank the volunteer work group and our staff also who has provided information to help move this forward. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor DiGenova, uh, Councillor Kirby Young. I have a quick point of procedure. I was wondering if we could um, add to the motion, not just to extend to hear comments, but also to vote and complete the item. Uh, yes. Thank you for clarifying. So uh, the motion is to also vote on the item. Uh, all those in favor? Yay. Any opposed? Thank you, appreciate that clarification. Uh, Councillor Carr. Yeah, I'm super, super happy to see this uh, come forward. Um, thank you, Councillor Fry, for, for bringing this forward and working with Councillor Dominato um, on, the, uh, on the motion. You know, for all the years that I've been on council, this has been a persistent, why isn't it happening question um, in terms of just how important the area is. I understand it's complicated by many different landowners. There's been a lot of work that's gone into it, and it's not an, you know, it's not an easy thing to plan. But there is such incredible potential. I was blown away when I saw the statistic in the first uh, uh, whereas 18 million public transit passengers a year coming through this area. 18 million, um, and there is huge potential for those people just to you know, spend some time at whatever develops in that area um, uh, that, that entices them to stay, to, you know, to enjoy that waterfront location. So um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Very happy to be voting for it. Thank you, Council Carr. Uh, Council Dominato. Uh, thanks, Chair. I, I know Council Fry already spoke very eloquently to this yesterday evening, but um, just in brief, um, I want to offer just some perspective on this. I think that um, it was touched on earlier, the um, opportunity for city building and in particular, um, really thinking long term and being visionary and bold. And I think there is a real opportunity with uh, the Central Waterfront District to do just that. And, and in fact, as we've learned, uh, much of the work um, to the West um, is um, because there was that forward thinking in terms of uh, including the housing development there, but having the, um, the walkway and the waterfront access for the public to enjoy. And, um, and what I appreciate about the Downtown Waterfront Working Group, who has done a tremendous amount of research on this, they have looked around the world, and there's some really fantastic examples of how um, we can 
build over top to make the waterfront more accessible. We can have a better connection in terms of not just pedestrian connections east to west, but also cycling connections. And um, also um, in terms of um, uh, uh, reconciliation of recognizing Indigenous peoples as their first lands in this area. And so I think there's a, um, a lot of um, opportunity that aligns with our city goals. And you know, personally, I, I remember I worked in the Harbor Centre for a number of years and, uh, you know, during lunch hours and breaks, uh, it was common for people to leave the building and often people would default to going into the sitting in that parking lot adjacent to the station because it's a natural vista to look out to the water in the mountains um, and there's no benches there, there's no plaza there, it is just a parking lot um, wedged between two buildings, but people gravitate to that space because it's as close as they can get to um, enjoy the waterfront. And um, while I realize there's a lot of partners involved um, in terms of the city, in terms of private land ownership, in terms of uh, the federal government and provincial government, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity to do good here, but we have to start that planning process. We need to get the wheels in motion um, to and to think big. And, and we've got really active, engaged residents and, and community members who want to make this uh, a reality. And so um, that's why I think we felt compelled to bring this forward. Really appreciate um, uh, the collaborative work of Councillor Fry and Councillor DiGenova and, and the Downtown Waterfront Working Group in um, catalyzing this motion, but um, I, just to say I, I support it and I think it's the right thing to do for the city. Thank you very much, Councillor Dominato. And uh, to close on the motion, Councillor Fry. Yeah, just uh, appreciate all the supportive comments. Um, you know, and I, I'm reluctant to take too much credit for this because I, I do feel like this is work that is built on, on the shoulders of giants. And uh, speaking of giant shoulders, I had the pleasure of running into uh, our beloved former city planner, uh, Ray Spaxman, over the weekend. And, and, and Ray's been a big champion of this, and he really gets that whole sort of city building thing and the magic of Vancouver and how important this could be. And when I think to the kind of things that could have been, for many of us, this conversation started with, with some concerns around the, air quotes, ice pick uh, that was being proposed at one point, and, 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 and really this missed opportunity. And I think about the Project 200, which could have seen uh, that's where when they built the Granville Plaza there and um, that was supposed to be the part of a massive freeway project that was going to go across the entire waterfront and what a different city we'd have were that the case. This builds upon some of the work that uh, the motion that this council supported uh, that Councillor Swanson had brought forward about about connecting Crab Park and uh, how we could do more of a reconciliation focus for the waterfront um, and and uh, you know there's the, the recent uh, event that we attended with uh, the MP from Vancouver Centre actually really highlighted uh, some interesting new work that's going on in the Sinclair Centre. Um, the, 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 there's a giant project to rework Sinclair Centre and what's that going to look like and how they're already looking at ways to connect up the waterfront and expand Howe Street and connect it to Granville Street. There's a ton of exciting work going on and I know our staff are really excited about this too and so really at the end of the day this is encouraging that work that staff have been working on. We all recognize it's super complicated. Uh, this gives the staff the opportunity to report back on how to budget it, how to really pursue this work in earnest, working collaboratively with our partners to make this the, the, the jewel of our beautiful city and connect the waterfront for all Vancouverites. So that's it. Thank you very much, Councillor Fry. And that looks like the end of our uh, speakers list. So we'll move to a vote on the motion. Chair Bly, this is Councillor Boyle. Can I get a vote assist in favor? Yes. Thanks. And that motion passes with uh, none in opposition. So thank you uh, very much, Council. That was a solid afternoon. We're gonna take a one hour dinner break and come back at 6.05 and uh, continue on with item uh, seven on our agenda.
Hi, Kirsty. Can you hear us on Talis? Hi, David. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. Thanks. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Finance meetings um, ongoing, so we're going to be moving to item seven. Uh, so this is the second referred motion. Um, again, item seven, increasing the empty homes tax to 5% and improving compliance. Uh, 
this is a member's motion B3 from yesterday council meeting's agenda, uh, which was moved and introduced by Mayor Stewart and seconded by Councillor Fry. So there, we do have a speaker to this motion. So we're gonna start by hearing from our speaker and um, that is Maxim Winther. So I'll just have us confirm we do have uh, that speaker on the line. So Maxim Winther. Uh, speaker one is not on the line. Okay. Uh, well, this is our only speaker for this item. So I think what we can do is perhaps move to discussion. Can I just ask, Chair, uh, what the speaker was notified? The process is that the speakers are notified 30 minutes at least before it's their turn to speak. So my understanding is the speaker was emailed as all speakers are. Okay, thanks. So we're just giving a moment because we are just getting going again. And so it, it could be that they are uh, slow to join the line and we want to make sure we give them ample opportunity because they are the only speaker. So, Council, I'm just going to give us a one minute recess to uh, double check that that caller is not calling in. and we'll move us to discussion. So Mayor, I see you're first on the queue. Um, I'll advance you. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, just uh, reiterating a few points um, for, uh, from the other day when I was uh, answering questions from Council as to why I think it's important to uh, make this move. Uh, first of all, our vacancy rate is uh, very low at, at 1.1%. And I just, you, you know, you hear and you talk to people who are lining, young people that are lining up in queues to find rental properties. Uh, you find first time buyers that can't find places to live. And then you think about, and all the work we do here in council chambers to uh, build new um, strata buildings. And then thinking about these uh, being bought by speculators and left empty is, is just, uh, it's heartbreaking to think of and, and not really productive use of, of anybody's time. Um, so we know that the empty homes tax works, uh, the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation uh, using StatsCan data and other studies have found that um, that this uh, this tax has, uh, inc has uh, pushed, uh, helped push about 5,000 units onto the market for those renters and first time buyers and that's a great success. However, we do know from the uh, audits that uh, the compliance rate is not where it should be. And so this uh, motion asks council to increase the, uh, the tax from three to 5% uh, and also uh, double the number of audits to make sure we get uh, compliance. Now, the, the reason why I think these things are important is I think we may be getting, if we can do this and, and run it for a year or so, we uh, may be able to draw a line under uh, speculation here in the city uh, and and then move on to, to working on supply. So we heard today from the excellent housing report how we're bringing all this new supply online, but it would be a real shame if it ended up in the, in the hands of speculators. Uh, again, um, you know, the vast majority of, of folks in this city are 
even if they own more than one property are renting these properties out um, or living in them themselves, of course, or their families are. So, so that's all fine and they're not affected. They just have to register, you know, they just have to report once a year uh, doing this. Uh, we have a we have a good appeal process and we've learned a lot about this. So this, this motion uh, council, um, what it does is it, it, it asks it, it asks for us to increase the, the tax limit to 5% for next year, uh, as well as the audits uh, from 9,000 to 20,000. But it also gives uh, staff chan a chance to uh, look at all the data that we have to date from the years that this has been in place and come back to us with uh, suggestions as to how to make it more fair, to make sure that we are not, uh, that only those people that are pure speculators and refusing to rent or sell their uh, vacant homes and just profit off of them are, are the only ones to which this tax is applied. So uh, I, I again, uh, thank you for uh, seconding and moving this over to today. Uh, and I really hope uh, that you will support this. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Mayor Stewart. Uh, Councillor Hardwick. Actually, I don't see. Oh, Councillor Hardwick, if you can unmute. Uh, the mayor will like this. I agree with the mayor on this. Um, I uh, any any rational analysis of the situation will confirm that empty, the empty homes tax is having an impact. And, you know, I look at the fact that Vancouver for, you know, decades now has become a, a destination for parking wealth. And whether it's stacked, you know, safety deposit boxes in the sky or buying a bunch of, of large mansions and in key locations, it exists. An industry has developed around um, making it look like there's people living there, um, and ultimately, it is not in the best interests of the city. So, um, I think it's a good thing, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we don't um, penalize the people that, that you know with the unintended consequences that happen. And this is the reason that I asked the question of the mayor yesterday, and I've sent a small amendment out. Uh, just to re reflect that, um, and I hope the mayor will accept this in the, in the um, uh, as intended. We don't want to punish the wrong people, and uh, we do get. Uh, I know there's an adjudication process, and we also hear frequently from our constituents on the subject. And so, um, I've, I've circulated an amendment, uh, which I think will just improve. It, uh, but overall, uh, again, really support this motion. It's the right thing to do. Oh, okay, great. So let's move over to an amendment queue, and I'm just going to quickly clear that queue. And Councillor Hardwick, I'm going to, sorry, one second, Councillor Swanson. I'm just going to put Councillor Hardwick back on to speak to the amendment. If you have any further comment, Councillor Hardwick. No, that's it. I mean, I, I just, um, I hope the mayor will consider this a friendly amendment. It's, uh, and it's just intended to uh, sort of future proof. Um, outliers because we don't want to punish the wrong people. Okay, got it. Uh, thank you. And Councillor Swanson. Councillor Swanson. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out exactly what this means. So it's that the staff be directed to report back regarding how the empty homes tax exemption might be altered to improve fairness so that those legitimate reasons for vacancy and or having a second property are not penalized. Yeah. Well, why, if the second property is vacant, it should be taxed too, right? So I'm trying to understand the amendment. Councilor Swanson, is so that a point of information to, to the, the mover? mover? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, okay, Councilor Hardway. Yeah, so there are people that own more than one uh, unit. They may, um, but the, it's some. It, there's things that are going on in their families that they're that, you know, they might be moving people through different stages of life and such. And I'm really referring to people that are are locals um, rather than people that are coming and parking their money here and just using it as holding properties. Uh, there are various different scenarios that we've seen 
um, and again, I'm just being specific here that there's more than one uh, type of outlier on this. Um, and this has also been seen in, I don't, you know, a bunch of the different concerns that I've heard from residents. So it's really intended for for residents, not people that are coming in as speculators or from form, you know, but, outside. But like, I'm trying to figure out, we still want to tax vacant homes that are the second home that somebody owns, right? If it's vacant, we would still tax it. I don't understand why it matters if it's a second home or a first home. Okay. So that, so that, that wouldn't be a point of information at this point. I think that this is part of the debate. So uh, Councillor Swanson, that's well within your right to raise that concern. But I'm, I'm not sure that we can go back and forth to answer your question exactly. Councillor Hardwick can always go back on the queue to respond. It would be nice to have a response and it would, it would help me. I want to vote for it, but I, I don't see it. I don't understand it right now. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Is, is, that's everything for now, Councillor Swanson? Yeah. And a privilege? We have a point of privilege. It's actually a point of privilege. It is. I can't see it up on the screen. I'd like to see it on the screen. The amendment. <laughs> okay. Thank I you. will ask staff, our clerks to put it on the I'll screen. Try. Uh, Mayor Stewart, over to you. Uh, thanks so much. I support this amendment because I do agree this is a this is a hike. Like five percent is a lot if it if it's an annual cost for somebody. So we absolutely have to make sure it's fair. And just thinking about Councillor Swanson's point, if for example uh, there's a, a long term illness in the family and there's a there's a real difficulty uh, moving the home, for example, uh, you know a completely legitimate reason and. Uh, we would make sure want to make sure that that family isn't penalized when they're already kind of down on their luck. Uh, so we we do have a lot of information about the adjudication process now, why people have come in and said that they should be exempt, why they shouldn't be, and I and I think it's especially with the all the data that'll come in from the three uh, percent uh, tax this year. I think it is a really prudent thing to do to kind of evaluate this. It, it doesn't suggest a change. It would just be that staff would come back with options. Uh, for council to consider so i do think we should give you know try to make people feel like this is that that we're balancing the um, effectiveness of the tax with uh fairness in the in the population so i'm i'm fine with this addition myself thank you mayor stewart uh councillor hardwick no i just was back reading it again uh, to see if uh, how I could have miscommunicated that, but it's it it is about improving fairness to people that have legitimate reasons for vacancy and for having a second and or having a second property. So it's an either or it could be an and or, but these are just um, permutations on on what can happen. And uh, as I say, future proofing. But I think in a good way that is again going to build confidence in our local constituents about improving fairness. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Um, for those additional comments, I do see our city manager is, is, um, is risen, so I'll give uh, him the floor. Thanks very much, uh, Chair, I appreciate that. I just wanna make sure as staff, um, we understand the intent of the amendment and, and the motion. Um, the inclusion of second properties is a very significant change to the tax regime. It's not something we can audit. Um, and a significant number of properties in the city are second properties. Um, so that, I, I, but I've, I've also heard that this, the intent is not to actually implement this, but to have staff report back on it. So uh, we're a little bit uh, unclear and perhaps would benefit from some clarification from the mover or, or, or the mayor as the original mover of the, the motion. Uh, Councillor Hardwick, you still have the floor. Would you? Uh, okay. Um, I was just waiting to, to see if, if the mayor wanted to say anything. But um, the overall the overall motion is is intentional. But um, we still want to be. This is a report back. That's what it says. See that staff be directed to report back to council in Q Q one of twenty twenty three, with how the empty homes tax exemptions might be altered altered to improve fairness. 
uh, to those with legitimate reasons for vacancy and or having a second property, because these might be, again, from the instances that I have seen, um, and I'm sure other councillors have seen that this this has been a subject that's come up before. And um, so why would we not look at it? Okay, I'm just uh, looking to the city manager if that further clarifies the direction that's being um, given here. So yeah, the, the motion calls for the tax, the increased rate of tax to be implemented for the 2023 tax year. Um, so it's not clear if there's a, changes to the exemptions that council is considering whether those would also be applicable in the same tax year or not. Um, so I, the way that I read this, and I can be um, corrected by the mover of the motion, is that staff be directed to report back to council in Q1 of 2023 regarding these additional points, in which case they would not be enacted in 2023. They'd be discussed in 2023 and then potentially a decision would be made. If, thank you. That that's that's how I read it as well. Just wanted to make sure we're so. Count, or I, you know, I, I I think I see the mayor nodding um, on the virtual screen here. But if there's any uh, contrary minded, then perhaps jump on the queue and make that known. Otherwise, we'll go with this direction. Okay. Uh, so we'll leave it there for the moment. Councillor Hardwick, is there any further comment? No. Um, I didn't think it would be that controversial, but uh, no. That's okay. fine, thanks. No, that's great. It's just clarification is helpful. Um, Council Carr. Yeah, thank you. I have the same question um, around um, and or having a second property. Um, so I just, it's really a, a point of information through you, if possible, to the city manager. Um, uh, what comes to mind for me, and I'm wondering if this might be, might be at front of mind for for staff um, are some of the cases that we have heard um, where somebody has a second property um, because they are, um, or their property is, is and it's, it's vacant, because it is a second property, because they live out of town, they have a severe illness, they come here on a regular basis for treatment, um, for example, uh, I, 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 there were several cases like that. I remember also some cases that um, that people have spoken to me about where they're um, they are doing child care, grandchildren care, um, so they're in town regularly to to do that. I mean, those are um, they they live out of town, but they are that's their role within the family. So I'm just wondering if if those are the kinds of things that um, also might be considered or looked at as potential legitimate reasons? Certainly, Councillor, yeah, well, I mean, we're happy to um, take the direction from Council here and report back. I, th I think the challenge with the program always is what we can audit. Um, we can't audit childcare, um, so it, it becomes very easy to circumvent the tax the more exemptions you have. I think that would be the worry, and particularly as the amount of the tax goes up, uh, the incentives to work around the tax also go up. Okay. Thank those, you. those are issues that we could report back to based on the direction yeah. we've received. Here. Anyway, I'm, I'm happy to support this um, because it is a report back. And so uh, when we get the report back, uh, we'll, you know, if staff can express to us at that time either the difficulty of auditing or the potential list, and we can make a decision at that point. So happy to see this now. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Councillor Fry. <clears throat> yeah, like Councillor Swanson, I'm actually kind of struggling with understanding what the purpose of this amendment is. I can appreciate that we currently are looking at uh, uh, exemptions for those with legitimate reasons for vacancy, but uh, having a second property, that kind of seems to defeat the purpose. I mean, whether the second property is here in British Columbia or a villa in Palm Springs or a dacha in Moscow, um, the whole notion of having... Uh, I, I just, I really can't understand how the audit pr process would work in a foreign country, how I, I, I totally accept the legitimate reason. I just, I can't wrap my head around why we would want to sort of embed the idea that a second property is somehow kind of also an exempt, what it, it, but three properties is no good, but two properties, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm struggling with the, you know, I, I support the idea of a legitimate reason, legitimate reason is great, but I'm not really understanding why a second property has to be included in there. It seems like that's the exact thing that we're sort of trying to deal with with speculation tax. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a pass on this amendment. Thank you, Councillor Fry. Councillor Dijanova. 
Thanks. I'm going to support this amendment, and actually, I, I felt compelled to speak after Councillor Fry's comments. And actually, there was an inquiry made today uh, by Councillor Bly. It's an inquiry I've made before as well. When people own properties and there's rental restrictions that are put on them, and maybe they own two of those properties, I've heard of people who have done this and purchased these properties, rental restrictions. Just give us one second. I see there's some adjustments happening. Uh, rental, there we go. go. Rental restrictions are put on those properties, and it's very difficult for people who have purchased those properties. And and you know maybe they did so. And and I'm not here to lay blame or point fingers. You know I purchased my own home that I live in, but maybe there are some people who purchase homes for their children or purchase homes for their grandchildren and would rent these properties out but can't do this because there's rental restrictions. There are so many different issues that I've encountered. Councillor Carr will remember this. I actually brought this up last term. There was a, a, a midwife. She was very public about this. She went on CTV and because it was a blended family, a second marriage. You know, the condo in Vancouver that she stayed at more than six months of the year was actually in her husband's name because he owned it. To put her through property transfer tax would have cost $27,000. But they also didn't have a rental agreement because to have a rental agreement would have affected their income and their whole circumstances. So I know that's just one case, but there are a hundred of those individual cases. And I think that that's the issue here. If they are speculators, that's one thing. I'm all for it. We can, we can increase the tax to 10% for those people. But when it comes to people who literally, I mean, please go and watch the CTV, you know, uh, piece where she's opening her cabinets and showing all, like I live here this is where I sleep this is my bed come by any time you know and and other than that she was on the Gulf Islands with with her family but not more than six months of the year but because of the circumstances there she was being charged the empty homes tax or her husband was because he wasn't renting to her so I think it's really really important that we remember that there are real people who are living in their homes that are being audited because their neighbor doesn't like them. And they call the city of Vancouver and then they have to go through a very expensive process. Expensive, uh, you know, timely. I mean, the, the, the amount of time I've seen people spend on, on proving that they live in their homes to the city of Vancouver is, is preposterous. So to those people who truly are speculators, that's one thing. But to others who have a legitimate reason for owning a second home, or it's a situation like I just explained, you know, two people each owned one home and, and got married. I think that it's really important that we consider those circumstances. So I support Councillor Hardwick's amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can, uh, Mayor Stewart. Sorry, I'll get there. I, I just again, this is the staff be directed to report back to council by Q1 2023 regarding a bunch of stuff that we want to have looked at. So we may very well look at second homes and say no adjustments are needed, but it's just to, to put an eye on it. And I, I don't see what the harm is of doing that. That's uh, so I'm still okay with that. And uh, is people should feel comfortable with, with what we're putting forward here. So again, I, I support, still support it. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilor Carr. Yes, um, thank you. I, I have another point of information, if I can ask for you. Um, I actually, um, I'm realizing as I w went through every scenario I could think of where a pers person was complaining about and um, saying they had a legitimate reason um, for the vacancy, they did not have a second, uh, they did ha not have a second home in Vancouver. It was outside of Vancouver and they were coming in and it was vacant because they were residents somewhere else. So having a second property, um, does that mean um, for staff that that is um, a second property within Vancouver. Uh, it's a point of information to city manager. The, the amendment doesn't distinguish so the way it's drafted presently. Right. So, um, I, you know, that would certainly be one piece that we would look at. Uh, again, we wouldn't, um, there's, there's, th those are issues that we would have to you know, take into consideration when right. we report back. Right. Um, and yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay. Ms. Alkenskar? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. So I will uh, move us over to a voting screen on this particular amendment. Sarah, Councillor Kirby Young, can I get a vote assist in favor, please? Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. That's noted. And that motion does pass with Councillors, uh, Councillor Fry, Councillor Swanson, and Councillor Boyle in opposition. Okay, so let's uh, take us back to the main queue. Just going to clear that queue. And uh, Councillor Hardwick, you have the floor. No, that's good for me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, over to Council Dominato. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, and I have a series of amendments. So I'm going to start with uh, the first one, which I sent to the clerks. I've numbered them for ease. Um, and that is an addition to Clause A. Uh, further, that notification of the empty homes tax increase from 3% to 5% for the 2023 vacancy tax reference year be included in the upcoming tax notices mailed and delivered electronically to property owners in May of 2022. And uh, this simply flows from the fact that um, I think it's really important that um, we communicate this information, paying a substantial amount of money to Canada Post to get uh, paper mailed notices out to alert people to their final payment for property taxes. And also, you know, lessons learned from the implementation of, of the vacancy taxes that in the first number of years, people were not aware of the empty homes tax and so legitimately missed making their declarations. So I think uh, in the spirit of transparency and accountability that we will notify um, property owners of this uh, proposed change if this passes this evening. So that's the first amendment, which is A. We're just dealing with that first, clerks, just to be clear. Just dealing with A. Yeah. Thank you. We'll move. There's three separate amendments, so we've got A on the screen. Okay, great. So we'll go to an amendment queue. And Council DiGenova speaking to the amendment. I think the more communication on something like this, the better. Uh, I mean, Mayor Stewart just said himself, we don't want to, you know, people going through difficult times in their lives. And I think about people who might live in their own homes, but do so with assistance. And, you know, maybe uh, their children have hired people to live with them uh, or, you know, there are other family members or relatives taking care of them that have stepped in. And, and I just think about, you know, maybe, maybe they're not checking the mail. Uh, maybe they're not sure how to file this. Um, I've heard those stories. I think we all have. We've received emails with all of these different circumstances. So I think the more communication that we can provide people with, especially, you know, with their tax notice, because if they're not missing their taxes, then we know that that's a good way to communicate. And I think that's really important. So I appreciate Councillor Dominato bringing this forward and I will be supporting it. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Stewart. There we go. Uh, yeah, I support this too. I, I do think that folks should uh, be well aware and have lots of time to prepare. So I, I think this is a, a, a good addition on the further side. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so we will go to a voting queue on this amendment. Chair, vote assist in favor, please. Councillor Kirby Young. Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. And that motion passes with none in opposition. Councillor Dominato, you still have the floor. Thank you, Chair. I'll continue. Uh, the second amendment. Sorry, just one second, Council Devin Adams is going to move us to an amendment queue. You can, okay, please go ahead. Please continue. Um, with respect to the uh, doubling of, of audits, uh, just that it reads the amendment is further that the cost of hiring additional staff to administer the increased audits will be fully cost recovered from the vacancy tax revenues. Okay, thank you very much. Um, giving councils a chance to jump on the queue to offer any comment. Seeing none. Oh, Mayor Stewart. Sorry, I'm just having too many buttons. Uh, no, I support this too. I, I do think that is actually what what's um, outlined in in the charter as it is, but it it uh, it doesn't help to doesn't hurt to re reinforce that. Great, thank you very much. So we'll move to a vote.
In favor, please vote assist. Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Councillor DiGenova. And that motion passes with none in opposition. And Councillor Dominato. Yes, thank you, Chair. And I'm proposing a new addition D uh, to the motion. And I'll just take us to an amendment Q. And please go ahead. That council directs staff to improve the empty homes tax web portal with the end user in mind to ensure property owners get clear information about the EHT and how to navigate the different reporting and appeal processes. And further, the staff council directs staff to explore and report back on how they can improve communication to property owners about EHT deadlines, noting that legitimate homeowners continue to meet missing deadlines and not receiving tax EHT um, notices and being unduly penalized. And this really flows from, and, and we heard it, uh, Councillor Hardwick spoke to this and, and Councillor DiGenova about the importance of fairness in terms of uh, procedure. Um, as the mayor noted at the beginning is that the empty homes tax was really put in place to deal with speculation and to ensure that the homes that we have in Vancouver serve the residents of Vancouver. And, um, and as we know at the beginning, uh, there were definitely some hiccups and that often happens with the implementation of a new program. Um, but we do continue to have concerns. I've literally talked to residents in just in the last two weeks who missed their notices. They were traveling, didn't get their paper mail. One just learned that he could sign up for email. Um, he was really grateful that staff pointed that out to him. And so I, I think there's just an opportunity here to uh, enhance uh, our communication and navigation tools so that p the public and residents can understand what the deadlines are, when they, if they get a bylaw ticket, how they can appeal that, um, and so on. And so um, I don't think this is contentious, but it is just around uh, clarity uh, uh, for, for the residents that we serve. Thank you, Councilor Dominato. Uh, Mayor Stewart. I think this is a good idea too, so I, I support this. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are going to move to a vote. See Councillor Fry on there. Oh, okay, Councillor Fry, sorry about that. I jumped screens too quickly. Go ahead. Councillor oh, Fry. Uh, I'm just going to send an amendment to the amendment. Uh, I appreciate this amendment. I think that uh, having nav tried to navigate the empty homes portal myself, it's very confusing. I think the other piece that's that's lacking is the ability for folks to report uh, empty homes. And that's come up uh, in a number of correspondences that I've had where folks are are concerned about an empty home and um, they they don't know how to report it. Now there is an ability to report it through 311, but it's or sorry, Van Connect, but I think it would be appropriate to have that uh, also articulated on the actual empty homes portal so that that uh, all residents of Vancouver, whether or not they have multiple homes or empty homes, uh, know what this um, this function of this empty homes tax is about. Okay, okay thank you, Councilor. I have a, just a quick question as chair, just to clarify that the motion does say and how to navigate the different reporting. So it would read how to report empty homes and how to navigate the different reporting and appeal processes that's not doing double duty on the reporting piece. So want to be clear on the intention. Uh, it's a question of me, I, I guess, yeah. I. The intention is to uh, allow, uh, I, I read, sorry, and, and I, perhaps that does need more clarification. I read the, the original amendment as how to how an empty home owner could report their second home or, or what have you, rather than a neighbor could report an empty home. Oh, so like a whistleblower. Correct, yeah. I understand, okay. I'm gonna back out of this conversation and, um, and advance Councilor DiGenova, thank you. Thanks, I'm gonna ask a point of information and I'm sorry, I'm gonna put our city manager on the spot, but I have a question. And if you don't have the information, I would like it. Um, I'd like to know how many empty homes were reported by an individual. Um, I mean, obviously it's all anonymous, but those homes were found not to be vacant. So it wasn't through a random audit process, which I know we do have sometimes. It wasn't through someone forgetting to fill out or file their empty homes tax notice. It was instead through a neighbor who, who knows, maybe Mr. Jones doesn't like the color of, you know, Mrs. Smith's house. And <laughs> I've heard of these situations. So I'd just like to know how many of those reports were found to be um, 
deemed not empty, those homes. Yep, thanks um, through the chair. Yeah, I would have to follow up with the team and, and get back to you on those stats. Would you? Thank you. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with this because it seems a bit, you know, uh, I'm, I'm concerned with, you know, how, how um, this could affect people that I've heard have been in those situations who don't have empty homes and it's, it's cost them a lot of their own time and money to try and appeal the process. Um, but for now, because, you know, uh, it, it is just giving more information to people about how to do something that we allow right now uh, this to be done, uh, I'll support it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I did realize we're on an amendment Q2 actually right now. So Councilor Dominata, I'm just gonna add you there and have you make your comments there. Oh, um, Chair, so please to address your comment and question is, is uh, the intent of the original amendment is for um, uh, property owners getting information about uh, de de doing declarations for their homes, um, the empty homes tax and how to navigate because we have several different appeal processes in, in place, depending on whether you get a bylaw ticket or you've been declared vacant um, by not filing. Um, I support what <laughs> Council Fry is trying to achieve here. It may have been better to be a further that Council Direct staff to add a mechanism to the portal to report empty homes that people are, because I've heard the same, just to echo that from residents, that they are observing homes in their neighborhoods that they think people are trying to skirt our system. So. Um, but I'm not going to hold it up. I mean, I, I just hopefully staff are taking it with that. They understand the nuance of the amendments. Okay, I hope. great. Yes, that, I'm getting that, a nod, so. Yes, I, I, would, I would agree. So that is a uh, great clarification. Thank you. And Councillor Fry. Uh, and, and thank you, uh, Councillor Dominato, for relating that you got a nod. Um, because, yes, uh, currently on the empty homes tax portal, there is no mechanism actually for reporting um, a suspected empty home or, or what have you. So I think that's that's what I was trying to get at here and I appreciate that it probably could have been worded a little differently, but the amendment came in just recently and obviously my amendment to the amendment came in even more recently. So uh, I appreciate that the city manager does understand the intent. That's, uh, that's great, thank you very much. Uh, so we'll move to a vote on the amendment to the amendment. And that motion pass. Sorry, let me just hang on one second. Let me just. I believe Councillor Kirby Young is now officially on an LOA, so will not be present for this vote. So we can mark Councillor Kirby Young is absent. Okay, and that motion does pass with none in opposition. Okay, so we'll go back to the amendment Q1 and we have an amended amendment. And Councillor DiGenova, do you, you have the floor. Thanks, I've also sent in amendments. I'll move them separately. So uh, we're right now just voting on this amended oh, amendment. My apologies, I, I didn't see a voting screen. I don't see one. No, 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 you're on the floor to comment, but oh, no, no, you don't that, need to that was a holdover. Okay, great, thank you. So we'll move to a vote on the amended amendment. And that amended amendment passes with none in opposition. So moving back to the main queue, Council Dominato, you still have the floor. That's it for me, thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Fry. <clears throat> yeah, uh, and I have submitted an amendment. Okay. Uh, these are, I'm just moving us These over. are amendments to, sure. Go ahead, Councillor Fry. Thanks, Chair. Uh, these are um, amendments to um, Article C. Um, I guess most uh, sort of obvious of one is, is reporting back early Q4 of 2022 rather than uh, Q1 2023, which was sort of after the fact. I think fair process would be to get some of this analysis before we actually implement it uh, so that a, a future council will be able to um, reflect on, on, on that as they are 
I'm going to have ownership of of this new uh, tax. Uh, uh, further, having a cost benefit analysis of what doubling the number of audits looks like, because that is articulated in the in the motion, and I think it's good to get a sense of of that cost benefit analysis and appreciate Councillor Dominato's earlier amendment that would have it self funding. Uh, also, how um, uh, adding the five or ten percent just in the analysis on, on how it would uh, further increase rental stock. And also reflecting on some of the concerns that we heard from staff that they uh, were worried that 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 the increase may significantly increase the risk of tax increase uh, tax evasion, sorry, or unintended consequences. And I think, out of respect for staff recommendation, I'd like to to see that added because they it has been articulated a number of times, and I think it's important to kind of uh, respect what staff has been telling us. Uh, now, actually, I don't see that in the amendment on the screen. There, I believe. There's a there's a, a bullet below that bullet. Yes, it's just uh, on a different okay. screen. Okay. Um, cool. We'll just yeah. Adjust, cool. Okay. We'll just adjust the screen so that it's on one shot there. Okay. Thank you, Councillor okay. Fry, and uh, Councillor Hardwick. Shouldn't this be uh, an amendment of the uh, amended motion that we just approved? Your amendment is included in the language on the screen. You may just notice it's not in red right now. It says having a second property and or having a second property. Oh, so it is amended from That's the am That's amended correct. amendment. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying. No problem. Um, okay, Councillor Boyle. Thanks. I'm just hoping as a point of information through you to staff that I, I can hear um, the feasibility of this changed timeline. So early, um, because we have a quiet period and an election, it's not, I'm just trying to figure out both when early Q4 would be and which council, and then um, also when this needs to be decided relative to um, making and communicating this decision for the following year. Okay, thank you very much. It's a question to the city manager. Thanks, Chair. Uh, so this council will have one meeting following the election prior to the uh, inauguration of the new council. Um, generally, that's not a meeting at which staff would be bringing substantive decisions to council, given that it's following the election. Certainly, a report back uh, is something that we could do. Um, but in terms of decisions, presumably at that point, the decision would kind of transition to the next council, which would then be in uh, late November, mid-November, December kind of time frame. So um, if this council is interested to have a report back uh, before the end of the term, um, we can do that. Um, okay, that's, that, that's helpful. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. Um, Mayor Stewart. I think these are all reasonable. I, I actually think, you know, if you think about the new council coming in too, it does give them the most uh, recent information or the or the best information before um, before the tax year. So I, I do agree with the, the change in the report back. I, I do think the um, if we did it at that point, then staff would have <clears throat> be able to provide uh, you know the council in the fall this uh, the, uh, the the information about the audits. I mean, we we still order it above, but if there was some massive problem with it, like we go back into a pandemic or whatever, there's there's an ability to inform council of that, and I think the the other additions are fine. So, so thanks for those. I think they're good changes. Thank you, uh, Mayor. So that brings us to the end of comments to this amendment. So I'm going to take us to a voting queue. <clears throat> Um, Chair, it's Councillor Kirby. I know I was able to stay on for a few more minutes. So can I have a vote assist in favor, please? Uh, thank you. We'll register your vote in favor. And that motion passes with unanimous support. Hey, Councillor Fry, you, uh, you have the floor. <clears throat> oh, well, th thanks, Chair. And I'll, I'll, I'll just close on. Um, Supporting this uh, amended motion, and uh, but I imagine Councillor Dijano has some further amendments, so I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Councillor Dijanova. Thanks. I have sent in amendments to the clerk. So I'll just move us over to this queue here. Go ahead. 
And I'd like to move them separately. So the First Amendment is that Council directs staff to bring forward changes to the empty homes tax to exempt vacant land that has never before been developed or been a dwelling. So this isn't, this isn't land that has ever had a structure on it, um, as in it's not land that has ever had a home on it. So we're not losing housing. Uh, but there are people stuck in that conundrum where they perhaps have a backyard, it's subdivided land. Um, we've heard from people actually quite recently on a heritage incentive report who are in this conundrum. Um, and I know that a number of councillors, including Councillor Carr, asked questions about that and why that was being held to the empty homes tax standard, even though it's part of an HRA. But it is. And, and I think, you know, it's one thing if someone tears down a home and leaves that land empty and vacant. But it's another thing if that land has never had a home or a dwelling on it. So I think that, you know, in the spirit of fairness, and we've been talking about that a lot tonight, um, it, it is important to, to consider uh, some of the hardships brought to people um, who are in this category and this situation as well. Mayor Stewart. Thanks. Uh... I, I do uh, see that it would be no problem to investigate this, but this uh, the way this is mo uh, this is written is that it, it's a it's a big change to the policy. And so if it was added to the list of things to report back on, that's fine, but I can't support it as a uh, as a change right off the bat. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councillor Fry. Yeah, uh, similar concerns to the mayor's as far as these are these are very prescriptive changes. Uh, I'm wondering, Chair, if I might ask a question of the city manager through you. Yes. And 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 that is how how would uh, this notion of exempting vacant land that has never been developed uh, be impacted by any future rezoning? Would that fetter our ability to with rezonings and 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 that kind of thing and larger sort of greenfield uh, developments that we're you know that are we're actually actively contemplating on the books right now. Uh, Mayor, uh, yeah, over to uh, City Manager. Uh, thanks, Chair. O off the top of my head, I'm not sure that there would be any relationship between the application of the empty homes tax and the application of the zoning and development bylaw, but that's a question I probably want to refer uh, back to our legal staff to get you a definitive answer on. Okay, thank you. I, I, I'm i still, I think that there's there's a little bit too much gray around this one for me to support and I think because it's such a prescriptive direction and that in fact when we contemplate areas like I don't know Sanok or uh, the Heatherlands or the Jericho and all these places that, that technically haven't been developed before or been a dwelling including um, places that are being rezoned from commercial like the one we just recently approved at Broadway and um, Broadway and Granville, which technically was never a dwelling, it was always commercial property, that would, under this policy, be exempted. Um, and so I, I, I'm, I'm going to pass on these amendments. Thanks. Councilor DiGenova. Thanks. I, I just want to clarify that we're only speaking to one amendment right now, and it's the First Amendment. Um, so I, I will be supporting this for the reason that I stated, and if the spirit of the empty homes tax is what we say it is, and it's uh, to make sure that, that we uh, replace housing and that houses are homed unless uh, the city is offering some type of encampment option where people can pitch a tent on this vacant land instead of charging the landowner for it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that it is fair and in that spirit. And, you know, we have already heard from people. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, there are people who have come before us, like Michael Geller, uh, who came before us and, and shared uh, an experience where uh, that, that did happen to someone he was working with. Um, and we've heard from, uh, you know, a person who who genuinely said she would rent a home if there was a home on her property. And because of the way it's tied up in the HRA right now, and it's never had a dwelling on it, she can't do anything. And she's being charged the empty homes tax every single year. So I, I don't think it's fair 
and I'm, I'm not going to um, back down on this amendment for that reason. Uh, I could have just said vacant land, but I was very specific to say uh, vacant land that has never, never before been developed or had a dwelling on it. So uh, that's what I'll say to that. But I actually have a point of information with my time on this, uh, just, just through the chair to the city manager. And I'm wondering if you can tell me if um, land owned by MST is exempt from the empty homes tax. Question to city manager. I have to confirm that and get back to you, Councillor. Okay, thanks. Oh, that's all, Councillor Di Genova? That's all. Okay, Councillor Domenato. Uh, thanks, Chair. And, and, and just to, um, in brief, speak in support of this amendment. Uh, and again, it stems uh, from my knowledge of the introduction of the empty homes tax and, and the vacancy declaration, which, of course, I wasn't on council at the time. However, I did follow it in, in the media. And, and as the mayor noted at the outset, is it was really a response to um, uh, speculation as speculators as well as uh, people making real estate investments and whether that had, was strata condos or detached homes um, and leaving them empty and putting pressure on our housing stock where people couldn't find homes to either own or to rent. And um, I am of the view that at the time that this was being debated, it was not contemplated that this was to uh, tax um, lands that had never been developed or never had a home or a dwelling on it. It was to ensure that uh, homes that were left vacant were returned to the market for people to live in and uh, a vacant piece of land that doesn't have a dwelling is, is not something you can live in. It has to have a built structure. And so from that perspective, I, I think it, it warrants to be uh, looked at and addressed um, in the spirit of uh, the, the policy and the program that was brought forward in um, almost five years ago now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dominato. Councillor Hardwick. The whole point of the empty homes tax was to get empty homes um, made available to people to live in. How we think an empty, a, a piece of vacant land that's never been developed would would uh, would qualify for empty homes tax is perplexing. And moreover, uh, what kind of false equivalency is it that we would say this was like Broadway and Granville? Um, this. Uh, so my question then, through you, Chair, to, to the city manager or to staff, is. Um, how many pieces of property are we actually uh, applying empty homes tax to that are exempt, are, are vacant land? Is this question to city manager? Thanks, Chair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't have that number uh, offhand, um, councillors. It's, it's not a huge number, but I would say just to clarify that it was contemplated that the intent empty homes tax application to vacant property was a development incentive. Um, so that was, in fact, intentional. Uh, and again, the intention was to provide an incentive to actually develop that vacant residential property into dwelling units. So that's obviously a policy that council could change. But just to clarify that particular point, in terms of the number, uh, again, I'd have to follow up with you on that. Yes, please. Thank you, Councillor uh, Hardwick. So uh, we can go to a vote on this first amendment moved by Councillor Di Genova. Vote assist in favor, please, Councillor Kirby Young. Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Vote assist in favor. And that motion does fail uh, with Councillor Carr, Councillor Fry, Councillor Swanson, Councillor Boyle, and Mayor Stewart in opposition. I have a point of procedure, uh, Chair. Yes, Mayor. Um, I just because I've read it so many times, I, I think that you have to have your video on in order to be uh, uh, be able to vote on these matters or in chambers. I just was hoping you could refresh my memory on that one. Uh, you're correct. I, I'm seeing uh, Councillor Kirby Young's video on now, and I wasn't looking at that screen directly during that vote. I know it's a bit tricky to track votes, but it's a good uh, point. So if you are planning to vote, please keep your video on. Thank you um, for that. So we'll go back to our main queue with uh, Councillor Nova. I have a second amendment if we could right. remove ten. Go ahead. Come up on screen. And the second amendment that I have is uh, the council direct staff 
to bring forward changes to the empty homes tax to exempt properties formally in the development process with the City of Vancouver beyond one year. And Council, we have heard from people, we have heard from Michael Geller recently as well, that there are properties that literally are in the development process, but it's taking longer because they can't get their excavation permit or they can't get another type of permit that, you know, in between their DP and their BP, and they are being charged the empty homes tax. And I think that if they're in the development process, so right now it's one year. So you have one year from that process to avoid the empty homes tax. And I think that that, you know, considering our processes can take longer than a year, and we just had this conversation about DCLs, council, and the waiver, that this is completely fair. And in, in my opinion, to vote against this would be to vote against the spirit of the tax. Because as, as the city manager said, we are trying to incentivize development. So I'll leave it there Thank on you. that one. Thank you, Councilor DiGenova. Seeing no um, other, oh, Mayor Stewart. Yeah, thanks. I uh, will be voting against this too. Again, this is a uh, this is not a consideration. This is a, a direction to uh, quite substantially alter uh, the structure of the tax as it is. Uh, and so I I think that uh, although uh, Mr. Geller may have some points to make, I don't think that's enough to uh, support this. So again, if it was under uh, considerations for staff to look at, that would be fine with me, but I, I don't support this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Fry. Yeah, I, you know, I'm supportive of the idea of of exempting empty homes tax on properties that may be somewhat delayed in their DP uh, because of of city processes and red tape. I'm just I'm just not sure how broad this definition is as it's as it's as it's laid out here. So I guess question for the city manager through you, Chair, is uh, what kind of delays might we see in the development process that potentially have nothing to do with the city and they could be from the, the the developer themselves or the property owner, like legal challenges with partners or whatever. Is that a potential? City manager. Thanks. So there is, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, uh, once, um, obviously the development process is controlled by the applicant. Um, so they have, they could, uh, it, it would open up the potential that that parties could manipulate the process intentionally to avoid paying the empty homes tax. And again, as the value of the empty homes tax goes up, the incentive to, to, to use those sort of tactics also increases would, would be the worry. Um, there is a mechanism now, and I think Patrice's MP on, is online, where um, in circumstances where there's legitimate delays in the uh, development process, that, that DBL staff can make an exception or authorize an exemption to the one year. Um, Patrice, I'm not sure if you're on the WebEx, if you can speak to that. Just a point of procedure first, if I may. Point of procedure, I'll just pause your timer, Councillor Fry. I'm sorry, sure. Chair. For member motions, it's my understanding only the city manager's here, and it's only ever been the mayor's motions that we've had additional staff on the line to answer questions. Dan Garrison was here for the um, making home motion, and now we have Patrice MP. So am I under the impression that that we can all have staff on the line for our motions? I take your point. Uh, I'll just ask for clarification from the yeah. city manager yeah, in terms and of what we then, can expect. Uh, that's fine. Happy, happy to dispense with that. I don't, I don't think Patrice is on anyways. So um, it's, you know, these are obviously tech, a lot of, council's asking a lot of technical questions about a, the implication of a tax. Again, our, our general recommendation from staff would be on issues like this of significance is council seek report back. Um, so that we can provide you with full information about the implications of the decision you're making. Mm -hmm. um, I want to make sure, obviously, in standing here that I'm giving you as much information. If you're going to be making decisions tonight on the structure of the tax, we give you as much information as possible on that. I'm not an expert, to be honest, on the application of, and the details of the empty homes tax program. Um, but the, I'll give you my best effort and, and can try and contact staff offline here. Um, so that was that's my intent. I think that's reasonable. Thank you, city manager. Um, yeah, and, and so I uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks, City Manager. I appreciate how difficult this this construct makes it for our staff and City Manager, especially when we have 
really strong directions rather than a report back as is the case with this amendment. I won't be supporting it. I, I, I am passingly familiar enough with the empty homes tax ability to uh, work with folks who are unnecessarily delayed through. In fact, I, I know that that is a condition of empty homes tax right now that if there's some kind of delay on account of the city, I very much take the uh, city manager's concerns that this provides a very big window of opportunity to totally game the system. So I absolutely will not be supporting this amendment. Thanks. And uh, Councilor DiGenova. I just wanted to say that I don't think it's gaming the system when you're involved in a process and you just can't get through the process fast enough to get a DCL waiver. We just dealt with that. And Councilor Fry, you in fact supported that here at this council. I, I do think that the word formally, formally involved, it, this is my time, I believe. It's fine. Please just continue, this, Councilor thank you. Um Just thought I heard someone not on mute. Um, I think that it is important that we consider that there is a formal process. If you're not a part of that formal process or staff reject you from that formal process because they think you're abusing it, that is where I think the checks and balances are. But I also know of a number of projects, more than I can count on my hands, uh, that have been, that have had to either fight an appeal and go to the director of planning, which puts more pressure on our, our, on our GM of PDS, Teresa O'Donnell, because she's having to look over whether or not they should be exempt from the empty homes tax instead of doing the other planning and development work that we've directed her to do and that she has to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's where this is coming from. I just wouldn't want this to be uh, positioned as anything else other than it is. We try and encourage development of housing especially. Um, you know, and, and I thought that that was one of one of the sentiments of the empty homes tax. But if I'm incorrect, I, I suppose I'm going to learn that tonight um, to see. I mean, if if we're promising people that we will get them through the process in one year, that's fine. But I know that that's not happening. And I also just want to take this opportunity to say, uh, you know, I, I understand that there were other points of procedures called, and I think that it's important that there's fairness here for everyone. And I'm sorry if I put the city manager in a position uh, uh, there. I know we put him on the sp spot quite often. And I just wanted to say that I welcome a motion to have other staff on the line for all of our motions, if that's something that council chooses to do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor DiGenova. Uh, I do believe then that we can move to a vote on this amendment. And that motion does fail with Councillor Carr, Councillor Fry, Councillor Swanson, Councillor Hardwick, Councillor Boyle, and Mayor Stewart in opposition. So that will take us back to the main queue. And I've sent in a third amendment, Chair. Okay. Um, let's go to an amendment queue. Okay, and we can go ahead. And Council DiGenova, please feel well, free to. Uh, I would hope this wouldn't be too controversial, but I think that it's really important and it's uh, a part of our commitment as a city to reconciliation. The council directs staff to bring forward changes to exempt uh, land owned by uh, MST from the empty homes tax. Thank you, Council DiGenova. Uh, Mayor Stewart. Thanks again. I would uh, be very open to this if it was put under something for staff to look at. But again, this is uh, just uh, uh, it's prescriptive and it would change it right away and exempt one particular. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the three nations individually or the development corporation, but um, again, I would I would suggest the counselor this go back to staff to look at. So I won't be supporting this. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councillor Boyle. Um, thanks. I was just um, working. We're just one amendment deep right now. Is that the case? That's right. Okay. I, I was just working on an amendment to this amendment. Um, so I can either let my clock run or or pass the floor to Councillor DiGenova while I do that. Seeing she's on the list, maybe I'll put myself back below her. Okay. Councillor DiGenova. Uh, point of information, how long do you need, Councillor Boyle? How long should I do some herbal tap dancing well, for? 
we don't need that. Councilor uh, Boyle has plenty of time. So, uh, so I just wanted to say that in the spirit of reconciliation and what we've said we'd do as a city, um, be it the Development Corporation or MST, uh, the lands owned by MST, many of them are in the Development Corporation. I think that, uh, you know, that this is something obviously that I just would have hoped from the start uh, would have been exempt in the first place. Um, and actually it was Councilor Fry mentioning Sanok. Uh, that made me think of this. So uh, I'm, I'm just hoping that in the spirit of what we've said we would do um, and the actions that we said we would take and, you know, being very cognizant, being a member of the UNDRIP task force, that I think that it is very important. And I welcome, you know, Councillor Boyle adding, you know, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Tooth Nations, as well as the Development Corporation. Um, but, I mean, to hold this back at all and wait for a report back, I mean, reconciliation shouldn't wait just like I've said hate shouldn't wait but if if that's the will of council that they want this to wait for a year to come back uh, that's a year of possible empty homes tra tax charges I suppose for some of some of that land I'll leave it there and see if Councilor Boyle's ready to submit her amendment thank you Councilor DiGenova Councilor Boyle oh Thanks. sorry um, I'm just, just going to pause oh. for one second I do see our city manager is risen on a point of my apologies. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I appreciate you allowing me to jump in. And this is to partially answer the question that Councillor DiGenova asked before about application of the tax to land owned by First Nations. Um, that uh, land that uh, constitutes reserve, uh, so that would include Sanok as well as Musqueam's reserve, is exempt from the EHD. So that, that exists now. That's in place now. So presumably this, this amendment would be referring to land that's not reserve but would be owned by the nations or MSTDC, however council decides to kind of structure the amendment. That, that's the land in question, I think, um, in the scope of the amendment here. Okay, I appreciate that clarification uh, for the public as well. Uh, Councilor Boyle. Thanks, I circulated an amendment to this amendment. Uh, I think it is worth considering and getting that information back um, and uh, so have just amended the language to be um, in that spirit so we can make a, a decision, a more informed decision on, on what I agree is certainly an important consideration for us as a council and also uh, an important consideration related to our relationships with the host nations. Okay, thank you. I am going to move us to an amendment Q2 and uh, Mayor, you're up first. Thanks. Uh, I think this uh, fixes this, so uh, I'll support uh, this amendment to the amendment. Thanks. Thank you. Councilor DiGenova. Thanks. I, I don't see a timeline on this, Councillor Boyle, so I'm wondering if there's a timeline that you're planning on proposing to this as to when this would come back to Council? It's a point of information um, to or, yeah, of the motion. Of Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I had in my mind that it would be the same timeline as the report um, back of other considerations in the motion, uh, so hadn't um, been uh, worried about adding it, but okay. it, it could be added. Thanks. I no, no, nope, don't need to add it. I, I just wanted to make sure that, and I think staff will understand that. I just saw other councillors adding, you know, timelines to their amendments if they were staff report back. Um, you know, although I'm hesitant, I'd just like to move forward with this now. And we are known as a dysfunctional council that does a lot of thinking and not a lot of doing. Um, I'll support this because I think it will pass if I do, but I'd, I'd rather see it happen more quickly. So I, I'll support this reluctantly uh, because we will get a report back on something that we're currently not considering. And I think that that is important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, over to a vote on the amendment to the amendment. And that motion passes with none in opposition. So I'll just take us back to the first amendment here. Council Boyle, you have the floor. Uh, no, nothing more to say. Thanks, Chair. Okay. And uh, I see, Mayor, you're on, but that may have been a holdover from the amendment to the amendment. No, I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Council DiGenova? No, I hope this is supported. And I think that if. Um I just want to say that had I had I thought to do this some time ago during another empty homes tax report, I would have because I think it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. So we can go to a vote on the amended amendment.
and that motion passes with unanimous support. So we will go back to the main queue and um, Councilor DiGenova, you have the floor. Thanks. I have a point of information for Mayor Stewart. Please ask your question. Okay. Mayor Stewart is the mover of this motion and because you're so um, concerned about getting information back, uh, so that's been one of the, the points that you've made and many amendments that have been brought forward. I'm wondering, are, is your motion directing staff to implement a 5% tax, uh, to increase the tax to 5% or to report back on it? Increase to five. Okay, is there a reason that you wouldn't support other actions now, but you'd like them to be report backs? It's not really a point of information. No, I think we're going to have to just close that this That is up. a point of information. It's going to be a, have to be a debate, uh, Council DJ, where, we, where okay, you get I'll, to make I'll your rephrase that. And I have a point of information. Um, I, I'm wondering if um, if you had considered other actions aside from the just the increase of the tax. I'm not going to allow that one. Sorry, Council DJ, it's not a point of information that pertains directly to this motion. Uh, we're coming to the end of our uh, discussion as the queue um, shows. There is nobody on the queue, so I, Councillor Dominato, to the amended motion. Uh, thanks. And are, are we just speaking to the the final? The motion? final amended. Okay. Motion. Thank you. Um, yes. Just to uh, uh, add some comments, I appreciated comments that Councillor Hardwick made uh, earlier, and I know she's made previously in this council around. Um, uh, the empty homes declaration, um, particularly uh, around the intent of this at the time when it was brought forward, which was to ensure that uh, for those residents who live in the city or aspire to live in the city, that there are homes for them to live in and that they were not left uh, empty. And so um, acknowledging uh, that and the important role that this has played, particularly in the first year or two of implementation, we certainly saw um, many more homes returned to uh, both the rental and home ownership market. And I, I think that was an important change. And, um, and so uh, I have supported uh, this throughout, um, while I wasn't here for the introduction of it, have supported it throughout the, the term I've been on council. Um, and I, I just want to acknowledge that, um, as Councillor DiGenova just noted, is that there's a clear direction in this motion um, and that um, staff have, you know, communicated to Council that um, it does bear some risk. Uh, I will hope that um, if this passes, um, that staff will be reporting back uh, as, with, as soon as possible, reasonably possible, on um, uh, the, how the um, change from 1% to 3%, what kind of impact that has had because it hasn't been evaluated according to staff. Um, staff do note uh, that increasing the uh, EHG tax rate um, increases the risk of tax evasion and unintended consequences. And um, that um, they certainly express concern that uh, potentially um, it could have some detriment to the program. And what I heard throughout the amendments and dialogue tonight at council is that council supports this by and large um, and that they want to see empty homes available to residents and families to live in. Um, but I, I, I do note here that there is some risk identified by staff. So, um, and, and that um, I hope that uh, it will be evaluated um, and that there will be a, a, a swift report back um, around um, uh, the last changes. Um, and, you know, that being said as well, I'm, I'm just going to, aside from the uh, program, I am just going to note that um, on the political side, I see there's been correspondence, and I can't attribute it directly to the mayor, but to his field organizer for Forward Together, noting that um, allies and council have said they want to scrap the empty homes tax to help speculators. And I think it's really important to put on the record that I and I have not heard anyone on this council uh, say that they want to scrap the empty homes tax. So uh, that information is very misleading, and I certainly never said that, uh, but uh, that certainly seems to be the information that's being communicated to the public at this time. So I'm just noting that for the record. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dominato. Councillor Carr. 
Yeah, I, I'll be brief, but I, I just want to thank the mayor for bringing this forward. Uh, I think that um, it's a good move. I've loved the empty homes tax from its beginning. Um, it's gone through a, a period of time where, you know, kinks had to be worked out. Um, but uh, the whole point of it from the beginning uh, was uh, to make sure it was, it was an Andy Yan study, actually, um, that pointed out the, degree, the number of condos in downtown Vancouver that were empty uh, that led to, um, to uh, the consideration of this uh, empty homes tax coming forward. Um, and the whole point of it was to ensure that homes don't sit empty in a city that's desperate for housing. Um, and so uh, it's, it's achieved that. Um, the secondary consequence has been um, the tax itself has helped fund the building of more homes that are affordable for people who are really in deep need of affordable housing. It's, it's a win-win. Um, situation as far as I'm concerned and um, and although I, I I'm hopeful that we are going to get um, more information to um, uh, buy it from staff on the consequences of the 3% increase and then ultimately higher increases um, to see it, to see the consequences. Um, uh, I'm hopeful that they will um, be ones that will, the consequences will be uh, positive in both uh, returning homes um, to people to live in uh, instead of sitting empty um, with the corollary, if that doesn't happen, of a tax to enable us to build homes. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Uh, Councillor Swanson. Yeah, I think 5% is a good idea. I'll be interested to see what happens with the staff think about 10%. I think it's good that uh, we get the homes to get rented. And it's also good that we get the re revenue to put into social housing. So the more we can get, the better. Thank you, Councillor Swanson. Uh, so that brings us to um, the vote on the final amended motion. And I see there was a note from Councillor DiGenova looking to possibly sever. So Councillor DiGenova, I just want to bring your attention to where we're at in the process if you We're going to go ahead and vote on the full motion right now. It, it was emailed the minute after you. Oh, I haven't it. seen it yet, so let me. It's in your inbox. Okay, I'd like to just request um, a moment to review it. I'm noting that some people might want to mute their mics, but um, I'm fine without severing. Okay. So we'll go ahead and we'll have one vote. Thank you. So you can call the vote now. And if you vote on screen, please. And that motion uh, passes with none in opposition. Okay, hey, so thank you very much. Uh, we are now, uh, this concludes item seven on the agenda. We're now moving to our last referred motion, uh, which is item eight, CCTV cameras for the purpose of public safety and deterring and solving violent crime, which was moved and introduced by Council DiGenova and seconded by Councillor Hardwick. So we do have speakers to this motion and we will um, move to those speakers now. We do have our first speaker, um, Eddie Elmer. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, you have five minutes and please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, good evening, <clears throat> Mayor and Council. My name is Eddie Elmer and I support this motion. Uh, I have lived in downtown Vancouver for 21 years now and know my neighborhood quite intimately. Um, unfortunately, I've also been the victim of several violent crimes and hate incidents over the last two years. Uh, I'm a PhD student in social gerontology, co-chair of the city's 2SLGBTQ plus advisory committee, and vice chair of the Correctional Service of Canada Citizen Advisory Committee for Metro Vancouver West Community Corrections. I'm not speaking on behalf of any of these committees, but I do mention these facts to demonstrate that I think I'm fairly attuned to what's happening in my city. 
Over the last five decades, there have been over 160 studies around the world examining the effectiveness of CCTV cameras in preventing crime. Because these studies have varied in size, methodology, and overall results, I've looked at two meta-analyses published in 2019 and 2021, one in the journal called Criminology and Public Policy, and the other in the International Journal of Comparative and Applied Criminal Justice. Both analyses included 76 studies in which CCTV was the primary crime reduction intervention, and the second analysis added four studies where CCTV was not necessarily the primary intervention. All of the studies involved, at a minimum, a before and after measure of criminal incidents compared to a similar control area without CCTV camera. The studies had an average follow-up time of 18 months and were mostly from the UK, the US, Canada, and Sweden. Overall, crime decreased by about 10 to 13 percent in areas with CCTV versus adjacent areas without. The largest overall reductions were in the UK at 20 percent and the US at 7 percent. For specific crimes, there was about a 14 percent reduction in both property and vehicle crime. There was also a 5 percent reduction in violent crime, although this was not statistically significant in the whole sample. However, when looking at the UK alone, there was about a 15 percent reduction in violent crime, and this was statistically significant. Also of note, CCTV effects were largest in car parks, followed by residential areas. They were also highest for active or semi-active versus passive CCTV monitoring, and interventions were most effective if they used at least two complementary methods, such as signage, enhanced police operations like directed patrols or foot patrols, uh, additional street lighting, or building access control. Of note, the studies in the UK were more likely to use active monitoring and complementary interventions, which may explain why the interventions were more effective in that country. Now, some of these percentages may sound small, but they do translate to substantial reductions in absolute crime. Moreover, regarding violent crime in particular, even a modest risk reduction is worth exponentially more given the ongoing trauma, fear, and impairment felt by victims, their families, and communities. In addition to reductions in actual crime, CCTV can enhance perceived safety, especially in high crime areas. And this is important because research shows that perceived safety is vital for mental health, social participation, and active living. Moreover, when people feel safe to go outside, there are more eyes and ears on the street, which has a criminal deterrent effect in its own right. I'd also like to mention something about clearance rates. That is the number of criminal cases where a suspect is identified by police. Based on my review, there's not enough research to draw adequate conclusions on this, but I'd like to mention something personal. Last year, I was violently assaulted and robbed in the downtown core. As it happened, no businesses in the area had CCTV or the CCTV was not pointed to the street. As a result, my case has dragged on for nearly a year and has necessitated the use of a photo lineup, which greatly reduces the chance that I will see any justice or feel any closure in my case. No doubt many others have experienced the same, including other marginalized people, who I will add are up to 23 times more likely to be victims of crime. I should note that if public cameras are considered, they should be located in high crime areas, provide maximum view coverage and resolution, and be paired with good street lighting. Even the best camera is useless in low visibility conditions. And in closing, it should also go without saying that the public should be made fully aware of the reason for the use of these cameras, where they are located, what kind of information is being captured, how the information will be used, what the results are in terms of crime prevention and clearance rates, and how privacy rights will be protected. Transparency is critical because we fear most what we don't know. If this motion passes, I trust that staff will do a very thorough job assessing these matters and in providing a thorough cost-benefit analysis for a full rollout, or at the very least, a more limited pilot project of the type described in the meta-analyses I discussed. Thank you. Thank you. And you do have questions, Eddie, so if you'll just remain on the line. Uh, sure. First up is Councilor DiGenova. Hi, Eddie. Thanks so much uh, for, for sharing your own personal experiences and all of your research and, and data. Uh, the VPD actually shared some evidence and data with us today as well on how CCTV cameras have been shown to decrease crime. And I'm just wondering, you know, can you speak a little bit to what you hear about in your neighborhood? You know, I, I know we have eight speakers signed up tonight. I'm sure there's more than, or maybe it's 10. Uh, but maybe, I'm, I'm just wondering, there's a lot of people who don't come to these meetings because they're very long. And I'm wondering if you, if you can share with me a little bit about um, if you've had conversations with others and how they feel about this in your community. 
Yeah, well, I do have, thank you for the question, uh, Councillor. I do have many conversations with people in my neighborhood. Um, almost every day, there's some kind of conversation about uh, growing crime. I, I won't specify where, which neighborhood I live in in particular, but it is a growing concern. And the topic of CCTV cameras has come up many times, and there are many people who do want them. There are some who don't, and, the, and they have their, their reasons, but many do. Um, I don't know if we'll hear from them at this at this meeting. I mean, I you know, I'm sure there are a lot of people that would like to come and speak at council meetings, but they never know when they'll be when their turn will be to speak because many of us are working and we can't just um, lock off our whole day. Um, other people I know would like to speak, but they are kind of uncomfortable to share their views on this topic because they've seen how much people get criticized. Um, particularly on social media, for saying anything positive about about this kind of of approach, um, but yes, there are there are people who who do agree with this, and um, yeah, I'm I'm one of them. Thanks, and and I was just going to ask you, do you think it would make you feel safer in your neighborhood or walking in the community uh, or to the places that you frequent if there was CCTV cameras? Um, you know, kind of picking up those gaps. We've heard from the VPD that, you know, not all privately owned CCTV cameras have the same quality and there there are huge gaps. Sometimes there's absolutely no footage, um, you know, covering public areas from private cameras. Does that concern you? Mm -hmm. Do you feel less safe? Well, I, I, I can certainly speak about what, ha I would 100% feel safer with cameras better cameras, better quality cameras. I did mention earlier, I mean, there is a case, I, won't, I can't get into details because it's still in the whole legal limbo, um, but there, there was no footage there and it's just made the whole case much, much more difficult to prove. I had another incident um, near Canada Place where somebody, this was during Pride, I was just hanging out um, not in an ungodly hour, <laughs> just hanging out and somebody um, was sitting there and told me I was blocking his view and that this area is not for gay people and that gay people belong in Davie Street. And he got up and almost hit me. Um, police did investigate that and there was some video footage, but it was not of the best quality. And no Eddie, I'm really did, sorry, pardon. but... Um, yep. I just want to say thank Genova you. Is way over time. So I just wanted on a point have... of procedure, chair. On a point of procedure, <clears throat> uh, yes, or Let's maybe it's a point of privilege. But my timer just jumped from 3:08 to 3:16 in one second. So we may need to go back to the manual timing. Okay, I'm going to just keep an eye on that. Thank you. Thank you, I, uh, Eddie. You do have more questions from Council Dominato. Hi, Eddie. Um, <laughs> thanks for calling in. Um, I'm very sorry to hear about your experiences, and I know you've shared them publicly of, of being a victim of crime. And um, I want to get your perspective because what I'm hearing is that you support the use of CCTV. Um, and, I, and what I'm wrestling with is that the motion gives a very clear direction of implementation um, to look at areas and then come back with recommendations about what those areas of the city should be, and and the cost. And I'm I'm curious if you think that this warrants a broader engagement of the public because there are concerns as you noted on both sides there's the public safety considerations to your point and then there's the privacy considerations and and so uh, do you have any thoughts on that well i'm all you know i'm on advisory committee so i'm always <laughs> always reading uh staff reports and i enjoy reading um staff reports i i, I would be happy to see i'm just pulling up the motion here i already um Okay. Um, I mean, it is a bit on the prescriptive side, and I mean, I, I wouldn't mind seeing um, something in there about having more consultation, at least with um, advisory committees. Um, I wouldn't be averse averse to that. Um, I, I mean, I, this is a real. It is a really big issue, and this is something that staff, I think, really need to evaluate, especially in terms of cost cost benefit and there is a lot of research as I've stated 160 studies from around the world um, so I, I, it deserves um, it deserves study from a, from a broad level and also at a more more specific level in terms of, of implementation and how it would how the implementation would work in a city like ours yeah well, I, I don't think your question. 
You no, know, I think you have in part because I think it is a, 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 a an issue of interest of the public. Yes, we have there is video use and um, surveillance use in in retail and stores, bars, the, you know, um, transportation, so on. So there, um, but um, I do think people view it a bit differently when it's uh, the city. But I um, I also hear you know people are concerned about public safety and and how do they feel safe. But then to your point, you said there's studies that support it. But I've also read some studies that say it doesn't deter crime. So I'm just can you comment on that? Have you did you come across similar studies as well? That well, the uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Is that the question? Yes, yes. <laughs> sorry, okay. I'm tired. Uh, just so thirty that, seconds, oh, no, no Eddie. Problem. Just not too much time. So here. The, okay, the reason that I so I quoted meta analyses where they have they take all these studies and they put them in one big pot, so they have a really big sample and they try to see what is the overall pattern of results. And the results are what I stated before, that there is a criminal deterrent effect depending on the particular type of crime. So yes, there are studies that, that have different opposing effects, but overall, there does appear to be a modest uh, impact on crime reduction. I can't say much about actual clearance rates and investigation. Okay, um, we'll have to leave it there. Understand. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eddie. I appreciate you have it. You're you welcome. Have, you have questions? Councillor Fry, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And uh, uh, sorry to hear you um, uh, were assaulted. That's that's horrible. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and you uh, and and you mentioned wanting to see cameras installed in in areas where there's a lot uh, high high criminality and cameras and lights. And what about? Um, but you were assaulted in in Canada Place. Are you also suggesting that we need them sort of more prevalently throughout the city? I'm trying to my head around it well i mean it would be you know you have to work with police to identify where there are these kinds of um where there's more criminal activity i do just based on my observation because i walk every night i have noticed quite a bit of activity in the particular i don't want to say where exactly this incident occurred but i have seen quite a bit of activity there um partly i think maybe just because it's darker um at the very least i'd like to see better lighting in that in that area um, but yeah, I mean, there, there are areas that I note, and I'm sure the BPD has statistics on, on which areas are problematic. I, I know Chinatown is a, a area of particular concern. Um, that's somewhere we might want to start and like have a little pilot project to see, you know, what is the effect there and what's working, what's not, what can we tweak before rolling out anything, anything major? Because that's what all of these studies do. You know, they try this out in different cities and particular neighborhoods. and go from there rather than just doing a full rollout. Yeah, no, certainly. And I've, I've heard that it, installing them once is like pushing water around. So then it, you put it in one place and then the activities will move to another place to avoid the camera and you're creating a new zone. So you have to keep kind of building on the camera well, system and more cameras, yeah. more lighting, more cameras. Well, actually, I'm curious though. Uh, well, I, I want, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. No, you go I ahead. You go ahead. The, the meta-analysis meta interestingly showed that so that what you've described is called displacement. And they found mm -hmm. the majority of studies showed that there was no displacement. And actually there was a, a beneficial effect even in non-adjacent parts of the community. So there were sort of other, what's the word that they use? Diffusion effects, positive diffusion effects. And I, I haven't read that, so many studies. Interesting, that, I've, I've read the opposite. But, but I just wanna, my last question for you then is obviously during the pandemic and stuff, we've had to, Everybody's more wearing masks, and and the, the the technology has moved more towards biometrics to sort of figure out who somebody is with 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 just the benefit of maybe seeing their eyes or the bridge of their nose. Are are, are you are you thinking biometrics is the way to go with the CCTV? So that's I facial identi that, yeah. identification. Yeah, well, I know that in in both of these papers that I cited, there's a nice discussion about about that, particularly in the second one. Um, I don't have an opinion on the facial recognition, but there are some interesting technologies. One of them, what's the name of Sorry, it? Eddie, um, you're going to have to share that maybe by email. Um, unfortunately, the three minutes goes very quickly. Uh, so, Councillor Fry's time's up, but we do have uh, Councillor Carr on the list. Thank, thanks very much. Uh, and if you have just a, a few seconds to finish the sentence you were in the middle of, I, I'm fine about hearing that, Eddie. Oh, super. So I was just going to say, and I've, I've lost my thought. I don't remember what I was saying. Uh, 
Yeah, so maybe um, maybe you'll remember it. Um, uh, well, we've talked about this, and, and I appreciate so much you sharing with me um, and now sharing with council um, the it's just abhorrent crimes against you. And um, I think public awareness is so incredibly important on this, so thank you for that. Um, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering um, about the advisory committees you are, you are on, if there's been any discussion, um, I know you've been on, this, on, the, uh, on several, um, if there's been any discussion uh, about the situation around violent crime at those committee levels. Um, we've talked about crime, um, where have we talked about? So we haven't talked about this motion because this came quite late. We just didn't, we only meet once a month. Right. We did talk about issues last term on Davies Street and the Jim Ziva Plaza and people feeling unsafe in that area. Um, and we talked about um, just difficulties people have with hate crime reporting. So we've focused on those two things. Right. Um, okay. And, that that yeah, that makes sense in the timeline on this makes sense. Um, are you planning on speaking to, um, uh, on, gee, it's already Wednesday, so tomorrow night, um, to the um, public meeting that's, uh, that we are, it's a special council meeting, actually, um, on violent crime, um, sorry, um, sorry, on, on vi violent crime in, uh, throughout the safety. city. Yeah. yeah, so are you planning on public safety as well? Um, are you speaking to it, and do you know if, if uh, any of the, the um, uh, advisory committees you are on are intending also to speak um, to that, to us, to council? Well, yeah. So I'll, I'll be speaking soon. I think I'm number number two, and I'll be speaking more about my personal experience because I think right. that's as, just as important as the research. Um, the advice. I don't know any advisory committees that are speaking. We, our committee. We have quite a lot of diverse views about about all of this mm -hmm. and about public safety, so there wouldn't we wouldn't be able to come up with a statement that we all agree on <laughs> uh, to present. So, okay, that's okay. Uh, I, I'm on several of the advisory committees uh, as a liaison, and I do know that opinions often vary widely on the advisory committees. Yes. But that's mm -hmm. that's the Which joy of them. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> that's yeah. right. Um, okay, I'm I'm good at the other questions that have been answered. So thank you, thank you again, for just uh, uh, being so forthright and brave. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, and and Eddie, those are all your questions. But uh, yes, thank you very much for coming and uh, sharing your perspective at council tonight. It's very important. No problem. And I'm sorry I forgot what Councillor Fry's last question was. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. But um, he can email me if he wants. To a response to it. I'm happy to email him. Okay, that's good to know. Thanks very much, Eddie. Okay, thank you very much. So we'll be moving on to our uh, next speaker, uh, speaker number two, Brian Short. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, we can hear you. You have five minutes to speak to council. Please um, go ahead. Thank you. So my name is Brian Short, and I'm a digital rights campaigner for Open Media a Canadian grassroots organization that works to keep the internet open, affordable, and surveillance free. I'm here today to speak in opposition to motion before. I'd like to center my remarks around a growing concern about the government, the governance of police surveillance technologies. And I'd like to warn counselors that you have only this opportunity right now to prevent the police from expanding its use of CCTV cameras and potentially incorporating the use of facial recognition technology into these new cameras as well. If you decide to vote in favor of this motion, you'll be sacrificing not just the expectation of privacy in public spaces in Vancouver, but also any potential future opportunities for this council or future councils to restrict the use of these technologies by exercising democratic control over the Vancouver Police Department. You'll be setting the city on a path towards mass surveillance that will be ineffective for its proposed goals and will be difficult to divert from. That's because this city council, unlike other city councils in places like Seattle, San Francisco, Boston, and a dozen cities across the United States, doesn't have meaningful control over the surveillance technologies being used by our municipal police department. We know that the Vancouver Police Department has experimented with facial recognition technology from a company called Clearview AI. This product was called illegal by Canada's privacy commissioner. Chief Adam Palmer admitted that using this technology was a mistake and is committed to not using facial recognition again until the VPD has presented a policy governing its use to the Vancouver Police Board 
and that policy has been approved. So that's the only thing holding the VPD back from using facial recognition technology right now, a technology that's been shown to be discriminatory and biased and potentially incorporating its use into these new CCTV cameras. Like with the recently attempted budget cuts to the VPD, Council has no say in when or if the VPD begins using this dangerously unregulated technology again. I would encourage this council to look into the ordinances adopted by the cities cited above. They're called the Community Control of Police Surveillance or CCOPS ordinances. They would, at the very least, add for an additional measure of democratic control over the surveillance technologies being used by the police. But if passed, this motion will compel the city to move past any form of meaningful consultation into whether CCTV is needed, wanted, and right into plans to invest and permanently install cameras around the city and to launch a public relations strategy to convince residents and business order owners that this technology will increase public safety. Others will say more than I can about why public safety won't be increased through the construction of a publicly funded mass surveillance system, and I support their comments. But what I will say, as a lifelong resident of Vancouver and as a survivor of a violent assault, this technology will do much more harm than good. Nearly 20 years ago, I awoke in the emergency room of St. Paul's Hospital after a random and vicious assault on Granville Island. I was missing several teeth and suffering from a concussion. I'm extremely doubtful that CCTV cameras would have done anything to prevent this incident or to identify its perpetrators. And I can assure you, the sustained harm of this technology on Vancouver's most marginalized communities wouldn't be worth it to me even if it did. My major contention with this motion is that it masquerades as undergoing study, but in reality compels the city to act without consultation and absolutely fails to address the ongoing struggle with police governance in Vancouver. To summarize, I urge councillors to recognize that you're not voting to simply have the city look into the potential for more CCTV cameras. If you vote in favor of this motion, you'll be setting the city on a course that creates a mass surveillance network, and you'll have no control over how that technology is then weaponized by the police after the fact. This is your first, last, and best opportunity to reject a dystopian future for the city of Vancouver. Thank you. Thank you. You do have questions. Uh, Council Di Genova, three minutes to the speaker. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for speaking. I'm just wondering, are you aware that the motion in the resolution part, although I give examples of facial recognition technology and where it's used, that the motion very clearly says that the, cam the cameras um, installed would not be live monitored? Uh, I, I just want to make sure you're aware that what we'd be voting on isn't the facial recognition technology. Sure, I, I'm, I'm absolutely aware of that. And okay. facial recognition technology is something that can be deployed after the fact. In okay. fact, the Clearview AI technology being used by the VPD um, until recently uh, was, was not a product that worked live with, with cameras. It was something that was run through a database of so you, 3 billion stolen images from the internet. So, um, so sorry, so, I, and, and, I, and this I get three minutes. I'm, I just wanna ask for your expertise on this. So if I was to move an amendment to my own motion to clearly state that it wouldn't use facial recognition technology, would you support that change? Um, absolutely not, no. I don't think that would substantively change the motion because as I, as I said in my remarks, um, the city council doesn't choose whether or not the police are able to use facial recognition technology, that decision rests with the Vancouver Police Board. Um, so, so I think my remarks stand and, and my contention to the motion still stands. Thanks. Um, I'm going to ask, did you, did you um, uh, speak out against the uh, deployment of cameras during the 2010 Olympic Games in Vancouver or um, during the celebration of lights every year up until the pandemic? Have I spoken out against that use? No. Yes. D does that use concern you? Yes. Okay. And and can I ask why you speak out to this, but not to using them one day of the year? Um, well, 20, 2010, I wouldn't have been aware of uh, what, what was happening as, as relevantly. I wasn't in the line of work uh, that I am. Um, and I believe when the celebration of lights cameras were set into place, um, I mean, they seem to be much more tightly regulated uh, than this motion uh, proposes. Um, and, you know, just because you missed or I've missed uh, past opportunities to speak out, I don't think that means that I should 
not speak out. Yeah. I, I wasn't saying that. I was just asking, so I just want to be clear. But um, also, do you feel that private businesses should be allowed to have cameras that um, reach the public realm, like sidewalks, and uh, uh, that that police actually use and canvas for right now when people are in the public realm? Do you think that should be allowed? Because that's happening yeah, right I think now. That's a it's very different. It's very, very different. I think that's one of the things that's so concerning about this motion is the comparison um, between either private businesses or the way a private individual like myself might use my camera in the park to take, let's say, uh, a video of a family member. Um, that's so, so, so different than state-owned controlled cameras. Um, okay, Brian, I'm just going to have you pause yeah. there. I'm very sorry to interrupt, but uh, we as counselors get three minutes to ask questions and we're well over time. Um, but I'm going to move to Councillor Boyle, who also has questions. Thanks. Uh, and I actually was interested um, because I too have heard those comparisons in the public discussion in the last week about this motion between um, what's proposed in the motion and personal use of cell phone videos. I'm wondering if you can speak a bit more to the differences there as you understand them professionally with the expertise Absolutely. you bring to this. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, in the, in the private realm, I mean, we can, um, the expectation of privacy in, in public spaces can be infringed upon in certain circumstances. Um, somebody taking a, a video in a park may capture a passerby, but the way that this video could be used and shared is restricted in some very real ways. Um, you know, maybe they post it to, to the internet and maybe you're in the background, but the audience for that picture is, is quite small and the implications in terms of somebody's privacy is, is quite minimal. Um, when these cameras are omnipresent, always on, like let's say instead of me just taking a video in a park, uh, I, I take my camera and I mount it in a tree and I film everything taking place in that park. Or instead of taking a video of, of my child riding her bicycle in a park, I begin taking videos of other children riding bicycles in the park. Um, these are the, the nuances that we need to pay attention to and, and, and the, the huge differences in terms of scope between, you know, personal use, business use, and state-owned cameras um, existing. Okay, really appreciate that. I will uh, leave it there, but thanks for phoning in. And you have uh, questions from Councillor Fry. Please go ahead, Councillor Fry. Sorry, on mute. Uh, appreciate uh, your insights into into some of this and the work that you're doing. I'm wondering if you could speak to uh, our charter rights as Canadians and and our expectations under I think it's Section Eight of the Charter. Of, um, what, is, what, is, what does that say when we talk about mass surveillance? Um, yeah, so certainly we have charter rights to be um, free from unreasonable search and seizure, and we read into that um, th these privacy rights. And um, Canadian jurisprudence um, puts forward this notion that, yeah, we, we have a reasonable expectation of privacy in, in, in public spaces. Um, and uh, our, our information and privacy commissioner here in BC has uh, made public comment, comments um, and, and issued documents around the use of um, surveillance in, in public spaces and points out that there needs to be a reason for it. It can't just be a fact-finding mission. You can't just deploy cameras and, and capture this intimate personal details of people's lives um, out in the world unless you, in, unless you have a, a very stated and explicit purpose for, for that. And these are the, the small moments, yeah, that we, we, we could um, conceive of infringing on these um, privacy rights, but there needs to be an important reason. So, uh, and I understand further under section uh, 487.01 of the criminal code that you'd actually need a warrant to violate those section eight rights. And so even th this, this surveillance technology may not even be admissible in court without a warrant in some cases. Is that kind of the gist? Yeah, I, it sounds like you, you, you may understand um, more of this than perhaps I do, but um, yeah, I think there would be a, a, a real concern that a lot of this evidence would be inadmissible, um, if, if not the deployment of this being simply not possible. Yeah, well, I, I, I appreciate you coming to join us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Fry. Those are all your questions, Brian, but we do appreciate hearing from you today. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Clara Pratt. Uh, Prager? It's Prager. 
Prager. Okay, great. Claire Prager, uh, you have the mic. You've got five minutes to speak to council. Please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, council. My name is Claire Prager, and I'm speaking on behalf of Women Transforming Cities. We're a grassroots organization that advocates for policies that ensure people facing gender oppression can belong and thrive where they live. Uh, Women Transforming Cities is strongly opposed to this motion. We have actually worked with uh, over 10 local organizations, including PACE, FANDU, Battered Women Support Services, Pivot Legal Society, BC Civil Liberties Association, Homelessness Services Association of BC, and several others uh, on a letter to all of you that clearly outlines a whole host of reasons why this motion will do more harm than good. Uh, the motion really lacks any grounding in evidence-based practices regarding the use of surveillance as a deterrent to crime. And uh, since we are talking about decisions that could cause significant harms to members of our community, I do think it's important to go over some of that research. Uh, so we'll, we'll just start by clarifying that uh, there's fairly scant evidence that shows that more CCDD in cities results in a reduction in violent crime. Uh, studies from the UK, US, Sweden, and China all show no measurable, measurable impact on public safety. Uh, and a 2019 meta-analysis of 36 evaluations uh, shows that it does not reduce violence. And that's a really important distinction. Our letter elaborates on that more. Uh, so I encourage you to read that because the difference between uh, violent crime and petty crime is really important when we're talking about CCTV. Uh, but more importantly, CCTV will make equity-deserving genders uh, feel less safe. Uh, research from Australia actually shows that the presence of CCTV uh, makes women feel like they are in an unsafe place, and that leads to women spending less time in public places. Uh, research also, also shows that sex workers specifically are less safe when surveillance increases because they will go to great lengths to ensure that their customers aren't criminalized which means they'll be uh, moving to more isolated remote areas to work, and that is dangerous. Uh, increased surveillance also leads to increasing interactions with police, which sex workers have said for a long time doesn't make them feel more safe. Uh, CCTV is also racially biased. Uh, research in the UK has shown that uh, operators selectively target social groups that they believe to be the perpetrators of crime. So this leads to black people being one and a half to two and a half times more likely to be surveilled. Uh, the technology also exacerbates existing inequalities. Um, so decisions about where to place the cameras will reflect existing profiling. Uh, so public housing zones and poorer racialized neighborhoods are increasingly going to be targeted by surveillance schemes. And uh, the technology will really just criminalize uh, uh, and continue to incarcerate people who are unsheltered while addressing none of the root causes of homelessness. Um, and we, the last speaker spoke a little bit about facial recognition technology. I understand very well that the motion doesn't currently include those measures, uh, but there are several clauses that clearly celebrate it, which has led many to believe that it could move in that direction, uh, which I don't think you wanna be the council that opens that door when uh, cities like Portland, San Francisco, and Boston are actually banning facial recognition technology by police uh, because of uh, concerns about privacy and, and impact on civic life and uh, the bias that it has. Uh, and that all makes sense because the research shows that the technology is racially biased. Uh, for example, the algorithm misclassified black women nearly 35% of the time. And I know that anti-Asian hate crime has come up during these proceedings, so it's worth mentioning that uh, the U.S. government found that Asian and black people were up to 100 times more likely to be misidentified than white men. Again, I don't think you want to be the council that opens that door on the public's time. Uh, ultimately, increasing CCTV is another expensive and dangerous tool to further criminalize women, especially women who live in the downtown east side, especially racialized women and girls, uh, people who use drugs, and sex workers. These community members deserve evidence-based solutions that tackle the root causes of public safety. And the public funds that will be required to install these systems, which are not effective in the first place, would be better spent on interventions that we know do work. Uh, these include affordable housing. They include uh, frontline mental health workers, community-led crisis intervention, harm reduction, affordable transit, and social programs. Uh, we know what will keep people safe, and it is not more surveillance. So I urge you to consider how our resources could be better spent and vote against this motion. Thank you. You do have questions uh, from Councillor Carr. Please go ahead. Three minutes of speaker. 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks so much. I really appreciate you coming and the work that Women Transforming Cities uh, does in general around so many issues facing our city. Um, you sp spoke earlier um, in, in your five minutes about there's, I think I caught it down right, I'm, I'm asking for clarification, no evidence that, um, that places with CCTV decrease violent crime. Um, so I'm just wanted, wanting to get confirmation that that's what you've said. And then you cited a number of countries, but you spoke very quickly and I didn't catch Yes, I'm them. sorry. I was trying to get everything in in five <laughs> minutes, so I apologize for going that's quickly. Okay. Um, so um, is that what you said? And did you cite a number of countries, in England, or I can't remember if you could give those again. Yeah, I, so I mentioned studies from the UK, the US, Sweden, and Canada uh, that did not show a measurable impact on public safety. And then there's also a meta-analysis of 36 evaluations that uh, shows that they didn't increase, uh, they did not uh, reduce violent crime. Right, okay. And, and, and this is also all outlined in the, the letter that we sent in, in quite a bit more detail, and it, those include references uh, to the studies that we mentioned. Thanks for reminding so, me that, 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 and that came in. Yeah, right. Okay, um, did it come from, um, was the title Women Transforming I've, Cities? No, I actually believe it would have come from Menakshi from Pivot Legal Society. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. And you have more questions, Councilor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Chair, and, and and thanks for calling in this evening. Um, I appreciate the perspective you're bringing. Um, I, I was a little surprised to hear that in instances that women are actually feel less safe and uh, where CCTV is used, but. Um, could you just give me your perspective on how we respond to concerns of, of women of all ages who do feel unsafe in the city at this time for a variety of reasons? There's been these, particularly these stranger attacks that come out of nowhere, and 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 what would be your suggestions for addressing public safety? Because there are women who feel unsafe. Yeah, absolutely, and everybody deserves to feel safe in the city. I think. Uh, what what we want to focus on is solutions that we know work. Uh, so affordable housing, addressing people's basic needs uh, so that they don't have to rely on petty crime to make a living. Um, and uh, yeah, mental health supports for people, systemic issues basically. This is, this is a Band-Aid solution that will do more harm than good and will actually uh, impact negatively impact the people that it's saying that it will protect. Um, we also know of examples of uh, times that CCV has been used to stalk women, and I don't think that's the direction that we want to go in order to make women feel safer in the city either. Okay. And, and from your perspective, with a obviously this, this motion contemplates a decision, a direction um, to um, implement um, CCTV. Um, would you, from your perspective, suggest that it warrants um, more public consultation, um, a move in this direction, if, if that was something that council wanted to support? Um, you can ask, you can add an amendment to say that you will consider our input later, but we are telling you our input right now. And I think that uh, Women Transforming Cities and the 14 other organizations and many other people who have reached out to you have been really clear that this is not a solution that we see in improving safety. Uh, so we could, you know, take a bunch more time and, and money to, to say that again later, but I don't think uh, the position of these 14 organizations is going to change drastically in the coming year. So uh, I, I would encourage council to listen to uh, our voices right now and, and vote no to this amendment. Or sorry, this motion. Thank you. I appreciate you expanding on that for me. Thanks. Thanks. And uh, Council Swanson. Yeah, um, thanks so much for coming or for phoning in. And thanks to Women Transforming Cities for all the stuff that you guys do. It's amazing. Um, I just wanted to ask, what is your biggest issue with the cameras? <laughs> That's a good question. It, there are so many issues. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Is it the violation yeah. of privacy or the fact that the police will have so much access to them? Yeah, or it's is it something else? Top issue because there are so many, but um, 
ultimately it's that this will be used to surveil people who are already criminalized, uh, racialized people, uh, sex workers, and it will uh, further harm them. It won't keep them safe. The evidence does not support the, any um, notion that it keeps the people that are at mo the most at risk of violent crime. Uh, it won't. It won't help them. It will harm them. That's the main issue, I would say. Yeah. So it will surveil criminalized people. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, um, Clara. Those are all your questions, but we appreciate hearing from you tonight. Next, we have uh, speaker six, Serena Jackson. Hello. Oh, hey there, we can hear can you. You, you have oh, five great. minutes to speak. Okay, to great. Council. Please go ahead. Perfect, thanks very much. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Serena Jackson, and I am here to speak in strong opposition to this motion. I've lived in East Vancouver for most of my life, and I serve as the co-chair of the city's 2S LGBTQ plus advisory committee. I know you heard from our other co-chair earlier. Um, I also work with at-risk youth, all of whom are queer identifying, many of whom are Indigenous, and most of whom have lived experience with homelessness. I am here to speak on behalf of myself and not on behalf of my employer or my advisory committee, but I do want to emphasize that I am intimately familiar with communities that are more likely to be victims of violence. I am also the survivor of a violent assault, and while I will not go into detail, I am confident that it would not have been prevented or solved by CCTV. Increased surveillance is not a solution. It is dangerous to civil liberties, and any potential benefits are outweighed by the disproportionate impact on the most marginalized people who are already over-policed. The people who will be most harmed by this have the least access to, fear, or to power and greater fear of speaking out. Some people are claiming that violent crime in Vancouver is trending up, but the BBD's data doesn't support that. There are many peer-reviewed studies that clearly show that CCTV has not proven to prevent, deter, or solve crime. The presence of cameras would have obvious negative effects on the wider public civil liberties and the further marginalization uh, that increased surveillance presence uh, would pose on vulnerable groups is dangerous. I'm sure you've all read the joint letter uh, that Clara just mentioned um, from Pivot Legal, PACE, the BC Civil Liberties Association, uh, the Homeless Services of Association of BC, um, Battered Women's Support Services, uh, Van Du, Amnesty International, and others who signed on to it. Um, and I want to echo their words. Uh, in particular, the letter states, to address the harms that drive reliance on the informal economy and petty crime, the city must support infrastructure such as housing, culturally mental health services, peer-led access to safe supply must be built and invested in, rather than expanding police budgets through expensive and ineffective technologies. I could not agree more. In addition, CCTV is susceptible to abuse in many ways. This motion mentions the UK and the Metropolitan Police, but I do not think that we should be looking to them as a positive example. In 2012, a British police officer and CCTV operator named Kieran McLeave directed a camera at a woman's home on several occasions over multiple months in acts of voyeurism. In 2021, Officer Wayne Cousins of the Metropolitan Police abducted and murdered a woman. The abduction was filmed on CCTV, the presence of which obviously did not deter this violence. In short, installing and staffing CCTV is expensive, and it doesn't prevent violence. So instead of spending our limited resources on surveillance equipment, I urge council to allocate funds towards measures we know prevent violence, such as more accessible public spaces, affordable housing, frontline mental health support, accessible and affordable transit, well-lit streets, and walkable neighborhoods. In summary, I'm strongly opposed to this motion, and I strongly encourage council to vote against it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you have questions, Councilor DiGenova. Three minutes. Questions to the speaker. Thanks, uh, thanks, Serena. I'm, I'm just wondering what you had mentioned that that um, the cost of this. Uh, are you aware that the the city already has cameras? Actually, we we have cameras from the 2010 Olympics that we currently do not use that could be deployed. So the cost isn't all that great. It certainly isn't tens of millions of dollars. I know that for a fact. And it doesn't have to be because we could just use the cameras we already have. Um, I, I'm wondering, is that something that, that if it wasn't taking away funding from something else, 
you would think might be okay strategically in certain areas? No, I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, even if we already have the cameras um, and if they're, you know, 10 years old, um, it's, I, <laughs> you know, maybe it wouldn't be tens of millions of dollars, um, but it still costs things to install, uh, to maintain, to staff the equipment. Um, and I don't think that this is fun, money that we need to spend on something that hasn't been uh, proven to work. Um, like the evidence is clear that uh, this is not proven to prevent or, or solve crime. Okay, so so you don't think that it's helped the police to find criminals? Because what what all of council has heard from the Vancouver Police Department um, in an email in an email response to questions sent today was that it does indeed actually help them to solve a lot of crime and bring people to either uh, justice or to treatment or to help them, uh, you know, to, to deal with those issues or to prevent them from hurting others. So I'm just wondering, I mean, when I, I'm, I'm thinking kind of about like the violent assault against a senior um, that was a sexual assault downtown a few months back uh, that the police have said that is the worst they've ever seen. I mean, in a case like that, would you hope that that we could use um, CCTV cameras, you know, if we had a lot of consultation in specific areas, would that help you at all? If you were heard? No, as to what it wouldn't help me. Okay. I, I still would not think that it's worth um, the, the detriment to the communities um, that would be harmed by it. Thanks so much for your comments. Thank you very much, Serena. Those are all your questions. Thank you. Have a great night. You also. Um, next, we have speaker number nine, Tim L. on the line. Hi there. Can you hear me? We can hear you. You have five minutes to speak to council, and please feel free to start whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you, Chair. And to the Mayor and Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, and be heard on this motion. My name is Tim L. I'm a resident of Olympic Village, and I'm going to echo a lot of the comments already from the speakers who have preceded me, but I do oppose the motion. I watched the initial debate last night, and I was only further convinced that this idea does not present a benefit to public safety. The councillor's responses to initial questioning by her colleagues instead left many unanswered questions for me. The councillor did, in fact, make an erroneous statement when she claimed that violent crime in the city is trending up and further asserts this in paragraph six of the motion. Violent crime is not up, and the VPD's own data supports that. It's troubling that the conclusion that crime is up was based at least in part on, quote, hearing this from many people. But let's consider evidence for a second. There are a number of peer-reviewed studies that conclude that increased CCTV has not been proven to reduce crime, deter it, or even solve it to the extent that the presence of cameras would outweigh the obvious negative effects on civil liberties, or the further marginalization that increased surveillance presence poses on vulnerable groups. As a gay man myself, I can say that I'm not at all comforted by the notion of increased CCTV cameras in our city, nor would it make me feel any less likely to be assaulted. Vancouver already has thousands of cameras installed on public and private property, and if they were effective as a deterrent, we would not be even debate this motion. Similarly, the VPD employs a form of deterrence in its policing strategy, by the number of cruisers that are on the road at all times, not necessarily responding to active calls. Again, if this direct police presence and visibility has not impacted crime rates, why do we do it? The councillor has in fact undermined her own argument when she tried to rationalize an increase in camera presence by pointing to the ubiquity of smartphone cameras. The difference is that reasonable privacy can still be maintained for the wider public by the phone's owners, even in public places, because all cell phone owners would not realistically film 24-7. There's also nothing compelling someone to hand video captured in the public realm to police. Vancouver's had cell phones and cameras for nearly two decades, and that has not had a noticeable effect on crime rates, such that a person would be able to reasonably draw any conclusion. The motion cites a handful of recent incidents as if to infer a broader problem, but these types of violent crimes are not new to Vancouver. And according to the VPD, violent crime is down year over year and down considerably over three years ago. The Surveillance Studies Centre has noted that crime may not only not be deterred by increased camera surveillance, but in fact may simply be displaced over time to other areas where cameras aren't present. Canadian Lawyer Magazine, which blasted Ottawa's mayor for pushing for more cameras in the wake of the Byward Market shootings in 2019, 
noted that police are already generally good at solving violent crime without relying on CCTV, and cited a 2016 study in Newark, New Jersey, which found that cameras had no conclusive impact on nonviolent crime. The cameras didn't have an effect on deterring or solving violent crimes either. So for those crimes believed to be out of control, the proposed solution lacked any evidence of effectiveness. As the mayor pointed out yesterday, increased camera footprint could cost millions of dollars in extra costs from the operation and staffing of more cameras and the data storage required. The councillor argues that we don't need to adopt the more stringent surveillance states found in places like the UK. At last night's meeting, she commented that she's, quote, not necessarily asking for facial recognition in the Vancouver approach, but the motion in front of you makes specific references to facial recognition software as if to imply that would be a potential benefit. So where is the line drawn on this? How do we ensure that we don't cross that line? And can we even ensure it isn't crossed? We already allocate over a fifth of municipal spending to policing, so I can't understand the argument that the money for this need not come from the existing police budget or that we don't need to increase spending to, uh, to facilitate this. Again, if crime rates aren't already dropping, then funding isn't the issue. Every resident of the city deserves to feel safe. This motion doesn't achieve that. So the rest of council, please vote against this. I want to call out the obvious electioneering at play, and as a private citizen, I'm horrified to see this open and ongoing attempt to construct a false narrative about the state of our city and the move to leverage that narrative to encourage people to sacrifice civil liberties in exchange for no tangible increase in public safety. I'm sure you agree that we deserve much better than that, especially if the end goal is in fact to make us safer. Don't set us down this path. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, those are all your questions. Thank you very much for calling in to Council tonight. Next, we have speaker number six, Bianca Wiley. I'm sorry, I meant to say speaker 10, Bianca Wiley. <laughs> no problem. You can hear me, yes? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, so my name is Bianca Wiley. I'm the co-founder of an organization called Tech Reset Canada, and I'm calling you from Toronto. Um, so our organization, we really look at technology and democracy. So it's been heartening to listen to everything that's been shared locally. And of course, on the content and the consequences here, I defer to everyone that's speaking, you know, from Vancouver um, and in Vancouver. But uh, tech's impact on democracy is a concern across cities. It's a global concern. And I just wanted to speak for a few minutes tonight about democracy, accountability, trust, and process. I also want us to think about history because the first point I'd like to share with everyone here that we have been grappling with, with technology and democracy for probably the last five years is that governments have taken steps in the last two decades without broad public consent. So the cameras that exist, the cameras that everybody's talking about, and much broader than the cameras, um, that, that there really never was proper informed consent from the public. That was never there. So you're already standing on a pretty shaky foundation. And a lot of the consequences of technology, if you look around the world right now, they're under litigated. The reason that there's not a lot more court cases going on is because, as we've heard tonight, um, we understand who would have to be bringing those cases, and a lot of people don't have the resources to do so. We have to approach some of our accountability officers in Canada um, to start those kinds of proceedings. So I think what I'm trying to do here is to help us all zoom out and consider we are in a fragile moment for democracy. Local governments have, uh, to date, more trust than other orders of government. And that's a really precious resource to, and an asset to, to consider. Because when you make decisions like the one you're making today, um, there are consequences and there are perceptions. Um, but I'm going to go back to my main point. So there may be negative, there may be positive. We haven't had a broad conversation about this. But it's not that we need to have one you know, in the next week, or I think, as Clara mentioned, um, that a consultation would be super helpful. We've got a much older problem than that. And so I just think it's important not to be ahistorical about how we've arrived at this moment and that we have to protect our democracy. And to do that, we need room to make mistakes together, 
Increasing surveillance is not how we have hard conversations. You heard Eddie say this is a polarized topic. That is true. This general concept that we create um, sort of a, an environment of surveillance impacts our discourse. It impacts our democracy. And so sometimes it's easy to kind of miss that these little steps um, are, are really taking us down a path that is not a good one. And we've known this for a while. And this is what I'm talking about for years. This is sort of a broader tech lash. Um, and I just would gesture, because sometimes at the municipal level, we don't think about the national and international regulatory environment. There is major pushback. And when we think CCTV cameras, they are never standalone objects. They connect into much broader and deeper in future infrastructure. They connect into a major political economy of artificial intelligence. So these things don't stand alone. They evolve. They ratchet. And there isn't always this off ramp. Even the idea that you're going to pilot something. If you look at this stuff historically, getting it out is extremely difficult. So I just want to echo and the, the sort of calls to like slow down and consider that this is a small step, but it's actually a really big step. Um, because if you take the step to not go down the road here, you're protecting that democratic space to build the kinds of societies that we all say we want, which are ones where we're free to disagree, we're free to get into it together, that we have a safety to you know, be ourselves. Surveillance creates a chill on our democracy. This is a fundamental issue. So I know pan-partisan across the spectrum, that's something that everybody who's involved in politics wants to protect because it is at the heart of what our democracy is about. So I'm going to end by saying uh, thank you for the opportunity to sort of zoom out and consider. And um, that's it from me. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bianca. You do have questions from Councillor Hardwick. Uh, you have three minutes, Councillor Hardwick. Please go ahead. Hi, Bianca. Hello, Councillor Hardwick. How are you? Um, I'm all right. It's been a while. Um, you may remember that we met around the subject of open data. In, uh, indeed. indeed. So my question yes. to you is, um, as we explore the tensions between open data, open government, transparency versus surveillance, how do we, how do we differentiate and how do we take these considerations into balance? Yeah, like to me, openness is great for accountability. I think we want to share how we make difficult decisions. So I always thought open government was great because it was like, look, no government makes easy decisions. We need to be more open about the trade-offs. I don't think, I've never been someone who says, let's get in a room and you know, necessarily transcribe everything that gets set or record everything that happens because it changes the environment, right? So I think for me, openness, and um, access to information, these things help us like strengthen our governance, but really from an accountability perspective, because residents getting involved in government, I mean, we're supposed to be holding our elected officials accountable. That's how this whole system works. So we need information mm -hmm. for that. But I think that's very different than this idea of sort of a persistent capture and then a reverse engineering of use of information. I just, I, I don't think, I, I, that's how I would differentiate the two. So key is, is protection of individual privacy while still um, creating some structure ar around it. And I, I get it, it's, um, it's, it's tricky uh, at a certain level, um, separating out the two, but um, ultimately if our objective is to protect and strengthen democracy, um, promoting a surveillance culture is not going to achieve it. No, and it's public spaces. Like, look what's happening. The meltdown everybody's having about Twitter. It's not a public square by any means, but the idea of places where people can communicate and do and sort of, like, figure out how to be together um, is causing a lot of concern. And I think we can see how deeply privatized those places are. So we need to be extra careful to protect and expand public and accountable, you know, space. 
So I think our physical public spaces are a great example of that. We need to expand that, and that's where we can grow out and develop. Like, we both, we both are interested in technology. There's lots of great stuff we can do. I don't want to foreclose because we've gone surveillance. There's lots of wonderful things to do with technology, but not if it is, like, under the auspice of this sort of surveillance approach to technology. It's, there's so much better we can do. So I think we need to protect that space as well. Okay, that is uh, your time. Appreciate you calling in. Good to hear you. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks very much uh, for calling in. Those are your questions. Thank you for having me. Good night. Good night. So uh, that brings us to the end of the list, but I will go through and call on those folks that were not on the list at the time. Although I understand from the clerks, we don't have any other callers, but let's call their names in case they did call in. Maxim Winther, uh, David Herrera, Sam Klein Laufer. Uh, Chair, there's no other speakers on the line. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Clerk. So that brings us to the end of our speakers list. So thank you to everyone who uh, spoke to Council on this um, item. Council, we're now moving to the main queue, and is there any discussion on this motion? I see Councillor Swanson is up first. Please go ahead, Councillor Swanson. Yeah, I'm going to vote against this motion. I don't like the idea of living in a surveilled society, and I don't like the idea of CCTV cameras targeting criminalized people, which I know they do. I thought the speakers were really knowledgeable, and I think we need to go down the, as the Human Rights Commission calls it, the Equity is safer. I think we need to go down that path. Um, I think there was a really good example of how we need to deal with issues in the community that was provided by the Bagua Artist Collective a few weeks ago when their mural was defaced by graffiti artists. And they actually wrote in to tell us that they didn't like the criminalized approach to the people who had defaced their murals. And instead they invited the community to come and help them redo the mural. And some of the graffiti artists came and helped. And then the graffiti artists did another wall that was an okay wall to paint on, I guess honoring a Chinatown legend and saying, respect Chinatown. So they were bringing the community together rather than separating people, targeting people, surveilling people. And I think that that's what we need to do. We need community led responses to when we have issues like this in the community. And I think we'll get a lot farther than we will by uh, giving more power to the police. That's it for me. Thank you, Council Boyle. Thanks so much, Chair Bly. Um, I had a long um, list of reasons I was opposing this, but uh, our speakers articulated those so eloquently. So I, I will be brief in just saying I, um, I won't be supporting this motion. Um, it, it is very clear to me and even um, more clear having heard from so many speakers uh, that we need to be focusing on and investing in the things we know improve safety, particularly for uh, populations, communities who are um, most often the victims of crime. Those important investments in housing and in social support, um, of course, aren't just local jurisdiction, but we have a role to play. Um, the pilot project that Council uh, supported recently in three neighborhoods around peer and community led responses to crime uh, are incredibly important as well. So many options on the table to do the work that, uh, of course, we all agree is important, which is to uh, strengthen um, uh, real community safety as well as strengthen the sense of community safety that people experience in the city. and. Um, I have heard very clearly that CCTV takes us, uh, does not take us in that direction. And I, I think there are a number of 
um, significant red flags and how this motion is put together. And so I, I feel very strongly that I hope council does not uh, endorse it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Fry. Yeah, I also will not be supporting this uh, this motion. Um, uh, I, I do want to clarify, though, that I, I do see that there is a role uh, for video surveillance uh, from with the police, and we know that they've deployed them in special occasions for crowd control when there's big games or what have you, or the Olympics. They'll bring out their mobile stations. We know that the police use surveillance and stakeouts, and when they're, you know doing a thorough investigation. And that usually typically comes with a warrant or some kind of tacit understanding that this is a very special circumstance, not a not an all seeing eye in perpetuity, uh, in particular located in some of our, as, as has been suggested in the earlier iteration of this that we struck down uh, two weeks ago, um, suggesting to put it in, in areas of vulnerable and impoverished populations. So, uh, but I wanna be clear that I'm not coming against the police on this one. In fact, if had the police come to us with a, a thorough and well-researched um, and compelling ask that was based on evidence and based on a, on a real need that they saw, uh, I would be more inclined to consider this. But rather, um, I see this uh, campaigned on Twitter with the hashtag Vancouver is dying. And I see it as a very fear-based um, approach to to political campaigning, frankly, and I, and I, and I feel, um, well, I don't want to say disgusted, but I, I'm, I'm very unimpressed with that approach. I think that um, this becomes a deeply philosophical moment for us as a council, and we forge forward on this. And in the spirit of philosophy, I, and I've, I've spent a great deal of time reading the, the various critiques of, and, and, and pros and cons of surveillance technology. Um, we know that it is a slippery slope and that it does, as the member had articulated, open the door to facial recognition and all manner of technology. Uh, but in the spirit of philosophy, I reflected on Michel Foucault, the uh, French philosopher, and his theory of the panopticon. And the panopticon is Latin, I think, or Greek for the all-seeing eye. And it was a prison system that was designed in the 1800s. Um, and Dis 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 disavowed shortly thereafter. But Foucault uh, talked about the panopticon and the panopticon basically uh, was um, was a way to see all the prisoners at once and it, it would and it was and they never quite knew if they were under surveillance. And Foucault described the, the panopticon as uh, the prisoner being on the receiving end of asymmetrical surveillance. Uh, they're seen, but they do not see. They're the object of information, but never a subject in communication. And I think that's a profound indictment of, of this whole sort of notion of what kind of society we'd want to be. Do we want to be a, a society that Mr. Fry, we lost your mic. Looks like maybe we've lost Councillor Fry's connection altogether. I'm just going to pause Councillor Fry's timer. Here we go. Councillor Fry? Yep. Okay, you're back. You did we 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 lost you for about 15 seconds there. Okay, well I think probably got the gist. I'm not going to be supporting this. So. Thank you uh very much. Um Councillor Hardwick. Thank you. So I I seconded this motion for uh, Council Di Genova to get it on the floor um, because I think it's important for us to be able to debate on this issue. Um, but it's not an indication of my support for more surveillance. Uh, but I did want to hear what this, hear this debate and, and hear what others had to say and, and consider it. And, um, you know, I, I was struck and surprised actually to hear from. Bianca Wiley, who I know from old movies, so to speak, uh, who has been uh, very focused on protection of democracy through technology. And uh, ultimately, this is, is the deal breaker for me. Uh, one of the speakers said, once we open the door to this from a technology standpoint, you can't put the, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. 
and uh, while uh, we do want to um, protect individual privacy, that at, at the core of it, we have to be protecting uh, individual privacy. We we can't just overlook that um, in in these individual instances because it would it it would lead to further deterioration of our our fundamental democratic principles. And so um, on that basis, I cannot support this motion. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. I see, uh, Councillor Di Genova, you are next on the queue. Oh, I'll close. You'll close? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Chair. And, um, and thank you to uh, the residents and speakers, obviously recognizing, uh, I think the last caller was calling from Toronto, um, for uh, speaking to this uh, motion and proposal. Um, a couple of reflections, because um, I came into this uh, very much with an open mind, um, and uh, particularly because I am deeply concerned around, about public safety in the city, as I think are many of my colleagues around council. and. Um, and I've been hearing, uh, as, as many of you have, uh, residents' concerns, um, particularly around the unprovoked attacks that they're seeing in the city. And we heard it from our recent public safety forum. Um, I know that, and then tomorrow evening, we also have a city, um, Council Di Genova's um, uh, public safety forum is being hosted tomorrow evening. And um, I'm looking forward, I think we have over 50 residents registered to speak at that. Um, I was surprised, though, by uh, with the speakers who spoke tonight, that very few spoke in support of, of this motion and this technology, and and that actually surprised me. I also was surprised um, that the PD um, has not approached the city or come to council over the course of the last three and a half years as part of their budget or as part of the numerous discussions we've had about public safety as this being a um, a tool or a recommended approach to dealing with public safety. So just, just sort of reflecting those thoughts. Um, what I hear loud and clear from the public is that they want a safe and inclusive city. Um, but I didn't hear um, through the speakers, through the correspondence that we received, that the public wants mass surveillance. And I think we're cognizant that increasingly we have less and less privacy in our lives. And some of that is attributable to our own uh, behaviors and engaging in social media. And um, But um, I really appreciated uh, Councillor Hardwick's uh, just last comments and, and the last speaker, Bianca, who just around um, that uh, a surveillance society doesn't necessarily need to uh, lead to a safer society, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but um, and, and I feel that we don't have a, a fulsome understanding of what the implications are. And this motion very much is an implementation motion. It's not even a report back. It's just to identify areas where we put CCTV in and how much it would cost. And, and, and so a whole, for a variety of reasons that have been identified by um, a number of the speakers and my colleagues, I, I'm not prepared to support the motion at this time. I am, though, looking forward to hearing the public tomorrow on um, what they think are um, ways that we can collectively address public safety in the city. It is an important issue and um, yeah. and look forward to that conversation tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilor Dominato. Councilor Carr. Um, yes, thank you. I, I also came um, with an open mind around this and I have a lot of uh, regard for people like um, Eddie Elmer, who spoke to us tonight. Um, but I listened carefully to, to this debate. I read the background information, and, um, and I've, uh, um, I've, you know, I've had a lot of concern anyway around the whole issue of public surveillance. Um, but in reading uh, the letters that have come to us um, and uh, hearing the reports made to us by citizens who took the time to, to speak, tonight, I'm quite convinced that this is a slippery slope um, that, uh, that undermines um, really our, our pro uh, the protection of individual privacy um, without any solid evidence that this is really going to reduce crime. And particularly, I'm taken by the reports which have stated that, um, and, and were spoken to, and, uh, that, uh, that say, uh, uh, after a studying of many, many um, different jurisdictions, I think it was 37, um, that, uh, that violent crime is not reduced 
with the use of CCTV. So um, I, uh, I, I can't see the benefit um, if there are specific circumstances, as Councillor Fry pointed out, um, you know, like around the use of CCTV during things like um, the Olympics or um, the Stanley Cup games, uh, where it certainly for crowd control um, made a very positive big difference in terms of public safety. Um, uh, I am fine with that, but it was limited in time duration and very specifically focused. Um, uh, reading some of the letters that have come in, especially the joint letter from a number of organizations that was mentioned tonight, um, uh, I, I was struck by a statement in there that said BC's Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner has stated that a public body is not authorized to collect personal information about citizens in the absence of an investigation or on the chance that it might be useful in future investigations. Um, those are compelling reasons for me to vote no um, and, uh, and certainly to ensure that we are protecting individual privacy and especially the privacy of individuals who are already marginalized um, within society. Thank you, Councillor Carr. And Councillor Di Genova, closing on your motion. I'm closing? All right, just wanted to make sure. Um, well, uh, I appreciate uh, the debate of my colleagues. Um, we are all aware, it's, it's a fact, it's evidence that there are on average four unprovoked stranger attacks each day in Vancouver. Um, we've seen some of these in the media on CCTV cameras that are privately owned. Over the past few years, there's been a significant increase in crime and what my motion calls for is not something that we haven't done in the city of Vancouver before. We did this during the Olympics and we do this one day of the year. It's preposterous to say, I just wanna be very clear, this would cost tens of millions of dollars. The city of Vancouver and VPD each have their own cameras. Our engineering department is in possession of some of those cameras and they currently aren't used. I'm also not suggesting that every corner and every street should have cameras. However, cameras in certain areas where violent crime occurs um, in the downtown core, for example, could definitely help to mitigate some of the crime and hold violent offenders accountable. What does accountability mean? That could mean helping people who've committed these crimes because of mental health and addiction issues to find their way to a recovery center. It could mean having checks and balances on violent sexual offenders and having police check in with them to prevent other assaults. I sent a series of questions to VPD today in respect to questions and concerns raised yesterday in question period on the motion uh, by mayor and council. The answers were sent back today uh, and, and they do confirm a number of facts. Actually, there's evidence included about deterring crime, to Councillor Carr's point before. I also wanted to note that there's gaps in coverage, and they've also identified that VPD spends time that they could be do spending investigating canvassing for footage. A great example uh, was the 900 hours of police time just spent canvassing. This wasn't viewing the videos. For to hold the individual accountable that defaced the Kamigata Maru Memorial. To my colleagues who think it's okay for a business to have CCTV cameras that record property, um, public property, but privacy concerns with CCTV cameras owned by the city, then move a bylaw, which you have the power to do, to not allow private businesses to have cameras. I won't support it, but it's possible. Ask the victims of violent crime if they would like their crimes to be solved. Think of the three-year-old who was spat on in a public place, the young man stabbed, and the suspect who was caught on the Tim Hortons video, the woman sucker punched in front of the Hotel Georgia. I think of Diana Ma Jones, someone I knew and I worked with, and her husband too. It was video surveillance who caught the suspect at the hardware store purchasing the tools he used to torture and kill Diana and Richard in their Marpole home. Please refer the responses from VPD that have said Crown Council considers video best evidence, full stop. I'd like to remind Council of the article speaking of the Urban Mayor's Caucus and the letter that calls for stricter control, stricter consequences, and stronger consideration for maintaining public confidence in the administration of justice, bail, and charges assessment policies. That was released yesterday, Council. 
I'm disgusted myself. As another counselor talked about being disgusted, I'm disgusted to hear a counselor straddling both sides. Monday, they support public safety, and Tuesday, they don't. Picking and choosing isn't public safety. The police often find violent offenders because of cell phone footage or dash cam video. Cameras are used for traffic enforcement. We already use CCTV cameras for the celebration of light. We allow businesses to use them and point them towards sidewalks. People use them on smartphones. People are surveilled hundreds of times every day and we say nothing about it. But you, one more time to prevent and possibly deter and solve, to solve violent crime so that others aren't victims of it in our city. And I'm hearing the council's gonna say no to that. It would be better if we could use some of our existing assets that we already have in a strategic manner to help reduce crime at a time when the city needs help. Crime has increased and I don't want to become a city like San Francisco and others like Seattle. We can speak about public safety or we can take action on it. This council has been found to be dysfunctional because we don't take action. We do a lot of talking and not a lot of you know, action on items. So this is an action that I brought forward. This is one tool in the, in the toolbox and I choose to take action. So even if I'm the only person supporting public safety, I will be supporting my own motion. Thank you, Councilor DiGenova. So that takes us to a vote on the motion. And that motion fails with Councillor Carr, Councillor Fry, Councillor Swanson, Councillor Hardwick, Councillor Boyle, Councillor Dominato, Mayor Stewart, and myself in opposition. And that concludes the final item on the agenda. The standing committee portion of this meeting is now complete, and so we will now convene in council with Mayor Stewart as chair to deal with the recommendations and actions from today's committee meeting. Thanks very much. Uh, we're going to convene in council. Uh, clerk's going to the roll call, please. Uh, Mayor Stewart in the chair. Councillor Carr. Councillor DiGenova. Present. Councillor Fry. Present. Councillor Swanson. Here. Councillor Hardwick. Present. Councillor Weeb is uh, not here. Councillor Boyle. Present. <laughs> Councillor Dominato. Present. Uh, Councillor Bly. Present. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young is on a leave of absence. You have quorum, Mayor Stewart. Thanks very much. We need a, a motion to adopt the Standing Committee's recommendations for items one to eight. Anybody? So moved. So moved. Thank you, Councillor Carr. As seconded by Councillor Pry. All in favor, yay. 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 Opposed, nay. Thanks so much. Would someone like to move a motion to adjourn the meeting, please? I'd like to move a motion to adjourn the meeting. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. We have a seconder. Second. Thank you, Councillor Fry. All in favor, yay. Yay. Opposed, yay. nay. We're good. Okay, thank you so much, everybody, for all your time today. Clerk, staff, everybody who came in to participate, and we'll see you tomorrow night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, clerks.